Hi, good, e good afternoon, everybody. Um, we are going to re uh, reconvene the regular council meeting to deal with one administrative matter before starting with today's uh, reconvene standing committee. Um, so clerk, may we have the roll call, please? Mayor Stewart is on a leave of absence for civic business. Councilor Carr? Yeah. Councilor DiGenova? Present. Councilor Fry? Councilor Swanson? Yeah. Councilor Hardwick? Present. Councilor Weeb, not in chamber. Councilor Boyle? Yeah. Councilor Dominado? Present. Councilor Bai? And you have quorum, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. So we have one uh, quick uh, administrative matter, which is a request for an urgent leave of absence for Councillor Dominato for civic business today from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. Um, would somebody like to move the motion now? Councillor DeGenova. Seconder. Councillor Boyle. All in favor? Thank you, Council. The motion carries. I would now like a motion to recess the regular council meeting. Councillor DeGenova, seconder. Councillor Boyle, all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. The meeting is now recessed. Um, so uh, I will call the uh, reconvene meeting of the Standing Committee on Policy and Strategic Priorities to order um, and uh, acknowledge that we are in the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil -Waututh Nations and thank them for having cared for this land since time immemorial um, and look forward to working with them in partnership as we continue to build this city together. I would also like to take a moment to recognize the immense contributions of City of Vancouver staff who work hard every day to help our um, a city become an incredible place to live, work, and play. Clerk, may we have the roll call, please? Mayor Stewart is on a leave of absence, and Councillor Carr is in the chair, Councillor DeGenova? Councillor Fry? Councillor Swanson? Councillor Hardwick? Councillor Weeb is not in the chamber. Councillor Boyle? Councillor Dominado? Councillor Bly? And Councillor Kubiang not in the chamber. You have quorum, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to just go over the plan for the day, and then I'll deal with a couple of outstanding issues from the last um, uh, time that we were meeting as the committee. Um, so let's go over the plan first. We have five member motions remaining from our June 12th meeting and referred from a whole variety of meetings, and one item of unfinished business uh, that will be dealt with in the regular council meeting portion that will follow this uh, standing committee, so that'll be later tonight, I'm assuming. Um, speakers can follow along on Twitter at Van City Clerk for updates on the progress of the meeting, and comments on agenda items can be sent to council using the web form on the city's website, and the link to that form will be tweeted out on at Van City Clerk. We will recess for dinner break from 5.30 to 6.30, um, and um, hopefully we will get through our business tonight. Uh, for everyone's information, at the March 13th in for, uh, 2019 Standing Committee meeting, council members agreed to consider suspending and varying certain provisions in the procedure bylaw for our regular council and Standing Committee meetings through April and to July as part of the council meeting procedure pilot project. As a reminder, we did approve suspending rules 10.6. 13.8 and 13.9 for this meeting on June 12th. Suspending Rule 10.6 allows council members two minutes to introduce their motions, one minute each to ask clarifying questions of the mover of a member's motion. Suspending Rule 13.8 and 13.9 means speakers will have three minutes each to address council, and council members will have three minutes for questions and answers of speakers. Um, speakers, please note that committee members may ask clarifying questions. However, speakers are not required to answer. After hearing from speakers, we will go into discussion on the motion. I would also like to remind committee members that on March 13th, 2019, council agreed to require amendments be submitted to the clerk in final written form before the member introduces them. Please ensure the clerk has received your amendment before it is your turn to speak. Um, so, as I say, just before we get into the actual motions themselves, there were two issues that arose um, at the end of the last committee meeting. And, and may I say, members, that when we sit all day, and we're not today, we're starting at 3, going till 10, but when we sit all day um, from 9.30 in the morning till 10 o'clock at night, off, and especially if we've agreed that we're not going to extend the meeting beyond 10, there is a great deal of pressure. I think that is felt by all of us. And, uh, and I think it's important for us to realize that in advance and try and 
uh, recognize our own um, need for either breaks or to end at a particular time in order to have the, um, uh, the energy and the focus needed to move through the bu uh, business in an efficient uh, way. So just a reminder that we all just keep in mind. I think we all look refreshed uh, right now, but um, uh, we're certainly looking at, uh, uh, at, a, at a late night, I'm sure. Um, so at um, the standing committee, on June 12th, Councillor Di Genova asked for a point of information after a referral was defeated on whether I um, should have remained unbiased and on topic on the motion in front of her and not um, in any way um, direct my comments to the referral or if the referral did not pass. So I, um, I definitely looked into this, conferred with the, the clerks, um, and although at the time, so, it, so, in conclusion, on um, after looking at it and reading the uh, procedural bylaw, it's clear that in the procedure bylaw that if the chair is going to be making comments during debate, they should re relinquish the chair. That has not been the procedure at this council over my last two terms, um, but it is in the procedure bylaw. And if a, if it's not questioned, i.e., if the um, chairs intervention in terms of speaking on a matter is not questioned by a member of council, then it's deemed to be acceptable to council and is fine. And in the case of um, the last committee meeting, it was questioned. So, um, so in review of that, I think it's, uh, I'm, number one, I've asked for a meeting between the chairs of councils and then to um, confer also with the vice chairs, so the chair of council, uh, who's the mayor, um, and uh, the chair of uh, one committee, which is Councillor DiGenova and myself as the other, to meet to go over rules so that we fall, all follow the same rules together. And um, it will be uh, my recommendation that the chair not speak um, to any matter at hand um, if uh, in debate. Once, in other words, once debate has opened and we're moving towards decision. Um, and um, if the chair wishes to speak to that matter, they should relinquish the chair. And if the vice chair has already spoken to the matter and thus been in a position of deemed to be biased towards the situation, the vice chair cannot assume that role. And council itself can choose another delegate or another member to be the chair of the meeting. I know that sounds a bit complicated, but it's basically to, um, to point towards um, council uh, having confidence in the chair's focus on chairing the meeting and the procedures along with that meeting. So I think moving forward, certainly that's what I intend to do, and um, hopefully in the meeting between uh, all of us who chair, we'll all agree on, on that procedure. Um, on another issue that was uh, raised to us, not at the time of the meeting, uh, but that came up subsequent to the meeting. Okay, Councillor DiGenova, your question? Thank you. My point of information, is this a special meeting or is this the same meeting um, that you're referring to that the mayor actually suggested? He, I, I understand the mayor suggested that the chairs of the committees, including council, which would be himself, all meet and then have also have a subsequent meeting with vice chairs. There, is this the same meeting or are you asking for a different meeting? Because no, you I said you- the, I think it'll be the same meeting. Yes. Okay, Yes. all right, so fine with that. And then did you want us all to give our opinions as you have given your opinion as to what should happen? As to what the chair should do? Um, Not give comments at all? I, I mean, it is now the proper venue to do that? I'm No. It, it, okay. It, it, if it is, well, then I will. Yeah. If it's not, then I I just wasn't sure because you gave your yeah. comments. So well, it's just that I that's should... what's in the bylaws. I'm just okay. confirming what's in our bylaws. Okay. So, um, secondly, um, regarding uh, the... Re the um, uh, end of the meeting when there was a vote called um, uh, a call uh, for the question, which is to call for a vote on the matter at hand, which at the time um, was a member's motion by Councillor Swanson, uh, protecting rental housing stock along arterial streets. Um, so uh, although the, maybe I'll, I'll start by saying clearly, Rules of procedure, from what I've done the research and, and conferred with our clerks, rules of procedure are in place 
to be followed, but at any time, if they're not questioned, um, it is de if they're not being followed and it's not questioned, it is deemed to be a consent of the group to proceed with whatever has happened. So it's important that everybody understand the rules of procedure and know that when there is a point at which something is not happening according to the rules of procedure, that you have the right to question it and to make sure that those rules of procedure are followed. Um, so I did at the time that the question was uh, was called the call for the question. I did a brief uh, conference with the clerk, but we were, if you remember, under quite a lot of stress with the 10 p.m. deadline uh, to make it through the meeting um, and specific business. Uh, and um, and I um, have reread. However, no one questioned that we didn't have any vote on it. That we just proceeded to a vote on the actual issue at hand. However, I've read through this, uh, the, the procedure bylaws, and I believe I should have called for a, um, I don't need to call for a seconder because we're in committee. In council, we would have to call for a seconder, but um, we, I should have called for a vote, or at least asked if there was anybody who objected um, to that call for the question. I didn't do that. We proceeded to the vote. Um, so, uh, um, I think that, uh, um, uh, I just wanted to also let you know, um, that I've done further research beyond our procedure bylaws and um, come across parliamentary, uh, par parliamentary experts who say also it would have been in order Under at that time. Um, yes, go ahead, Councillor Di Genova. It is. Oh, sorry. Sorry, we both put it on at the same time. Thanks. Uh, Chair Carr, I understand that we are currently going through a pilot pro process. I also understand that instead of just talking about procedure bylaw now and the city's procedure bylaw or what we have suspended the specific rules to be, that we are now going beyond that in your comments, specifically about parliamentarians uh, that, that you have consulted outside of City Hall. What's your so question, Councilor? My question you know is, is this pertinent to the conversation right now? Is this the best venue to be having this conversation? I feel that... In fact, this isn't in our procedure bylaw. It st clearly states how you can call a question. Someone called a question. So I, I feel that bringing in experts, when we haven't had the opportunity to do that, again, you and your role as the chair, I'm trying to be very respectful here, but I wonder if maybe you have the ability to share more here than other members do. And I feel that we should stick to the procedures and bylaws that are before us, and we have a very okay, lengthy Councilor agenda. Councillor you've asked a question. So I'm asking and is you if this is the appropriate yes. venue to discuss that, or if okay. we should do Thank this you. at the end of perfect, perfect. Um, and because because I am because you got your question, which is great. Um, because this question was asked of me of, of by a member of the public to me as chair, I believe that this is the appropriate venue for me to respond to the public question. And in doing my response, um, I am relaying to you information that I've collected that, that actually, yes. Go ahead, right. Councillor Di Genova. Um, was this question asked by a member of the public to all of council in this forum? Because I do not recall that. No, it was asked to me following the meeting as chair of the meeting, and I've been conferring with the clerk's office on this because there were response given, but as it was a question to me as chair, I think it's appropriate for the chair, when asked by a member of the public about a procedure, to be able to relay a response to that question in a way that also educates all of us around, around procedure. So I am doing that. Thank you very much, Councillor Di Genova. Um, so back to the matter at hand, um, and I think it might be important for councillors to understand this in terms of, um, uh, of parliamentary uh, procedure as well, um, that it, uh, uh, I believe in reading uh, on this, that it would have been an order for a member at that time to have raised a point of order 
Um, regarding parliamentary pr uh, procedure, uh, sorry, parliamentary privilege or point of privilege. Um, and that point of privilege is about allowing members, especially members in the minority on an issue, um, the time to be able to debate, to get their points out, and to have a full debate on the matter before the question is called. Um, that, is co that is a common practice elsewhere, I just thought you should all know. So if you feel that debate is being peremptorily ended before the points of view have been expressed at the council table, it is within your right to call a point of parliamentary privilege. Okay, so um, at this point, um, we, I've explained what should have happened. Um, at this point, it would be um, possible for a member who voted in the majority on, point, on parts A and B. Yes, Councillor Di Genova. Um, Chair Carr. With all due respect, we have a very lengthy agenda, and I don't see an email to from any member of this council before the end of that meeting requesting to do to to call for a vote of reconsideration. So, if there is a suggestion by the chair that that could happen, uh, it seems to me to be the same type of suggestion that concerned me and may have been perceived to be biased in the last meeting. That, oh, sorry. I thought um, I'm, I'm asking you if this is the appropriate venue to have this conversation. Councillor DiGenova, I absolutely believe it is important for the chair to be able to lay in front of all council members um, their uh, rights their pro and, and their, the opportunities for them to proceed in a way um, that is uh, according to our bylaws or Robert's Rules or Parliamentary Procedure. In other words, to make sure you're well informed about the moves that you can take, um, and as I do with all the motions in front of us, make sure that I walk you through, we're at this point, now we're moving on to the next point, and uh, I think that to have um, council members well informed on process is, um, is the role, within the duties and the role of chair. So I am dealing with a point of process here, and that point of process, because you may not know um, that, uh, because we dealt with this at the last, me this motion at the last meeting, um, a member who voted in the majority could ask to reconsider the motion. And you can do so at any time during, during this meeting. Um, so that is the right, my response to the two points that have been raised. And now, I would like to move forward. Okay, Councillor Dominato, point of information. Question, please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just seeking to make sure I understand clearly, is because I, uh, following on your comments, as well as the email that was circulated around the procedural bylaws, and that the vote, when it is called, as it was by the mayor, um, to call the question that evening, that the chair must put the motion to take the vote, and then it indicates council members must vote without further debate. But what I'm hearing is that there's actually, within our procedural bylaws, the opportunity for someone to raise a point of parliamentary procedure or privilege, and then it can actually be debated. Is that clear? Is that what, because I just want to be clear on, because I'm looking at the language in the procedural bylaws. Right. So, um, first of all, it is not stated within our procedure bylaw that you can raise, at what point you can raise points of privilege or points of order. Those kinds of things are within Robert's rules, and, um, and we do refer to the fact that you may rise on those kinds of points, right? So I'm just clarifying that point. And um, the second question you asked was something to do with debate. Yeah, just the, I just wanted to clarify um, because I'm looking at the um, part of the procedure bylaw section 12.4 and it talks about calling as a question the motion to take right. the vote then council members must vote without further debate so there is no debate of that if the question is called there is no debate we simply go not on the question on the question we simply that is vote. correct but you're saying is that someone could have raised a point of parliamentary privilege to say I have some concerns that the business hasn't been finished we haven't full and then that would would that be a, lead into a debate then about whether the question should be we should be proceeding with the question that is that I, I, I I'm seeking maybe it's the, maybe the clerks could speak to that I just want to make it, sure I'm crystal it wouldn't clear. be a debate it would be a ruling I think but I'll
Okay. So um, to, to be clear on the point on when a point of privilege um, or even parliamentary procedure or order can be called, once the vote has been called by the chair, the vote has to proceed without any, there's no calls for order, personal privilege, no calls for anything. In fact, everybody has to re remain silent and in their chairs while the vote proceeds. So no debate at that point. However, at the point at which there had been the call for the question and before I move, or the chair moves forward with the vote being called, that time period is the time period during which any council member may raise a point of privilege or of order or parliamentary procedure. Thank, thank you for clarifying that. That's yeah. helpful. Thank okay. you. Yes, Councillor DiGenova. Councillor Carr, it clearly states how a, a reconsideration of a resolution at a subsequent council meeting can be called for mm -hmm. in the procedure bylaws. So I personally, I'm, I'm, I'm just... I, I need to know why we're discussing this because I feel that we have gone through orientation sessions together. We've all come to this table. We call for a point of information if we have questions. And my question to you is, are you going to go through the entire procedural bylaw to see if we understand it all? Or is it just specifically this point? And then why? I have to ask you, why this point are we bringing up? Why aren't we talking about how somebody okay. can call notice on a motion. Councilor Carr, I have to ask you why we are talking about something that council members are, should, should already know. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Councilor, did yes, you know you've asked like your question? No, I'd like to know why we are doing yes. this now. Yes. And what member has called for this? Call, Councilor, did you, no Councilor did you know You've asked that question twice. I'll answer it again. I am responding as chair to a request for um, information about the process that occurred at the end of the last meeting and what and um, the process around the vote and uh, and any follow-up to that I'm responding to a specific request made to me as chair from a member of the of the public and I believe it is full transparency and much better that I answer that question to all of you and in the public <sighs> Yes, Councillor DiGenova? I did not know that members of the public could make requests about reconsideration. It clearly states here that it has to be a council member that makes those requests, and it clearly states here what the rules are. So why are we going through this? This isn't something that the public, the public elected us to vote a certain way. The public, I'm asking, I just want to make sure I have your full attention. The public, and I will need, a, I will be moving for a legal recess if we continue on this path, because I am asking this question. The public elected us to vote. We come here, we get as much information as we can, we hear the public when we are scheduled to hear the public, we have times that we have to legally hear from them during public hearing, but they're not to actually influence like one member of the public should not be influencing our vote or our process. And it clearly states in section 5.13 of the procedure bylaw, uh, under reconsideration of a resolution at a subsequent meeting. I mean, I, I'm wondering, it says this here, every council member knows it. So if you needed the information, I fully support you asking the clerk's office or staff for that information but you had that information, so why are you assuming the council does not understand how to call a vote of reconsideration? I'm asking you that question, and are you suggesting, as you suggested before, that you would hope that a referral be defeated? No, that, I... Did somebody I, call a, Councilor, a vote of reconsideration? Councilor DiGenova, I have answered your question several times, and, um, and you may chair as you wish when you were in the chair. As chair of the standing committee, um, when I am asked a question by the member of public around procedures of this committee, I feel duty bound to answer that question, and I think it is far more transparent for the public for me to answer it in public session, which I am doing. And now we are going to proceed. Thank you very much. Okay, so we um, have a number of motions, uh, five motions remaining from the, the last. Uh, yes. Not a problem. Go ahead, Councillor Swanson. I've been on the list for a while. I just wanted to thank you very much for bringing this up. I think it's really important. 
I was one of the people who was kind of confused about what was happening that night, but I deferred to people who I thought knew more about procedure than me. And I'm in rethinking what happened, I'm thinking that it's a dangerous, it would be a dangerous precedent if we allowed people to just call the question and bring votes to a premature end without having a vote. So I'm really pleased that you brought it up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Swanson. Councillor Di Genova. I'm sorry, Councillor, sorry, Chair Carr, it's not sitting well with me to hear that there was information that you as the chair consulted parliamentarians on without council asking you to do that or our staff. And I feel that our staff have, has uh, brought forward this procedure by law. We've chosen to suspend certain parts of it. So unless you're, you've proposed to suspend a certain part of it, which you, you haven't and it would only apply moving forward, then I think I'd like to move for a legal recess because I, I need to understand, should we be doing, is that good practice to go and get our own information and come back to council and suggest as chair to everyone that this is the information given by a parliamentarian instead of our own city clerk's office is clearly listed in our procedural bylaw under section 5.13. 5, 5 Councillor DeGenova. I'd like to move for a five, for a 10 Councilor, minute. Councillor DeGenova, what is your point of order? My, my point of order is under 5.13, or uh, sorry, my point of order is under 5.13, it clearly states what this is. Um, what question Karikin, are you asking? I, I'm my, sorry, I'm very unclear about what question you're asking. My legal. question is, Chair Carr, is it good practice or is it practice? And perhaps this is something that if you don't know this, we should. Ask, I would ask you to ask the clerk about this. If each council member should just go out and get their own advice when they're chairing a meeting and share that with the public without going through our own the, legal the, staff. Councillor Di Genova, this is not, I'm ruling that you are not, there's no, no point of order in that. Oh, oh, okay. Great, so let's move on to, um, to the motion, uh, the next motion on the agenda, which is uh, reducing truck pollution in Clark Knight Corridor and other city streets, which was moved and introduced by Councillor Swanson at the last regular council meeting on May 28th, and we are now going to hear from speakers to this. Um, this is item six, so I'm going to read out the first three names so that you know if your order is coming up. Um, Marilyn Hogan is first, followed by Stephanie Langford, followed by Ann Roberts. Marilyn Hogan, well, welcome to Council Chambers. She has. Yes, Ms. Hogan, go ahead. Hello, uh, Council. I'm pleased to be here. I'm Marilyn Hogan. I'm a, a longtime housing and environmental activist and involved with various community groups. And this motion addresses both environmental and residential needs, and I'm here to wholeheartedly support it. Uh, there's a petition as well, which is on paper and online for, I believe at this point, a total of 426 um, signatures, so I'm offering it to you here. Uh, the Clark Knight uh, Corridor, as you might know, has the worst traffic pollution in Canada. It's caused by the high number of older, heavy-duty diesel trucks traveling to and from the port of Vancouver. Not only is the noise deafening, but researchers found that Clark Drive failed to meet the region's standards to limit nitrogen dioxide emissions. Vehicles also spew black carbon or soot, which is known to be carcinogenic. The traffic pollution can be detected as far as 250 meters from major roads. That puts tens of thousands of Vancouver residents in this area at risk of rep respiratory diseases such as asthma and at risk of heart disease and lung cancer. People travel, work, and go to school in the area. They, we, need clean air as much as anyone in any other Vancouver neighborhood. One resident said, I live a few houses in from Knight Street and have noticed a significant change in both the tra traffic and the pollution that makes its way inside my home. 
I get significant dust and sticky grunge on my windowsills and surfaces despite keeping my windows and doors closed as much as possible. I have reduced lung capacity and now I have a chronic cough. Trucks should not be on residential streets. Another said, the semis, truck, dump, dump trucks, etc., belch pollution at an alarming rate, unquote. With Port of Vancouver expansion underway, this pollution problem needs to be solved now or it will only get worse. The good news is that it can be done. In addition to all the measures set forth in this motion to deal with trucks and mitigate their impacts, I urge the city to pressure all levels of government to toughen regulations, increase in enforcement, and set new standards for alternative fuels and new types of trucks with zero emissions. Other cities are coming up with creative solutions, so now is a great time for all of us to think outside the box and come up with creative solutions here in Vancouver. Here is an excellent an opportunity for Vancouver to be proactive and forward thinking as you develop clean energy policies and further establish the city's commitment to sustainable energy in the next 30 years. A unanimous vote of support for this motion and the measures outlined in it would send a strong message to all governments and organizations that Vancouver is serious in its commitment to 100% renewable energy by the year 2050. Thank you. That's great. Now, uh, councillors, I think I, I, I'm not sure if this is an earlier queue. Um, I think so. All right, so I'm going to clear the queue, and if you want to ask any questions of the speaker, you can add yourself to the queue. Okay, I don't see any questions, but thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Thank you very much. Next, Stephanie Langford, followed by Ann Roberts and Sam George. Stephanie Langford. Okay. I see Ann Roberts here. Welcome, Ms. Roberts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I won't uh, repeat what Marilyn said, uh, who summed up very clearly the dire straits that we're in with uh, the Clark Knight Corridor and being the most uh, pollution, the most traffic and truck pollution in Canada. And um, uh, those, those are caused primarily by the 2,000 trucks going back and forth, mostly to the port, to the industrial area. And bad as this all is, it's going to get worse. As we all know, the port uh, has a major expansion underway. And right now, with 2,000 trucks going back and forth each day, after that expansion, in just three years, it will go up to 3,000 trucks a day. The port's own air quality studies, which many people have criticized, but anyway, be that as it may, they even those show that emissions will double at the terminal and along the supply chain. Metro Vancouver is on record of warning that the nitrogen dioxide levels will likely exceed new federal objectives that are scheduled to be in place by 2020. So already it's, you know, get threatening those levels and for sure after the expansion it's not going to meet that. Metro asked the port to take measures to mitigate these effects, but the port has no requirement to do so. Residents in Strathcona, Grandview Woodlands, and Burrard View neighborhood associations have been doing heroic duty for us all, trying to convince the port to reduce the pollution at the terminal and along the supply chain. The port does ha have taken some measures. They tried to require older trucks to be replaced. They require trucks to be com uh, compliant regarding particulates. They've got fuel efficiency and reduction of GHGs, but it's just not enough. Metro Vancouver's monitoring station on Clark is the only one that last year failed to meet the region's air quality standards on, on nitrogen dioxide emissions. What the port is doing is not working, it's not good enough, let alone now, let alone at, after the port expands. BC's Environment Assessment Office put a condition on the port to establish a monitoring program, but it did not require it to reduce emissions. I'm sure you saw the Vancouver Coastal Health's letter in support of this motion. I'm pleased it's willing to work with the city and Metro Vancouver to examine policy and regulatory options to mitigate and minimize exposure to traffic-related pollution on Clark Knight and really around the city. Two-thirds of Canadians are exposed, are close enough to a major road to be affected by these kind of measures. We have to take seriously the health consequences of zoning and development decisions. Vancouver has a long history of placing multifamily housing along arterials as a transition into single-family areas. 
With Vancouver's high housing costs and low vacancy rates, it means the residents with the lowest incomes end up living along the major roadways like Clark Knight. That means people with lower incomes are really being put more at risk than other residents of our city. We need to examine all of that carefully and find ways to ensure the same standards of health and safety are applied to all residents equally. Thank you, I urge you to vote in favor of this motion. Thank you, and uh, you do have questions, so Ms. Roberts, if you would just stay there, and Councillor Swanson, go ahead. Yep, thank you so much. I was just wondering if there are things in your head that you're thinking that maybe the city could push for that would redu reduce pollution. Well, I think one of the things I've heard from the residents who've worked on this so long is that they feel the city has been present but not really taking a leadership role at, say, Metro Vancouver and with the federal government, provincial government. So I think that it's really important that the city, although it's not the primary responsibility, you know, to be much more active, the, state, the staff, and every, people are looking at alternate fuels and all. You know, for example, in uh, Germany, they recently came out with a, uh, a, a developed a new kind of truck that is really like our trolley buses. It, it runs on an electric lines, so that through the area where people live, it can um, be on an electric thing and then disengage and go off to where it needs to go. So we, we really could do those kind of investments. It okay. could be done. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Those are your questions. Thanks, Ms. Roberts. Um, next, uh, Ms. Uh, Sam George. And thank you for sending your notes in. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Carr. Uh, Mayor Stewart, I'd like to address, although he's absent, because I did send him an email uh, and counselors. Thanks for the opportunity. No, before I do that, I'll introduce myself. My full name is Sabu Samuel George. People also call me Sabu or Sam. Thanks for this opportunity to, cont to contribute to my Douglas Park and adjacent Camby area neighborhood. I'm bringing to your attention serious issues that many in our city think about but do not have the time to present to council. I have grave concern about the congestion on Camby Street, particularly extra long trailers with heavy loads of timber products coming from downtown and proceeding south up to Broadway and onwards. That's an accident waiting to happen. Often I see near misses between pedestrians, cars, and cyclists. While I was on the Kerasdale Community Center board, a board member, Sheila, was killed 16 years ago at the pedestrian crosswalk at West Boulevard and 41st Avenue. I would not want to see that on any intersection along Camby Street. At present, there are no major developments along Camby Street north of King Edward Avenue. So in planning for development along the Camby Corridor, safe alternatives for heavy traffic need to be developed and put in place. In a letter to me, the engineering department said, quote, trucks would not see the value of traveling a greater distance by going to Knight Street and then going west. The letter showed a lack of sensitivity I'm sure that City Council will consider that human life is more valuable than the extra cost to truck companies. I suggest that heavy vehicles and trucks should use Clark Drive, although it will add to their cost, but it would save the cost of human lives or avoid serious injuries to pedestrians and cyclists. I might preface uh, my last paragraph by saying that I'm a retired professional consultant in international development, and I've worked in several countries uh, overseas. International cities such as Singapore, Stockholm, Milan, Copenhagen will not allow heavy traffic to mix with small vehicles and cyclists, not to mention the increased vulnerability of pedestrians, especially seniors, while crossing intersections. In those cities, truck traffic is allowed to use arterial roads at night between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. If Vancouver is to become a truly international city with good tourism and good investments, 
and the place of choice of new immigrants, this issue of trucks and heavy traffic has to be dealt with urgently, please. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And you do have questions, so I'm just going to advance Councilor Di Genova. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming and for waiting. I know it's taken several days to understand where this would fall on the agenda, so I wanted to thank you for your time. Uh, I, I was looking up some of the uh, very unfortunate fatalities at crosswalks and intersections, and although they happen more often at large arterials, that's because there's, there's more vehicle traffic passing through there. Um, the previous council also suggested that it was better to have people on major arterials driving through there than to have them uh, cutting through quieter neighborhoods, perhaps, because, in fact, that may cause more fatalities, and we heard about that. So there is vehicle traffic. There is truck traffic. Where do you propose, where, how do you propose we co-locate that, considering those routes are also routes that are best utilized by transit as well? And transit-centered locations are usually what I hear from planning staff uh, are where we should be co-locating or looking to closely locate um, any increases in density we have. I'm not an engineer by profession. And I like to leave technical things. The, the, the city has perfectly qualified engineers uh, in urban planning and so on. I will just add, as, as a professional who did work in planning, uh, if anybody has traveled, I walk along. I don't ride my bike on Cambridge Street. I'll be killed shortly, very, very soon. Uh, it's a very narrow street. And trucks miss the opening doors of cars by inches because the car, the driver, has not looked in the mirror before they open the... Then they realize the truck is coming, they immediately close the door. Uh, I will only add, I think the lady Ann Roberts mentioned, I think as counsel, this is nothing to do with my comments here, uh, I, I suggest to you, please, that Vancouver... I. My wife and I moved here in 1988 from Ontario. Uh, several years I was overseas, but I've seen Vancouver evolve into a city from a small, a large town to a small city. The next 20 or 30 years, it's going to be a big city. And uh, I think the lady mentioned uh, about innovations for trucks that are being done in Germany. Uh, so I only cities. have 15 seconds left, so just really quickly. Actually, 10. Okay. 10. Do you, do you see that it's being problematic if, if this were to go through, getting tra truck traffic through these areas? Uh, I Personally, I think a solution for heavy traffic, uh, not depending on trucks, has to be worked out. I, I don't know what that is. Great. That's great. I, we are over time. Thank you very much. Uh, um, oh, actually, you have more questions. So, and um, I will just ask uh, Council and and uh, you, um, you actually as well. The focus is really on pollution, on the truck po related pollution, um, not certain safety in this motion. So, if we kind of can concentrate on that, it uh, it would be good. Councillor Dominato, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. George, for being here. Uh, just, I just did want to follow up and um, recognizing, uh, Chair, that your comments there, but you did comment on um, other countries and some of the work they've undertaken around uh, truck traffic, and, and I don't know if it was tied to congestion or tied to pollutants, but you mentioned um, uh, undertaking that work uh, in the late hours between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. I'm just would you, Can you give us examples of what countries have done that to sort of uh, put in regulations around that? I think uh, from from the little research I did, Singapore, Stockholm, Milan, and Copenhagen are specific cities that have done that. I understand Berlin and uh, Rome are working on something, meaning uh, they're, they're working on reducing the proportion of large vehicles and increasing the proportion of smaller vehicles, including mopeds and scooters. But the specific examples I know are these four cities. And uh, I, in fact, got some information for our provincial 
Minister Claire Trevino uh, on another initiative of mine. Mayor Stewart knows that uh, to wean ourselves away from cars and to get into public transit, including trains. Uh, that's a separate thing, I think. I was just going to ask you whether you thought maybe we should be looking at rail, but... <laughs> uh, but well, sure. I, I will just add, uh, Chair, Chair Carr knows this. I've sent an email to Mayor Stewart and to um, Adrian Carr. A one high-speed link, I just came back from a holiday in Europe, uh, the high-speed trains in France and northern Spain. Just, just beautiful. If we have one link from Vancouver to Hope, or at least to Chilliwack, it will reduce easily the number of cars coming into Vancouver by 50%. And those cars that are coming in are going around the city, as opposed to relying on public transit within the city, mm -hmm. and then going back home and using the cars on the weekends. Well, and. And I appreciate that because you were making a, a, a good point around the, the just the vehicle traffic in general that we have in our city and the need. What I'm hearing is the importance of public transit and how do we increase that so we get people out of their cars. And so, but uh, thank you for that. I, that's all the questions I had, but I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Those are your thank questions. You. Um, and next, we have Jim Sands, followed by Andrea Lum and Leslie Kemp. Mr. Sands? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is uh, Jim Sands, and I live on a rented apartment located in the 1200 block of East Pender. That puts me just a half a block away from Clark Drive, and uh, within the 250 meters that they say pollution uh, falls from the, from the trucks. So I am speaking in favor of this motion. In August of 1999, my good friend Brenda Haggart was riding her bicycle near her home on Clark Drive when she was struck and killed by a diesel truck. Brenda was a friend of mine and a musical collaborator. She was also the most dedicated environmentalist I ever met. Every day of her too short life was dedicated to lessening our dependence <clears throat> excuse me, on fossil fuels. Now, one of the things I realized as a result of this terrible tragedy was that the neighborhoods we both we shared was a dangerous place. And we live in the area because it was affordable and because there were off-the-grid off the places where complete creative people like ourselves could thrive, like the grass that grows in the cracks of the concrete sidewalks. Now, the reason I'm talking about Brenda is that I know that if she were alive today, I'm certain she would be right in this spot speaking to you, and I'm almost certain she would be appalled. She'd be appalled that the pollution from the diesel trucks traveling up and down Clark has gone abated for so long appalled that the monitoring had taken place over a long period of time and the results have apparently not been shared in a meaningful way with the many people who live and work along the Clark Drive's corridor so that we can assess our level of risk. And finally, I think she'd be appalled that the city is giving serious consideration to development permits which will bring hundreds of new residents and workers into the area before meaningful solutions to this problem have been developed and implemented. One other issue, I applaud the City of Vancouver and its staff for initiatives uh, such as the Creative City Strategy and the Vancouver Music Strategy. I've participated in several events addressing these topics, but these, effect, uh, these efforts aren't going to be effective if the artists and the musicians who live in Vancouver, often in areas close to me, aren't, if we're not alive and healthy enough to benefit from them. So I need to ask this council for your, for your help. First, I want you to reach out to the groups that are involved with this issue, the Port of Vancouver, Metro Vancouver, the provincial and federal departments involved, and I need you to be my advocate to push towards a solution. Second, I need you to bring everybody together, including the residents and all the decision makers, to, to develop a coordinated solution that, ad that addresses these issues that are, that are uh, or the issues that are of concern and the issues that are identified in this motion. And finally, I need the city to provide ongoing information to me and the many residents affected by this problem. What is going on? What are the risks? What can I do to mitigate the risks while, while the long-term solutions are being developed? I see this motion as an important first step in uh, getting us on the way to a, to a solution. I ask you to take these actions for me. I ask you to do this for the thousands of Vancouver residents who live along Clark Drive corridor, seniors, artists, children's, uh, children and families, and I ask you to do this. 
for my friend Brenda. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sands. You do have questions. So. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sands, for being here. I'm sorry to hear about your friend, um, Brenda. I, I hear people bring up different issues with regards to this motion, which the way it's written currently really specifically focuses on pollution, but I hear you um, kind of bring up issues of safety. Um, and so it worries me when I you describe stories of sort of having people biking on a major truck arterial. So do you think that really part of the takeaway here is that um, the city needs to look at education, street management, street design in terms of ensuring those safety issues because you're not the first speaker to bring that up. And so I'm thinking, should we be having education campaigns about people not biking on the arterials? That's why we're putting in, we've got the more separated bike lanes because that is a very different and distinct issue from pollution. Right, yeah, I'm not bringing up a cycling issue here, but I am bringing up a sort of a, a, a very deep uh, Irony, I guess, that somebody who was an incredibly dedicated environmentalist was killed by a diesel truck on Clark Drive. So, yes, I do think that part of the solution is looking at cycling and cycling alternatives. But I think the other part of the solution is really um, understanding that this is a place where people live. And, uh, you know, we live in this area. I think the big thing about that incident is um, that living close to Clark Drive is a little bit like living near the airport. You know, every, the diesel, the trucks come and go, and you don't you hardly notice them after a while. Uh, so I noticed them then. I noticed them about uh, 10 years ago when I was diagnosed uh, with asthma, uh, you know, a mild case or borderline case of asthma. And I notice it now as these reports come out, and I start to, to pay attention to how many trucks are going by my my window, my open windows every day. Okay, and, and how close? How close, may I ask? Do you live? Um, in I'm a half a block drive? from Clark. You're half a block. Okay, and you've been there for some time. I think you said twenty-five years. Twenty-five years, and have you seen much change in, in the corridor? In, well, as I think people are noting, I think sort of anecdotally, it seems a lot busier. There's a lot more traffic going in in and out of the out of the port, and uh, it's more it's more uh, concentrated there. As well. Great, thank you. Also, I think I think one other thing I think that's important to say is that. Uh, uh, my, I, I was, as I say, diagnosed a few years ago with asthma. I don't have any, haven't had any symptoms until last summer when, of course, we had all the smoke <laughs> coming through the lower mainland. So the multiple issues are from the wildfires. concern to me. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you. We still have more questions. Councillor Swanson. Yes, thanks so much for coming, and I'm really sorry about your friend. I mean, we've had three speakers, and two of them have had friends who've been killed in traffic accidents. That's pretty bad. Um, you did give some examples of the kinds of information that you thought it would be helpful if the city uh, produced. So I thought it would be good if you could maybe elaborate on that a little bit. And also, um, on what kinds, have you given any thought to what kinds of coordinated solutions you'd like to see? Great. Um, well, I, I raised the issue of information because I became aware of this through a series of articles. I think they were published in a in a local paper I found found online, and uh, and then as I was thinking about this presentation, I thought, well, what if I what nobody's ever contacted me or no official person has told me about the results. I know there's a monitoring station at uh, Clark, I believe Clark and Twelfth. And uh, how long has that been in operation? How, how long have the results been uh, in this uh, zone that puts us in the worst place in North America? How long have the results been of concern? So just even that basic information of what's being monitored and uh, what, what, are, what exactly are the risks. And then I think there are specific uh, sort of like public health information about if you live in a corridor or if you live in this area, what do I need to do? Uh, closing my windows? Um, isn't always practical for me. Days like, the weeks like we've had this week, it's very difficult to stay indoors baking like a baked potato. So, you know, so those, I hope, I hope that answers it. What was, your, what was the second part? The, um, oh, the actions, the coordinated actions. Well, yeah. I just, again, looking at the motion, I started to realize, oh, okay, you know, somebody should do something. And, but the responsibility lies in a lot of different areas. So it lies with the port. It lies with the province, who's mo presumably monitoring areas. I know Metro Vancouver is playing a role. So um, I just would like to see people working together towards the same goal. And, and I think that's an important role that the city can play, as I say, 
I'm identifying the city as my advocate and my voice to those people. So I can call the Port of Vancouver up and ask them what's going on with diesel trucks, and they may or may not answer my call, but I think if a city council or a senior staff member or senior councillor calls them, they can get an answer to that and hopefully convey that to me. I hope we can get this motion passed and be your advocate and your voice. Thank you. Thank you. you still have more questions. Thanks, Councillor Swanson. Councillor DiGenova. Thank you also for coming out to speak to us and thank you for being patient with us as I know it's taken some time. Um, looking directly at D, and I may call for a point of information afterwards. Um, as it states, the council directs staff as part of the citywide planning process to examine the city's zoning, building codes, and planning policies and practices, such as prioritizing placement of multifamily buildings on arterials. So what I, what I see that saying is look at our policies. Right now our policies suggest that we should uh, put, we should be placing and zoning multifamily uh, dwellings on arterials. Uh, if we were to not do that, my understanding from sitting through several hours of staff presentations is that we would, in fact, have a situation where people wouldn't use transit as much and get in their cars and vehicles because they wouldn't perhaps be directly on a transit route. So I'm wondering if, I, I mean, I understand that staff are already looking at our building codes, planning policies, and zoning. Are you concerned with the, the current way that that's moving forward? Well, I'm, I, I think the higher level issues around where, where housing is placed and how it relates to transit and that sort of thing are sort of outside of my pay grade. But, uh, and outside of this discussion, I think, I think it's an important issue, but uh, I think it's a larger discussion. But I, I think what I would say is uh, just uh, 10 feet from me, there's a, there's a development application for 203 suites on a 1200 block of East Hastings. And so they're going to be uh, populating those 203 suites with people. And my question is, who's responsible for telling them that they live in the, uh, you know, the most polluted uh, corridor in, in, in Canada? Uh, is somebody going to tell them? Is the developer going to tell them? Are they going to be required to tell them? Who's going to give them that warning uh, so that they don't invest uh, 25 years of their life into some place that, uh, that may, not, may, not have a, may not be good for them? Um I, I wonder where are those 203, or did you say 230? Yeah. 200, 203? 203 suites, yeah. 203 suites or families, where are they going to be otherwise if that housing isn't built? So, well, And will they have cars then because they don't live on a major arterial? Well, that's why I'm calling on the city to sort of play a le leadership role on this issue to, uh, to ensure that residents and users of the street are, uh, that there's a coordinated solution, because it's not acceptable. I mean, let's agree whether we live in Clark Drive or whether we live near Granville or, or Oak or anywhere else in the city, it's not acceptable to, for there to be an ongoing issue like this, an ongoing air pollution issue of this, of this nature. It oh. needs to be addressed. Thank you, and sorry I'm limited by time, but Hornby Street. So bike line was put in on Hornby Street, and I've never seen traffic backed up more specifically on Hornby Street than I do currently. So that creates more pollution. I've heard from many people who have shown me studies about this. What's your thought on that? Because if we, I mean, if we take out a, a vehicle lane to increase that space, it doesn't necessarily mean less traffic will come through. It just may mean more idling. I'm not convinced that's relevant to this discussion, but I, I do, I would note I live close to Adnac bike lane and Nobody's been backed up or there's never been a problem with that. It's an important uh, transportation corridor in the city. For me I do see this people. motion asks us to look at that also. So I, I do appreciate your comments uh, very much. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Still more questions. Uh, Councillor Dominato. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you for being here this afternoon. I um, appreciate the comments. Uh, obviously, we're grappling with uh, pollutants in a, a, a wide variety of ways, including, as you mentioned, the forest fire system in recent uh, years, and uh, I think we had the first-hand experience of that. I'm curious, in speaking to the motion today, are you um, a, 
are you opposed to housing on arterials or are you more concerned about, I heard you repeatedly talk about sort of the awareness that people should just simply be aware, sort of, sort of awareness education about the risk of pollutants in areas because we have obviously a number of arterials. We're talking about Clark and Knight, but there's actually quite a number that carry truck traffic. And so I'm just curious if, if you're sort of, what's the strongest position for you? Is, is that needing more awareness and education or is it more about we just simply shouldn't have any housing on arterials? Well, I, I think the idea of reviewing the zoning and uh, what the procedures are is, a, is an important idea, and I would sort of await the results of that. Um, but again, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm speaking from my role as an individual who lives in the area. So what I'm saying is, as somebody who lives here, I think the issue of import information is critical, and I think the ball's been dropped on that. I've lived there 20, 25 years. She, uh, Ann Roberts talked about 2,000 trucks a day. So many, how many trucks have gone by my window uh, spewing out um, particulates that are cancer-causing and are causing of serious lung, lung issues, and which you know, I've experienced a little bit of? And uh, how long has that been going on? And, who's, and uh, why haven't I been sort of informed or fully informed about this? You know, that's the question. And then the, moving forward, how do we inform people who are living there or planning to live there. There's uh, three uh, development signs in a block of my place right now for housing, for a brew pub that'll employ 30 people, for, an, uh, I believe, a, a warehouse that'll employ other people. So all those people are moving into the neighborhood. And who's going to tell them what the risk is? I can mitigate or I can deal with the risk as long as I know what the, have the ap adequate information. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Again, more questions? Thank you, Councillor John Manato. Councillor Hardwick. Thank you, Mr. Sands. Mm -hmm. So, um, a wrestling with this, because of course, Vancouver, as I've said many time, times, Council's heard me say this, Vancouver exists because it's the terminus of the railway. And the port has been foundational to our economic development since the earliest days and continues to do so, which is why it's expanding. Um, the the uh, Clark Knight corridor, in particular, was developed as a the truck corridor, you know, on the the trajectory that it comes in very specifically to service the port, rather than just being an internal street to the city, like other residential streets, for example. So, how do you balance off the need to be able to to keep the the growing city and region? Uh, industrial base active because we need it um, and at the same time be accommodating for uh, tr for um, residential growth I think that's the biggest problem that we have we we need jobs we need the economic development we need to be able to move goods in and out both by rail and by truck so how do we balance that in your view well um, I, your point is well taken. I, actually, the building that I live in is over 100 years old. It was actually built in the 1800s. And the story I've heard is that it was a bunkhouse for workers on the CPR. And uh, so in 1912, it was converted into an apartment building. And it now sort of exists in, a, in an industrial or a light industrial zoning. Uh, but it's uh, grandfathered in as a residence. And there's many other places like that in the, in the neighborhood. And that's how we managed to to live as artists and creators uh, cheaply, <laughs> less expensively. Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't, uh, I'm not proposing anything at this point in terms of shutting down the port or anything like that, but I, what I am proposing is talking to them, bringing them to the table, inviting them to, to talk about this issue and what can be done. I think we've heard lots of... Uh, uh, points around solutions, around uh, looking at the individual trucks. Some of the issues are related to the age of the trucks, related to the, uh, the type of trucks that are being used and that sort of thing. So I think we need to look at those issues and really understand where responsibility uh, lies for that. I, underst I understand that the, the, uh, just a block away from my place is the main entrance to the, to the port. And, it will always be thus, but it doesn't, just because we can't do everything doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything. And I think this motion uh, asks council to do something. Yeah, I don't think anybody's going to be going, yay, pollution. Yeah. Uh, but it is a pre, it, as you acknowledge, it's a pre, it's like a pre-existing condition. That's there, this is, this is the route, and how do we mitigate it? 
I think that's the, the, the big question. But thank you very much for your input. Okay, and that is questions. Thank you for your patience and, and for being here. Thank you for your time. Yeah, great. And uh, we're on to Andrea Lum, followed by Leslie Kemp. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I um, was very happy to read this motion that was being put forward today. And um, I can't tell you um, from living in very close to the Clark Drive corridor um, how very much um, I know that something has to be done and I am very much for this motion today. I'm just going to read you a few things. I'm not sure if you all received my emails um, with these huge, these photos of, for example, these huge um, behemoth um, cargo ships that are carrying 15 times more of the container traffic than a regular ship. It's already being used in San Diego. And um, when I was on the um, Flats Arterial panel, uh, we were told that the container traffic is going to increase 70% um, at the Port of Vancouver. So um, I have seen over the years, I, I have, I spent all my summers in Little Italy, um, where my great-grandfather's home and my mother was born and all of that, where five generations living in that neighborhood. And um, I'm like four blocks up from Clark Drive. Um, uh, the Clark Drive um, traffic, the pollution has increased from the time, of course, I'm a little child. It really wasn't very problematic. And um, I just want to say that I, I, I'm a very low foot conscious, you know, imprint person. Um, so I'm a vegan since I was a child and I bus, I do transit everywhere. And I have to stand on Clark Drive to pick up the 22 to come into downtown. And I will tell you, it is so, um, it, it's, it's, sometimes it's really unbearable. And I have to, I have to stand right there. So what I'm bringing up today is I hope you have seen those um, photos. And um, I sent also a photo about the particulate matter we're talking about. So. One hair of one hair on your head is seventy times, seven zero times in diameter of one particulate matter two point five. The zero point one is not, you know, you you can't even you know divide that. So this is what is being um, produced by these trucks from their diesel emissions, the chemical reaction that happens when the there's the combustion and. It, this 2.5 p.m. and the 0 0.1 are not visible to the naked eye. And it's so small that it actually gets into your bloodstream. And this is how it creates heart attacks. So the um, cholesterol and stress is not, um, you know, the only major um, causes of, of heart failure. Um, I have, if you go and... Uh, go, go do a search. You can go f and read medical um, articles about this. So in the Journal of the American Heart Association, um, studies of hospital admissions and emergency department visits have linked exposure to par particulate air pollution with increased risk of cardiovascular diseases. Um, and as few as two hours after being inhaled, these can penetrate the lungs and the natural defenses and may trigger a heart attack. Ms. So, Ms. Lam, so, you are out of time. Oh, sorry. It, it is three minutes. But I wanted to reassure, and you don't have any questions, but I did want to reassure you that your email has been received by council along with the photos. They all come up. So my thing is, yeah, I, just I'm sorry. to go around Vancouver to Robert Banks, yeah, Delta Port, whatever, with all this container traffic, which is not even staying in Vancouver. It goes yeah. to New York, Montreal, Toronto, the big cities that want all this consumer stuff. Yes. So just go you've around made, the city. You've made, you've made that clear in your letter, too. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Leslie Kemp. No Leslie Kemp. OK, 
Okay, that ends our speakers list uh, on this item. And um, so council, uh, we are ready to go into uh, discussion and, and uh, the decision-making process. So um, I'm sorry, I've got, I'm, okay, just one second, I'll get your mic on. Council, go ahead, Councillor Dominato. Um, so Madam Chair, I'm just curious if we will have an opportunity to ask uh, questions of staff since we have our Deputy City Manager here and I have some questions. Here, during the question period through me, you can ask uh, questions of the city, uh, Deputy City Manager, yes. Okay. I'll put myself on the queue. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Councillor Fry, go ahead. Oh, I thought Councillor Swanson was ahead of me and I wasn't 100% um, ready, but now I, I am ready. I don't see Councillor Swanson on the list, Councillor Fry. Oh, you I, don't I, need to stand, we're in committee. Oh. Well, all right. Okay. No uh, thank you, Chair. I did uh, supply um, an amendment to the clerk. Okay. Two amendments, actually. Uh, I will um, say... Just a second. I'm just going to move us to an amendment. Uh, so we are right now... Just one second. I'm just, we are in question, question and debate, but I think we, there's, the motion has been moved, so I believe an amendment is in order at this time. It is. Okay. Um, I'm going to move us to an amendment Q. And I will put you right back on, oops, first get you on the list, one second. Uh, and I, I will start by saying that I'm in 100% support of this motion. Uh, this has been an issue, I, I live in the neighborhood, this has been an ongoing issue, uh, the heavy diesel particulate matter. This is actually an emergent issue uh, throughout North America and Europe as well, where we're seeing class action suits directed at the development of housing and stuff along arterials where there's heavy trucking because we now know that diesel particulate matter is a significant health risk to the human population, low birth rates, uh, low birth weights, uh, uh, COPD, and a variety of different sort of health impacts. Um, and I would will acknowledge that the work that uh, the Metro has been doing and the Climate Action Committee, uh, they have a new plan coming out uh, June, I believe this month, or last Friday, actually, and it's coming to the Metro General Board in the next few months, and they're looking to lower the nitrous, uh, nitrogen oxide uh, dioxide standards uh, to lower minimums. I will, however, note that uh, still to this day on the Metro Vancouver air map, uh, and I've brought this up every time I'm at Metro, and the pollution map uh, for the port of Metro Vancouver, the Vancouver port side, does no tracking of diesel particulate matter or SOX or NOx. Uh, it measures the weather and which way the wind is blowing. And I'm looking at it right now, and it is really frustrating because we know that that is one of the highest sources of air pollution in our city and our region. Uh, so I'm going to flag that one more time. But to the specifics of my two uh, amendments, which I consider to be uh, helpful to Councillor Swanson's uh, original motion, uh, number one in the uh, A section, Adding a clause for the uh, BC to review the BC Ministry of Transportation's Air Care on Road program, specifically as pertains to the monitoring of heavy duty diesel particulate matter emissions in urban settings. So the province eliminated the air care a number of years ago and they introduced uh, an air care on road program, which is basically a visual identification of trucks that seem to emit a lot of black smoke and they'll target those ones. I'm not sure that it's effectively doing the job for really capturing the emissions of diesel particulate matter, in particular in our urban settings, and I think that we uh, are owed a better review of that because uh, just door knocking as a political canvasser, walking around the neighborhood, knocking on doors where there's a lot of truck traffic, you get the soot on your fingers. That stuff is being breathed into folks' lungs. Uh, the second amendment that I'd like to add is on F. Uh, and that's uh, including but not limited to public signage. Uh, we have signs throughout the city of Vancouver that caution that this is a, a non-idling zone and don't smoke near an air intake. I think the very least we can do is inform members of the public that if they're hanging out on a heavy-duty truck route, such as Clark Knight, that they are actually, uh, there are health risks associated with that. So I think that we should publicly acknowledge that. And I think that if there is a, a, an important precedent to consider that there is actual lawsuits that are proceeding across North America and Europe, specifically where uh, the public have not been warned about health impacts of DPMs. So those are my two amendments, and happy to support Councillor Swanson's motion, and I thank her very much for this. Great. Thanks. Councillor Fry, to the amendment. Councillor DiGenova. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I was not on for the amendment. I was on for the main queue. So no? 
Okay. I um, and are there anybody else who wish to speak to the amendment? Okay. If not, then uh, Madam Clerk, if you could take us to the. Okay, I did not say the words yet. <laughs> so, Councillor DiGenova, what is your point of information? I've just sent a report over to staff, and I was wondering if I could ask a point of information through the chair to staff. It's my understanding that we've already been looking at using renewable diesel, and through many of the staff reports, that you, Chair Carr, and I would remember from last term and previous terms, um, I, I feel that Although the amendment specifically talks about the review of, of, of air care on road, the on road program, um, I'm just wondering specifically has, has staff already considered this? Is this something that, that staff may already be working on? I just hate to have redundancy okay, in that. Okay, I'll, I'll ask, Thank you. Uh, I'll make sure that staff gets that question um, or answers that question and make sure that they have received your report. Okay. And then Deputy just City Manager. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. So just looking at the report now, the report is a uh, pertains to procurement by the City of Vancouver for um, natural biodiesel for our own fleet. Yes. Um, so obviously the issues that are uh, contemplated in this motion and the truck traffic involved are oh. much broader than the city fleet. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those obviously. are two different things. Great. No, I Thank was you. trying to send another Thank report. Thank you, Mr. Mokri. Um, point of information. Yeah, your mic is still on. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, another point of information to staff is that was one report. There's another report looking at the greenest city objectives and goals. And uh, Cindy, now I, I don't want to, I feel bad putting staff on the spot, but it's my understanding that aside from this, we're also looking with partners uh, to do whatever we can to provide renewable uh, types of energy and fuel. So I just wonder, I'm happy to support Councillor Fry's amendment. No, actually, I just, this is about I'd, just a I'd question. Like to this know. Is a point of I'd like to know if this is something the city is already doing, okay, which was my you. first that's question that's that wasn't that's answered. Action. Thank you. you. Stop talking. You asked a question. Mr. Mokri? Uh, so, uh, Chair Carr, yeah, the city staff are doing a lot of work in this area um, with uh, C40 and, and in conjunction with the court and Translink and others. Uh, but we don't see this motion as inconsistent with that. Um, and the notion of reporting back to council is something that we don't have any issue with. Thank you, Mr. Mokri. Um, so I'm going to move on to um, the speaking queue, which is on the amendment. Uh, and Councillor Dijanova, uh, you are on that speaking queue? Okay, great. Councillor, so I'll clear you in advance. Councillor Dominato to the amendment. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm uh, happy to support the proposed amendments by Councillor Fry. I, I do want to comment that I think it is um, uh, incredibly important that. Uh, any signage that's uh, undertaken and put out um, that that definitely be undertaken um, through Vancouver Coastal Health um, because I was just speaking with a resident uh, in that area yet just yesterday about the demolition of the Viterra grain silos and they received some um, informal leaflets um, around uh, what's happening with Viterra and they were quite concerned. They were concerned about what's taking place and wanting to have a better understanding of uh, particulate matter and the uh, air quality, air pollution, but also were concerned that there was information being circulated to them as residents that, in their words, felt was fear-mongering. So they, they were actually hoping for more information from the city, and I'll be following up with our city manager on that. But I, I would, I, my point being, let's just ensure that it's informed by our health authorities and evidence if we are putting up signage, because it is really important, um, and uh, it's an important discussion we're having, but... Um, that is factual and informed by our public health units. Thank you, Councillor Dominato. I do, don't see anyone else on the list. I'm just going to make sure no one else to speak to the amendment. And let's go to the vote. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Weep, you haven't yet voted? All right, that is unanimous. Great. Uh, going back to the main queue, uh, to the motion as amended. Councillor Fry, do you have anything else that you... You're good? Great. Councillor Dominato. Thanks, Madam Chair. And so I had uh, a couple of points of information through you to our Deputy City Manager, and I'm wondering hmm. if I could proceed with those. Yep. Um, just seeking some, um, if um, the Deputy City Manager could speak to um, the Clark Knight Street route. Is it considered, while I recognize it's a city route and city street, is it part of, considered part of the provincial 
highway network because it does intersect with Highway 91 and Highway 99. It leads to, I'm just curious if you could comment on that. Mr. Mr. Yeah. Chair, I don't have that information right now. I can source it as quickly as possible. It is, uh, Knight Street is part of the TransLink major road network, uh, but in terms of its status as a provincially designated highway, I'm not sure. I'll have to follow up on that. Okay. Okay. Sorry, Councillor Damanetto. And um, thank you. No, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I was also curious, um, uh, Councillor Fry had mentioned the um, air quality monitoring. Um, I just, and, and I actually can actually ask this question, Councillor Fry, and if our staff could answer is around uh, air quality monitoring along that corridor, um, if we do get that information from Metro Vancouver. Mr. Mokri? Uh, yes, we are able to access this information. Metro does publish uh, publicly the results of its air monitoring um, studies as well. So th that information is publicly available and, and we can access it. And, um, and just uh, as I, I just to confirm as well, thank you for that. I had also inquired about um, public transit and uh, was able to follow up uh, with TransLink around just what kind of transit was available along that route as well. I was just curious about that. And I know we didn't have that readily available, so I was able to get that information. Um, I'll, I'll stop my questions there for now. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yes, just one second. Councillor... I go ahead with your question. Just, just in the in, in the interest of clarity, I was re uh, referencing uh, the Vancouver Port side, actually, and the Vancouver Templeton uh, air monitoring stations, which don't monitor DPMs, SOX, or NOx. Uh, the Vancouver Clark Drive, which is at 12th and Clark, does do a full monitoring suite of NOx and SOX, but those two uh, don't. And okay. Councillor Fry, a point of information is actually. A question, oh. um, and you could have put yourself back on the queue to provide that oh, information. Sure. I just didn't that's want okay. It to, just right. yeah, no problem. It, it was certainly timely, uh, but uh, that's the process. Councillor Dominato, are you are you finished? Okay, thank you, Councillor Boyle. Um, I, I wanted to just uh, echo support for this uh, motion and appreciate um, that it was come forward and the thought that's gone into the various. Mm -hmm. Uh, steps and places that council um, can be doing this important work. Uh, and I will say it, it's unclear to me in E um, what we mean by protecting future housing developments. Uh, and uh, I have a little bit of nervousness that that um, is um, implying a moratorium on future housing developments, um, uh, which, which does make me nervous. Um, so happy to hear if there's clarification around that language. Otherwise, I think actually that D articulates uh, really well that we look more broadly at um, where we are building housing. And certainly, as Council has heard me say before, I uh, think there's um, a lot of good reasons that we concentrate uh, rental and affordable housing, not not just build it on arterials, but build it throughout neighborhoods where there is less of an impact uh, from traffic, but it's still walking distance to transit. Um, and so I'd like to see, as uh, as I think D articulates exploring, how we build this type of housing um, in uh, our SNRT and not just along these arterials. So happy to support um, all of this, uh, but we'll be asking just that we sever out um, e, because I think the important parts of it are already covered, and I'm just nervous about um, starting to moratorium certain areas. Okay, I've made a note of that. Thank you, Councillor Boyle. Councillor DiGenova. Thank you, and I've just gone through um, the, some of the various staff reports, and I understand that this would actually be redundant to some of the Greenest City goals. Uh, so I'd like to ask a point of information through you, Chair Carr, to uh, staff, if we would see this as scrutinizing the policies that not only this council has passed, but policies that our staff have already started moving forward with, including um, co-locating transit, and I suppose tr um, transit, let's put transit, um, I don't want to just say multifamily residential because I know we do retail there as well. But are we looking as to how we are, are best locating uh, our housing options in the city of Vancouver already to make sure 
that uh, people are more likely to use transit? And if so, has the city affirmed that uh, major transit arterials are to be zoned for multifamily housing? Okay, I just need that question answered. Okay, that was that was a question that we made to the deputy city manager. Great, Mr. Mokri. So, um, Madam Chair, I, I want to make sure I understand the question. I, I think my interpretation uh, and staff's interpretation of the motion um, calls for an examination of policies. Doesn't predetermine the outcome of the examination. So, certainly, I think we're all clear on what the policies currently are. Um, this motion uh, raises concerns or potential implications of those policies that staff mm -hmm. are being asked to consider in future planning work. So we, we think that's appropriate. Uh, again, we don't read this motion as predetermining the outcome of that examination. So if we're interpreting that incorrectly, um, obviously we want to we want to clarify that here. Uh, thank you. Another point of information would be, uh, I know that staff has spent a great deal of time on these motions and looking at best practices in transit-oriented housing. And that does state that major arterials are a place that the city of Vancouver considers to be best for multifamily residential. That being said, in re-examining this, how much staff time would go into the exercise of re-examining this before you bring back a report to us telling us either that this I, I suppose that staff would be looking at this to whether or not the, the uh, benefits. Actually, you have asked your question, so I'll, I'll ask uh, the ma deputy city manager how much time, uh, staff time, could be estimated on this. Thanks, Chair Carr. It's very difficult to assess kind of a specific amount of staff time. The, the motion does call for this um, issue to be contemplated as part of the citywide planning process. So I, I wouldn't see that it would take any, necessarily any additional resources. It would just be incorporated into that very substantial piece of work. Um, Thank you, Mr. Mokri. Um, Councillor DiGenova? Another point of information is that I, I'm wondering, do we already share information with the Vancouver School Board to you, okay, that's, uh, through that's, you to staff? Okay, that's a great, that's on this, the answer, Mr. Okay. Mokri. I'm not familiar with any communication with the Vancouver School Board uh, with respect to traffic pollution. That's not to say that it hasn't happened. I'm just not familiar. Okay. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dominato. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a, just a point of information through you to the uh, Deputy City Manager. Um, just on uh, uh, with respect to a follow-up to Councillor DiGenova's question around the relationship with VSB, um, I'm just curious if, if you could clarify, obviously I was on school board, so I recognize the role of school board, but would it be the role of the city to be determining um, the impact of ever-increasing traffic pollution on those three schools? Is that uh, a responsibility that would be under the city's jurisdiction, or would that be more the VSB's jurisdiction to be looking at that with Port of Vancouver and others? I'm just curious if you could speak to jurisdiction. The chair, uh, certainly um, staff are in a position to inform the Vancouver School Board of uh, information that comes out of work on this motion, um, but I would agree that um, the impacts, if there's decisions that the Vancouver School Board needs to make around its operations, those would generally be, of course, within their jurisdiction. Whether those have um, other follow-on implications for the city, I think would be, uh, it's a hypothetical at this point in time. So, um, again, um, it's, it's hard to prejudge what that work might be uh, until we, of course, have the information in question. Okay. And then one more question, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. um, just through you, uh, again, to the Deputy City Manager, is um, I understand that the Port of Vancouver is, has a, a number of initiatives underway around uh, clean trucking, and I'm just curious um, if, uh, through our relationship with the Port of Vancouver, that they are keeping us informed of that work to inform our citywide plan and other uh, housing planning, because obviously housing is top of mind for residents in the city. And so um, the work that the port is undertaking and working with uh, trucks and um, carriers, uh, are we being informed of that? To... Uh, through the chair, yes, uh, we do. We meet with the port on an ongoing basis. They do share uh, updates on their programs uh, with respect to their trucking and with, with in, in relation to sustainability generally. So that's part of our ongoing engagement with them. Um, the, and if I, if I may, uh, Chair Carr, just to answer a question that was posed previously, 
Um, Knight Street is not uh, a route that's designated by the province. So it is part of the MRN network, but it's not a provincially designated route. Great. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Mokri. That's good. Councillor Swanson. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, close on my motion, I guess. Thank you so much to all the speakers. Um, since putting this motion forward, I've learned quite a bit about the port that I didn't know and about pollution. So I want to thank everybody that's been informing me. Uh, one of the things is that by 2020, Metro is saying the port won't meet new pollution standards if there's no increase in traffic. But with the port expanding, we're going to see about 75 more trucks per hour going through our neighborhoods for 17 hours a day. I also learned a new word, <laughs> exceedances, as in this Metro quote. Metro Vancouver air quality experts note that the revised air quality assessment showed potential exceedances for both annual and one hour nitrogen oxide, dioxide, as well as for 24 hour fine particulate matter. So um, I'm hoping that we can all agree on this. It's basically just to investigate the actions that are being taken now by everybody, Metro, the port, the BC government, um, to find out exactly what progress is being made to beef up standards for pollutants like nitrogen dioxide, what exactly is being done to develop a fuel option that will reduce emissions, what incentives are being offered to get old trucks off the road, and once we've figure that stuff out, what can we do to coordinate the various bodies and get it implemented fast? And can we get support from other cities across BC and across the country to strengthen regulations that restrict traffic pollution, particularly particulates emitted by heavy trucks? Um, and we need to look at our business, our zoning and building codes and planning pro policies to ensure that the same standards of health are happening all across the cities. Um, I want to uh, really thank all the people that have been helping me on this, especially Ann Roberts, Trevor Smith, the McBride School PAC, which supported this motion, Vancouver Coastal Health, which supported it, and Marilyn Hogan, who got 426 signatures on the petition. Um, we uh, are the council that's representing the citizens of Vancouver who are the ones that are getting asthma and getting cancer because of this pollution. And the port isn't really accountable to our citizens, but we are, so I think it's our responsibility. And I hope we can pass this motion unanimously and go on and do some of this stuff and reduce that pollution. Um, for section E, uh, my intention wasn't to stop the development, but to think of methods to protect future developments, like do they need a different type of ventilation system? Do they need thicker windows? Do they need hedges planted along the, the road? That kind of thing. It wasn't to stop them. OK, thank you, everybody. Um, right, OK, although that was closing comments, Councillor Dominato, I, I We'll advance you. And thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've just uh, circulated a small, what I think is a small amendment to G. And it is just to, um, I know you don't have it, it is, uh, addresses the question of just whose role, um, just jurisdiction, just to clarify uh, that. Um, as our staff noted, that they can certainly inform the VSB of any actions taken today. And, and I've just proposed that we strike after and, and to replace that with to inform their planning for schools in the area uh, so that we're not tripping over ourselves in terms of um, who does what. <clears throat> um, just clarifying the and, the one, is that the and that comes in? Striking the, the and after actions. So everything, okay. so that council directs staff to inform the Vancouver School Board of these actions to inform their planning for schools in the area. Okay, I have, I'll have. i move us to an amendment queue. Um, and Councillor Dominato, you're on the amendment queue. 
I think you've just spoken to that, but anyone else to speak to it? Okay, Madam Clerk, if we could move to the vote on that amendment. Um, Councillor Swanson, Zweeb, Dominado, no, Weeb and Swanson not yet voted. Councillor Weeb. Okay, that motion passes uh, with nine in favor and one in opposition. Um, Councillor Swanson in opposition. Okay, um, Councillor Dominado, do you have anything else? I'm sorry, I, I did take you off that list, but you were on it. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, not at this time. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Um, and I will advance. Now we have more on the list. Okay, Councillor Di Genova. Thank you very much, Chair Carr. Just briefly, I appreciate that we sever the different points. Um, I think we should vote individually on them. Uh, I also have concern that right now we're looking at particular priorities for our housing and that this could uh, then in fact ask staff to examine whether or not we should be changing uh, multifamily housing and the way that we plan for housing in the city. And I don't just see this pertaining to the citywide plan. So I do have some concerns about that and I'm happy that uh, Councillor Boyle actually brought it up before I needed to because I was going to raise that as a point of information uh, regarding how this would impact housing. Uh, so for those reasons, there are certain, certain parts of this motion that uh, I will support enthusiastically, such as the school board and making sure that there's good communication and making sure that we have uh, good communication oh, with our Metro directors, making sure that information is brought back to Vancouver City Council. Um, but in trying not to replicate work that staff is already doing and that has been done, uh, in some cases, I'm going to find it hard to vote for uh, certain parts of this motion. That being said, I won't go through each individual reason at this time uh, because I know we're limited in time and I see that we have a very long agenda, but I would ask that we sever individually. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Councillor Kirby Young. I was just gonna ask to move to sever as well, so that's fine, thank you. Okay, Councillor Hardwick. I have a question. Can I still ask a question Absolutely. Um, so through you, you Ms. Chair, manager. to the Deputy City Manager? And it's with respect to question D, or uh, sorry, point D. It states uh, that we would use the same standards of health that are equally applied to all residents. Um, it seems to me that we may need more, you know, higher standards around areas of pollution rather than the same as. So, um, Maybe I'm nitpicking a little bit over semantics here. Um, I think the intent was that people be, uh, you know, this be uh, treated equally, but you may actually need higher standards rather than equal standards. I, I see Ms. Roberts nodding her head here. Okay, so the question is around the standards. Yeah, no. do, do we need to, to single those out and, and phrase that differently to, um, to anticipate you know, so differentiated standards or whether this would satisfy staff in its interpretation. Right. Thank you. Mr. Mokri? Um, thanks, uh, Chair Carr. Uh, my interpretation, I, I take the question, uh, my interpretation of, of the motion as worded is it's referencing the outcomes that we're looking for in terms of the residents so that regardless of where you live, um, ideally your, your health and safety outcomes are the same. Um, you're right, that, that may, um, I'm not sure whether that necessitates different standards or not, so I, I, I wouldn't be able to suggest alternate wording here. I, I think we're, staff, we're clear on what the intent of the motion is in terms of um, the, the overall objective. Um, so, I, you know, it's not something that at this point in time, staff would be recommending uh, an amendment. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Councillor Hardwick. Councillor Dominato. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll take this off for a You have a, a, you have a minute, 10. Okay, I'll come back on. Thanks. No, no, no. Oh, you don't want to come on yet? Yes, I'm going to wait. Thanks. Okay, Councillor Swanson. Um, I know you've, you've tried to close 
more than once. <laughs> I uh, just wanted to say in relation to E and the same standards, like I'm thinking uh, of the, uh, the standards for, say, uh, nitrogen oxide and fine particulates, that they shouldn't be, we shouldn't be allowing a higher standard on Clark Drive than we allow on uh, Dunbar or, or uh, St. Catharines or some small residential street. That's what I was meaning by this clause here. I think it's fairly clear. Okay. Um, Councillor Dominato, I'm not seeing anyone else on the queue. Um, are you ready to go back on the queue? Okay. Good. Um, then, um, Madam Clerk, I think you can take us to the vote now, but um, it, there has been a call for sever, so we will vote separately on, I think, everything from A to G is what I've been informed by Council is their wish. So, Councillors, you are voting on A to begin with. Councillor DiGenova, Councillor Hardwick. Okay, that is unanimous. And now you are voting on B. Councillor Bly? <clears throat> no, it's okay, Councillor DiGenova. Councillors Di Genova and Bly, okay. Okay, that vote is uh, passed with seven in favor and three in opposition. Councillors Di Genova, Dominato, and Bly in opposition. And now um, we will go to C. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young. Okay, that um, vote also passes with eight in favor and two in opposition. Councillors Di Genova and Bly in opposition. And now we will go to D. And yep, that vote is also in, uh, passes uh, eight to two um, in opposition, Councillor Di Genova and Bly. And now we are doing E. And um, let's see, amended. And uh, that. Fails. Um, oh, yikes. That fails, sorry, with um, uh, uh, seven, sorry, three in favor, seven in opposition. Uh, Councillor, Councillor Zijanova, Hardwick, We, Boyle, Dominato, Bly, and Kirby Young in, um, in opposition. And now we are voting on F. Councillor Di Genova. Okay, that is uh, that's passed. Nine votes in favor, one in opposition. Councillor Di uh, Melissa, uh, sorry, Di Genova in opposition. And now we are on G.
Yes? Oh. Ah, oh, thank you. Um, there, there was wording that was added to that of their actions to inform their planning for schools in the area is the language that needs to be added. So, Council, uh, what you see on the screen has additional language. We'll wait until that language is on screen. Um, Council, I just want to inform you that while the vote is in progress, no one should be speaking. Um, we're just waiting for the language to be on the screen. Councillor Dominato, I'm just checking to make sure that that's your amendment on the screen. Okay, Council, we are now ready to proceed with the vote on, on this. Okay, and uh, it's unanimous. Great. Thank you, Council. Um, thank you, Speakers. Uh, we have completed that item on the agenda. Um, no, we are baking, at, as I said, at 5.30. We are now on item number seven uh, on your agendas, and that is um, members' motion Punjabi Market at 50, celebrating the past and planning for the future. Um, Councillor Fry uh, actually moved and introduced the motion at regular council. However, um, we did not have the time for councillors to ask questions of Councillor Fry. Um, so each councillor would have up to one minute each to ask questions of Councillor Fry. So I'm going to clear this queue. Just a second. I'm just clearing this queue. Just one second. I'm just clearing a queue. Uh, councillor Di Genova, you have a point of. Just a point of, of parliamentary procedure. Yes. Uh, I was wondering, I mean, it is Councillor Fry's motion, but could Council uh, move to hear from speakers first if speakers have been waiting for a while and then ask questions? Might help to inform the questions we have to ask. But again, I would leave that up to Councillor Fry because it's his motion. Um, it's, a new, it's a new part of our procedure. I'll check with the clerk. Right. Okay, so, um, so the clerk um, recommends that we stick to the procedure, which is in a trial form. So, um, of course, at any time, someone can move a motion and we can vote on it. But um, if we just stick to the procedure, it's not going to take very long if it's only one minute each. And then a point of information. 
Uh, yes, go ahead, Councillor DiGenova. I understood when we um, concluded on this item last, I had moved forward an amendment um, to include the Kulsa Dewan Society, and I understood that that's where we would be picking up again, in, exactly in here, and I was considering withdrawing that, but knowing that Councillor Fry had other things he was going to bring forward as well, which I'd be happy to support, I'd like to leave that in. But I also understood just under parliamentary procedure that we would pick up where we left off. Yeah, I'll just check with the clerk. Thank I do you. remember that. Okay, so um, Councillor DiGenova, no one seconded that um, that amendment, but also the clerk informs me that um, that uh, the procedure the um, the procedures that we are using as a trial right now would have the question the speaker introduced for two minutes, um, then the questions, then hear from speakers, then consider the motion. But th with regardless, you, your your um, uh, uh, suggestion of or your movement of an amendment wasn't seconded, so we Point ended that. Point of information. That. Oh, okay. The, the clerk has just checked the minutes of uh, of June eleventh, and you agreed to withdraw your amendment. Um, so point um, of point of parliamentary procedure. Go ahead, Councillor or Chair Carr. Um, I understand that I, we were we had to vote to withdraw that. There had to be a vote to withdraw that, and we did not vote on that. There was no vote. We stopped at the time of the vote. And I'd suggest that we watch the tape if that's an issue, but I didn't want to hold up the speakers. So I do not withdraw so, excuse that. Excuse me, the, um, the, the clerk is going to send the minutes out, but council did agree to accept your withdrawals. So um, they are going to circulate that uh, so that all of you will have that at hand. Um, meanwhile, council... Point of, point um, of, I'm so sorry. Point of parliamentary procedure. Chair Carr, uh, I know that there's a reason that we, we have these meetings uh, recorded for the public. They're also recorded so that parliamentary procedure is recorded. Um, I did not agree. So I've been told three different things. First of all, that it wasn't seconded. That was incorrect. Second of all, I was told that, in fact, I agreed to withdraw it. That was not correct. Then I was told that in the minutes it says I withdrew it. That's not correct. So I would suggest that, considering I've been given three different answers, that I don't want to have to hold this whole meeting up to look at the tape, but I am going to challenge that. I, and I don't want to challenge the chair. I want to challenge what's in the minutes because I know very clearly the speaker's list was even held and I was told that that would come in. Okay. Um, I have to rule on one thing first before I can go to your point of uh, uh, personal privilege, Councillor Fry. So um, I'm just going to clarify with the clerk in terms of the minutes of that meeting. I watched the tape. I watched the tape. i given three different answers. Okay, Councillor DiGenova, um, you're right, the, uh, your amendment was seconded by Councillor Dominato. However, then you um, moved to withdraw your um, amendment, and that was accepted by all of Council. So that and those minutes um, were also approved at a later meeting. And those have been circulated. You can check your um, email to just... I understand. Point, that was m not my point of information, Councillor Carr. I understand that that's what the minutes say, but that is not what the tape reflects, and that is not what happened. So we had to have a vote on that, and I understood the vote was, was stalled. Um, to the, I, I shouldn't say stalled, but I meant uh, because of time. 
uh, that the vote could not happen. And that is what the tape showed. And I have seen the tape. So I would hope that I don't want it to, I, I'd be happy to, as long as I could put this amendment on the queue, I suppose, afterwards to debate it. I'd be fine with that. Um, but if I can't that do that. That sounds like a good suggestion. Would that be um, why all right? Don't, why don't you, um, you've withdrawn it, but I, there's no uh, reason why you can't put it back on and we can proceed then. Is that all right? We can proceed after Councillor Fry introduces his motion. And He's I already to... introduced it. There'll be a time, first of all, our procedures would call now uh, for me to ask four questions of, counsel of councillors to Councillor Fry, okay. one minute each. Following that, there will be speakers. We'll hear from speakers. Following that, I will open um, the council to uh, uh, to a discussion and decision. And at that point, you may put your amendment back on the floor. Thank you very much. Yes, you have a point of privilege, Councillor Fry. Just a second, I'll just make sure Mike is on. Go ahead. I, I would just like to remind my fellow councillors that we have speakers who have waited not mm -hmm. one, but two evenings, yeah. many of whom are elder uh, community members. And we are going to break for lunch and ha or for dinner in half an hour, and I would hope that we could hear as many of those as possible so they're not waiting while we're on dinner break as well as uh, they have. Yes, been. thank you for raising that point of parliamentary procedure. Um, so I do not see anybody at this point on the speaking queue to ask questions of you, Councillor Fry. So given that, I think I'll move straight to speakers. Um, so we have um, the first speaker is Michael Lee. Michael Lee, I don't see him in the audience. No. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'll say three names so the next three speakers, and I'll keep letting you know which number of names we're at. So speaker one is Ajay Puri. Oh, sorry. Okay, Councillor Bly, go ahead. I felt it was important just to mention that um, Michael Lee did uh, sign up to speak because of the date change, wasn't able to make it and speaks and has sent a letter in support of this motion. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bly. Oh, that wasn't a question, but... A oh, point of order. Yeah, thank you. Um, great. So our first speaker will be Ajay Puri. Number two is Stephen Ram, and number three is Navi Rai. So, Mr. Puri, welcome. You have, um, th we're in committee, three minutes <laughs> to, to speak. Go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Chair of the City Hall and City Council. So um, it's been an honor to be here. First time speaking publicly, so... Forgive me if I've done anything wrong as well. But um, dear respected chair, mayor, and councillors, namaste, satsirakal, and assalamu alaikum. My name is Ajay Puri, and I run a digital media and engagement firm here in Vancouver. I also do community work, and I'm proud to say I'm a, a resident for 20 years plus in this city. Today I'm presenting to you as one of the stewards looking to nurture and regenerate one of our city's cultural and economic assets, Vancouver's Punjabi market. I'm speaking in favor of Councillor Pete Fry's motion. Councillors, we put together a call out to see if people would like to support this motion and can you believe it? We received over 25 speakers and over 50 letters of support. As Rebecca Bly said, we've received letters from the MLA as well as the MP, business, indigenous, nonprofit leaders, women, men, non-binary folks, elders, youth, and members of the Latino, Chinese, Jewish, and queer communities of Vancouver. At its peak, the market had over 300 shops and was a thriving, bustling neighborhood full of economic and community activity. Tourists came from across the world to experience the largest South Asian market in North America, some say the world. I have fond memories of Punjabi market myself, meeting friends, going to my parents' travel agency, celebrating Diwali and Vesaki, getting sweets, groceries, and jewelry and clothing. However, the market and Sunset community has rapidly been changing over the last 15 years. Businesses have left or simply closed, their door, simply closed their doors, leaving the area feeling run down. Why is this change happening? Many have claimed that the changes come from um, businesses heading to Surrey, where they, there is a larger market. But those that have lived here and worked here for the last 30 years believe that the city overlooked this area and made it less attractive to stay in. If this displacement and gentrific gentrification continues, we will lose such an important landmark in our city. But what if the city does come on board? We're at a pivotal moment in our history where we can make a difference and create a legacy for the whole world to see. Can we foster a new beginning, a regeneration? Imagine what we could do with your help. Councilor Fry's motion propels us forward. 
In addition to supporting the market's 50th anniversary, the motion also empowers city staff to continue to work on developing the area management plan for the Punjabi market. This plan was to be completed in 2018 September, but is currently on hold. My hope for the market, Punjabi market, isn't just a museum filled with artifacts from the past, but is an area that is thriving, bustling, and inclusive for all to enjoy, no matter a person's background. My hope is that we all work, live, and continue building strong and meaningful relations with our indigenous brothers and sisters. My hope is that the city, my hope for the city is that our diverse communities live in harmony, feel a sense of belonging, and feel proud to call Vancouver home. I would love to hear your hopes as well. If you have any questions or comments, uh, I or the other speakers welcome them. We are here in service to you and the future generations to come. Thank you to the elders, counselors, city staff, and my team members, and of course the indigenous communities for your strength, wisdom, and support. Thank you, and you do have speakers, so, uh, I'm sorry, you do have questions, so if you want to just remain there, that would be great. Councillor Kirby Young. Thank you, hi Mr. Peary, thanks for being here. Um, hi, Sarah. Hi, I've got a few questions, so I'm gonna move through them quickly. Um, the first one is, can you tell us about your involvement in the past process um, with the city? Because I know that this, and I think the language is the, Sunset Community Vision um, was undertaken previously and dates back to 2016. So what was your personal involvement in that? Sure. So in 2017, Local BC and my agency conducted a retail analysis of Punjabi Market on behalf of the City of Vancouver. From consultations, we did over 200 st community stakeholders. Oh, sorry, just to jump in there. So the, the name of the firm, that was your firm that was involved in doing that work? Sorry? That was your firm that you're referencing that was involved in doing that work? I just want to be clear. Is that what you're saying? Um, there was actually four partners. Four, Local okay. BC, MODIS, and another one, uh, 360 DIG, and um, mine, which is Masala Consulting. Okay. So we actually worked on the retail analysis study, but not the Sunset uh, Community Plan. Okay, thank you. And um, we did about 100 consultations with stakeholders in the community, business leaders and, and residents as well, and people who've shopped or left the market as well. And Great. from that, the city staff did an uh, area management plan based okay. on the findings. Thank you, that's helpful context. I'm gonna keep moving just because I have a oh, okay. time. Sure. Um, so my second question really relates to, um, I think as you referenced, and because you were very involved obviously as a consultant, that this sort of came up, and I know the community's been advocating for this for years. I know that there was a lot of work done previously in 2016, 17, um, and the motion really speaks to work that was underway. Is it your feeling that really this is shining a spotlight, that there was, wasn't was a momentum or an, a pace to the work that it felt like it was taking too long or because the motion isn't actually calling for something specifically new I think but more to shine a spotlight and reprioritize would you say that was a fair characterization or no um from my perspective yeah I think there's a little bit of a recommitment of the current process that was there but is on hold but also that there's timed well because there's a 50th year anniversary coming next May so why not take a double win and actually continue the work, but also look at its 50 years of the past and honor that and then help with the citywide plan that you guys are all undertaking uh, a process to do more consultations on what this neighborhood could look like with the support of the city. Okay, that's an excellent segue to my next question, um, which was, you know, on, for that 50th anniversary, and because you're intimately familiar with the community, uh, the motion also calls, calls to identify some quick wins. Have you had any discussion with the community about what those quick wins might look like or what they might be? I'm just interested to hear if that's been part of the conversation. Yeah, and luckily we have a lot of the elders here and they've been doing a lot of quick wins since the 70s from the community standpoint. But now in the last two, three years, we've been just trying to engage community members, people who've left, the business owners, and anyone who wants to set up their shops. And there's so many ideas. There's so many. I can't Can you give me, in the 20 seconds I have left, just an, an example or an idea? I think it would help to make this more concrete. Murals. There's Murals, a lot of mural okay. potential. There's an idea, um, the city staff could help us do the Viva Vancouver shutdown on 50th Avenue. So we could do the 50th on 50th, um, which is what Langara as a partner has also informed us that they did 49 on 49th, There's just this year. Uh, there are huge potentials of maybe making an iconic building, a mixed use building to actually showcase the South Asian history, but also make an activate, activated incubator like 312 Main or something different to help support uh, local entrepreneurs entrepreneurs, artists, um, and women's center. Um, there's a lot of really good ideas coming forward. We also want to work with the Musqueam community as well, and they've been really supportive of us moving forward in a relation with them. Great. Thank you very much. You. Appreciate it. Thank you. You do have more questions, so um, just stay there. Councillor Swanson. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks, Jean. You um, talked about displacement and gentrification. I wonder yeah. if you could put some details in that. Oh, yeah. I'd love to. 
Um, oh my gosh. Okay. So, <laughs> so I can say this. There's, as you know, housing affordability is a big thing. Many people are feeling that crunch. Not only that, over the last 10 to 20 years, you've seen a huge amount of uh, increase in property taxes around commercial use. So when somebody's renting the space and doing an uncle and auntie shop, and their rent goes up, or their property tax goes up, they can't afford doing that anymore. So then they're like, what do I do? Do I stay here and pay this much rent in Vancouver? Or there's a huge community in Surrey and just set up there for half the rent. And there's a lot of discussions around that. The other things that are happening is that when the community has tried to ask for different things, so luckily the signs are the first in the world that are actually done in Punjabi. This is the only signs in the world outside of Punjab. It took them two years just to even get that little signage. Right? So you can imagine the other requests or things that they've asked for. Some people just want light switches so they can put lights for the valley. Nothing's happened. They want to get more flowers. They want to get more things in the area to beautify the area. None of those requests have been sort of promised that they have been promised haven't been done by so, whom they had the, those requests were they addressed to the city yes exactly okay C city staff or city council at the time okay um then t talking about displacement mainly now you can see and some of the speakers might talk about it You've just seen, and I have no issues against multinationals, but a Tim Hortons has just come up and a Rent 100 program. Those situations where local entrepreneurs want to set up shop can't now. So now they're trying to figure out where to set up. And they just need support from city and other partners to come in and set up their um, places. So have there been rezonings in that area that are contributing to the, to the gentrification? Was the Rental 100 a rezoning or was it just... Um do you know? That I don't know. We probably okay. have to sh just double check with city staff on that one. Okay. Um, but I do know that um, a lot of the people that have lived in the area um, feel like, especially the younger generation, they would l have loved to set up something in that area, but they don't feel like there's a need or there's a way to do it. So if they could get support from something like this as a motion, mm -hmm. they see that support. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming and organizing all this. That's really great. Thank you so I'm much, Jean. support the motion. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Swanson. Councillor DiGenova. Thanks very much. Um, in looking at this motion and considering that we have Little Saigon, there's Chinatown, uh, I worked very passionately over, met over the last term in many motions. It wasn't just one try. It wasn't just two tries. It was three tries. Uh, to move forward with Little Italy. Uh, there's also been some talk uh, of sort of how this all should be funded. So I understand that some communities have more resources than others. So it, there has to be areas that this falls in the city budget, and I support that. Uh, I suppose, do you feel that it should be fair for each community? Like, for instance, if other communities have certain things supported, then the Punjabi market should have certain, certain, uh, and I, I don't want to say what it is because you had so many great ideas there. I think that we should move forward with uh, it just being open to, to the concept of uh, participation of organizations that support the Punjabi market or are close, close to the Punjabi market. So is that something you think should be considered? And on the other hand, should the Punjabi market also, um, some of these projects be contingent on the donations that other communities require in Chinatown and in other places. And thank you, Melissa. Sorry, if you could say your question again. So, sorry. There's um, a lot of parts to The it. funding, I sure I sorry, I, the right. funding, the funding side. So some, some uh, groups come to us and feel that they fund, uh, you know, they fund uh, certain parts of Chinatown, or when we think about like sidewalks, crosswalks, like Ford has funded the crosswalks that we see in Little Italy, but the city funded the crosswalks that we see on Davie Street. Mm -hmm. So do you think that it should be fair and equal kind of across, across the board for all neighborhoods and organizations? That being said, that the city provide funding for some things and then the community also has to raise funds for others. I can't answer this question, but what I can say is that there are other partners in our communities that would love to some and 
put money and support and match funding from the city if it does come forward. And it could be, like you said, on sidewalks or on bus stops. It could be the murals. It could be other ways to help support the community. But I think from the history that I mentioned from the 70s till now, and some of the speakers can probably speak to it better than me with the history that they have, there has been a neglect from the city where they have said that they would do some stuff and then they haven't. And I think that's where I think the community would love to see some support and resources and budget, uh, staffing support. It would be great to have staffing support the Punjabi market has never had a dedicated staff, right? So if they had a dedicated staff that would come to the market, meet with people, they could hear the address, so then the needs. Just quickly, do you, would you Actually, then expect or, uh, oh. Little Italy and others to have that funded staff person? I think this is a, a city for all, and I hope with this council that we have, we can actually start working on those things. And I think it would be really exciting to see the case studies of Chinatown, Little Italy, as you mentioned, Punjabi market as yeah. ways to move things forward in a different way around engagement and how we you know, do things in the city to help make our city really thriving. So yeah, good point. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And you do have more questions, Councillor Bly? Hi there. Thanks Hi. so much for coming Hi, and thank you. for speaking to us today. Um, has there ever been a conversation around creating a BIA for that area, particularly knowing that South Hill is fairly um, boundaried to Fraser? Yes, there has actually been multiple conversations on creating a business improvement association in the area. And there has been conversations on whether it should be joint with Fraser, so this is South Hill BIA, mm -hmm. or is it that we just create our own in the area? Um, according to the city documents and retail analysis, it's a three block radius. So the number of businesses in that area, if we took a levy, wouldn't account to too much funding. So I think when uh, the city staff, I believe his name is Peter, did some of the calculations and we looked at the number of commercial spaces in that three block radius, it was only like 30 to 40,000. Again, we should double check with Peter. But that levy wouldn't really help support a BIA. So. Okay. There is a potential we could create a BIA if that is a requirement or community would like that. And yeah, the that's owners. okay. So when was that considered with Peter? We we should talk to the uncles who have tried that over the years since the 70s. Oh, sure. So in the 80s and the 90s, and okay. also in 2000. And in our conversations, we've been trying it over the last two, three years. Two, three years. Just okay. Discuss if this is an option for us. There is a registered nonprofit, Punjabi Market Association. So that speaks on behalf of the Punjabi Market um, business owners, and that has been a really good tool to um, have as a platform. So we're in a process of like chatting about the Punjabi Market Association as another vehicle to help channel some of the ideas from the neighborhood and the business owners. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, that's very helpful. And then I wonder what you, based on your research and experience, what do you attribute the sort of cross-cultural support and enthusiasm for this motion to, in your opinion? You sort of started your comments. That's a deep, that's a deep question. It's, it's a lot of complex factors. I think it is uh, the commitment of Councillor Pete Fry, uh, the other councillors here, like Melissa was mentioning, Sarah, Michael. But from what you've heard in the community, you sort of mentioned a number of different groups when you opened your remarks. I wonder yeah. what you attribute. I, I mean, again, we don't have much time, but the, the concept is that there's a lot of people in the South Asian community and non-South Asian community that have had huge experiences and memories in this area. Mm. And for them, it would be very sad if this area was lost. And for them, this is a monumental moment to really see if the city can help support um, to regenerate it. And so they're here because they feel like this is a huge moment in time that we can actually do this. And like you mentioned in the beginning, the other partnerships that Melissa was talking about, which we didn't get time to, you mentioned Michael Lee as the MLA and Harjit Sajjan, who's the MP for Vancouver South, are fully committed as well. So if they get the support of if they see the support of the city, they're more likely to come in support as well. So I think that gets everyone really excited. That's perfect. That's the end of my time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bly. Um, and those are your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, yeah. everyone. Yeah. Um, Councillor, if I could just remind you that um, please try and ask your question prior to your three-minute deadline, because if you ask it at 2.56, um, really technically I should cut the speaker off from answering um, the question. I think you want to hear the answer, so please start your question and end it in time for the speaker to answer your question. Um, yeah, so uh, Stephen Ram next, followed by Navi Rai, and then Gulzar Nanda. Oh, okay. Uh, Navi Rai then? Thank you. 
Welcome. Hi, thank you. Okay. Yes, you have three minutes, and you're, it's, it's right there beside you on the, your right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sastri Akal and hello. My name is Navi Rai, and I'm in favor of the Punjabi Market at 50, celebrating the past and planning the future motion. I am in support of this motion because the Punjabi market is part of my past and future. I immigrated to South Vancouver as an infant and have been living in Vancouver ever since. As an immigrant Canadian living in the colonial settler city of Vancouver, um, it is challenging to find space that you feel culturally safe in. Um, as we have seen throughout Vancouver's history, our city has not always been kind to non-white people, including Punjabi people, although Punjabi people have played significant roles in shaping what the city looks like today. Yeah. Vancouver has not always been kind to me, but I've never closed my heart to the city because it is, because it is my home. Yet it is 2019, and we are still constantly being reminded that we don't belong here, and that is what, that's what's happening in the Punjabi market today. Growing up in the Punjabi market played a massive role in fostering belonging for my family and me. I remember being a young girl and falling in love with all the pretty clothes, dreaming of one day buying my wedding jewelry there, and hoping each day that my parents would uh, bring a home a box of samosa to take home with us. One of my favorite memories in the Punjabi market is when my mom finally let me get my nose pierced. Leading up to it, I begged her for years, and when she finally caved, she took me to the Punjabi market jewelry stores because that's where she felt comfortable, which made me feel safe. And then I think about the future, and I think about our future children and grandchildren who may not have the same cultural belonging I experience in the Punjabi market. I feel the history of the city being unkind to Punjabi people will continue to manifest and repeat. Our children will lack Punjabi connection if we do not pass the motion. With your support today, it is, a, it is an acknowledgement of our past and future existence. It says that you take multiculturalism seriously and that we're not just tokens for political platforms. When you deny folks cultural space and cultural growth, you are denying their existence. I reject the saying that, well, why don't you just go to Surrey? Because um, I hear that often. It's problematic as it is dismissive and racist. It's like saying, go back to your country, go back to India, because you're telling us to go back to a place that is known for being racially South Asian. To deny our existence is how colonial leg legacies live on, and this is what contemporary colonization looks like. Punjabi people are part of Vancouver's history and future, and with your support today, it's possible that we don't get erased from a city that is our home. My hope is that with your help, um, all of us will feel that we belong and that we can uh, thrive. Uh, thank you for your time today and your support. Hey, you, you do have uh, questions, so just stay there. Councillor Weep. Um, thank you for coming today and bringing the colours to the council chambers, much needed. Um, you talked about feeling that connection, and we've heard a few that that connection is feeling a little bit lost, and we're not seeing that same. What, what is the governance structure that you could see from this motion that would actually enable voices like yourself to be involved in creating the Punjabi market that you see in the future? I feel like there is a million ways to answer that question. Yeah. I think something that kind of comes to mind right now is that what if, you know, like the city I don't know, created like a youth council that worked in the Punjabi market or, you know, talked to people in the space or even just passing the motion itself would create some, it would create like a stepping stone for some sort of governance that would create or f create some sort of belonging in the community, I think because we don't have the motion set in place right now that there's just a lack of foundation. So I feel like this would just be like a stepping stone to kind of get there. Because it sounds like there's a society and there's talk about a BIA and I've been involved in other BIAs, but I feel like this market can be much more than that. So I'm wondering, yeah, just that kind of understanding. So I understand passing this motion, but I kind of want to see what that next step and what people are kind of seeing is what the governance could be, because I know there'd be different inputs to make it happen, but thank you for your answer. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much. Those are your questions. Um, and we now have Gulzar Ananda, and I think that might be our last speaker before we break for dinner. Thank you. Um, I would like to begin by thanking Councillor Pete Fry uh, for tabling this motion and the members of this chamber for giving us a platform to share our hopes for a part of this city I hold very dear. 
My name is Goldzar Nanda, and like many people of my heritage, I've always lived within a short distance of Maine and 49th. The reason? Because my parents immigrated there in the 80s and settled in a place whose stories traveled over 12,000 kilometers away to India, the Punjabi market. After a few years of piecemeal work, uh, saving as much as he can, my dad, Magnesh, uh, founded his jewelry business called High Class Jewelers in 85. In 88, my mom, Seema, joined him and began working in the marketplace. I was born in 89 and have almost, and almost right away my parents acquainted me with the neighborhood. If someone asks me how long have you been working in the Punjabi market, I say since my birth. You see, my mom has that tip, the stereotypical immigrant work ethic. So within a week of giving birth to me, she started bringing me to the shop. Here she would care for me as she attended to her customers. A story that my dad loved sharing with me was the story of September 89 when I was born. For the entire month, he would run across to Pablo Uncle's restaurant, Himalayas, buy sweets and celebrate my birth by sharing them with anyone and everyone who walked into the shop. Fast forward a couple of years and I began learning about my family's heritage and I learned that I'm a fifth generation jeweler and that my family has practiced the art of jewelry making since British India. As a child, I would run around the shop finding earrings, pendants, a pen, anything that would make my mom's job easier. On a typical summer day when I wasn't spending time at my parents' shop, I was walking over to the other merchant's shop to see if the kids were in. If they were, we would get a group together and go play at Sunset Park. If they weren't, I would spend time socializing with their parents, my adopted aunts and uncles. In the backdrop of the world's most beautiful city, I learned my mother tongue, I made friends, I learned the importance of community, and I learned the power of my heritage. The Punjabi market was a bridge that connected the reality of living life in a foreign place with the spirit of life back home. In the Punjabi market, many found lifelong friendships and many found family. People created an endless amount of memories and for some, ignited by the spirit of entrepreneurship, the market formed the bedrock of their livelihoods. I'm here in front of you all today because I know that there are people who love the Punjabi market, like I do. I'm also here because I know that there's another generation on the horizon. With the growing tech industry, there are many Indian tech professionals settling in downtown Vancouver. Every year, thousands of students come to Vancouver to study, and soon my generation will have children who will live here and learn here. Reflect on the state of our world right now. There's hate, there's division, and oppression runs rampant. Despite all of this, our city developed, has developed a reputation our leadership react, acts, we do what is right. We are a city of reconciliation, we'll be the greatest city in the world. My hope is that the council agrees with me when I say the time for change in the Punjabi market is now. So that those who came after us, those future Vancouverites have a chance to cross the bridge into our culture again. Thank you. Great. So you don't have any questions, but uh, thank you so much for yeah, taking the time you, to attend. And gee, we have, I'm, yes, only one minute left, so I'm afraid we're going to take the break for dinner. Um, we're breaking from 5.30 to 6.30, and we'll commence with speakers, um, starting with speaker number five right after dinner. And uh, thanks very much.
Great. Yes, I'd like to call this uh, standing committee meeting back to order. Thank you all for your patience um, in, uh, in staying here to speak. Uh, Council, just before we re, uh, restart the speakers list, I think it, it might be wise to um, inform speakers of, of the potential around our agenda tonight. Um, so uh, the, the uh, Madam City Clerk has actually done an estimate on the time and, um, and timing of the evening if we proceed in a number of directions. These are your choices. Um, Normally we, not normally, but it is in our rules to stop at 10. It takes a unanimous vote to go beyond 10. Um, so that will be one decision that we should be considering. Um, if we listen to speakers only for the rest of these items, there is the possibility of us, and if we decide to go past 10, there is the possibility of hearing all speakers today. Um, if we decide to hear the speakers on items and proceed with debate and decision making, um, the clerk has estimated that we will only get through this item and the next item. Um, that means nighttime economy and the cannabis issues would be moved to a reserve date. So um, I'm just going to ask for a show of hands at this point um, as to whether there is a um, a will, first of all, to uh, or an interest in council and hearing from all the speakers that we can tonight. Yes? No. Okay, I'm only seeing a couple of hands up. Is there a willingness to, so if we hear from speakers and, um, Councillor Hardwick, do you have a point of information? Just a second, let me put your mic on, go ahead. I have a question about the, the uh, unanimous vote. Uh, it requires quorum, right? So suppose a couple of people had to leave, but we still had quorum. Could it be the, the unanimous vote of the remaining councillors if a couple of people had to go? Just asking. I mean, logically, um, there might be people not there. The objective is to have quorum and a unanimous vote of quorum, correct? You're talking about extending the meeting beyond 10? Yes. Yes. Expen extending the meeting beyond 10 is a, um, has to be a unanimous vote of the councillors present. Um, and that has to happen before 10 o'clock. Well, <laughs> that's the... the, the, the so um, so my, I'm going to be back to my question of whether or not there's an interest in hearing from speakers and potentially referring decision and debate to another council meeting. And I only got two hands up for that. Okay, Councillor DiGenova, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Carr. Uh, I also remember that even if councillors agreed to stay and then were to leave, our staff have to stay. They don't have a choice. So I think considering we are here for public hearing also, and I'm not speaking for our staff, but I think it's a good practice to set that we try and find some some hours to be here that that don't continue to extend. That being said, it's in our bylaw. I would suggest that we hear from as many speakers as possible. Okay. Uh, that being said, again, none of the motions uh, are those that I have submitted or put forward. So I I, I, I just feel strongly on staying until only 10 p.m. Thank you. Okay, um, so I've, I've got some indication on 10. Yes, Councillor Hardwick, do you want to put yourself? There we go. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, just uh, thinking it through, I, I find it useful personally, and I, I'm just interested to see how Council feel about this generally, that after, uh, like this last one, having heard the speakers uh, on this subject and then going through debate and decision after it, I, it there was a continuity to that that carried through to the decision that I thought was quite valuable. Mm -hmm. I don't know uh, how others feel about it, but I think it's it's worthy of discussion. Okay. I, I understand the argument about wanting to, to listen to as many people as possible, but if we don't go through sort of the arc of decision-making as a result of it, our, our, you know, I just question 
Great. Uh, if it's as, as good a quality decision. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hardwick. I appreciate your um, point. And uh, Councillor Boyle. Um, just in the spirit of this discussion, I also will have to leave at um, 10 to let my babysitter go home again. Um, uh, but I would be happy to hear as many speakers as we can. I know there are speakers who have been moved to multiple days at this point, so um, to get through as many speakers and refer debate and decision works Great. Um, okay. fine okay. for me. Great, thank you. Councillor Kirby Young. Uh, thank you. I would favor um, debate and decision because I note that this community on, on this item, for example, has come back a couple of times now and I do find it breaks the continuity of the discussions when we have lengthy breaks between and very full upcoming council agendas as well and trying to mix the business. So I, I w my preference would be that we do debate and decision progressively. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm not going to ask that we make the decision now. I think it was use it's useful to hear um, the, each other's opinions on this. Um, there would have to be a motion um, to either refer an item for debate and decision at the end of hearing from speakers. So I think you've heard from each other and somebody may be prepared, one of you may be prepared to put for that motion or not. Otherwise, we will. if there is no motion to defer, we will continue to debate and decision following the speakers now. And, um, and I will need, before we reach 10 o'clock, um, a, a decision on whether we're going to um, stay longer than 10 o'clock, um, knowing that it is a unanimous decision that's required at that point, um, and that if you cannot stay but are willing to listen to the tapes, you can vote in favor and do that. Um, but those are the decisions you'll you'll come to at, at that point or closer to 10 o'clock. Knowing also if we have any anticipation of not hearing certain items because we're doing debate and decision, it's a respectful thing to think about the speakers that are waiting. Councillor Swanson. Yeah, and I just wanted to contribute to this discussion that one of the ways to make sure that the speakers can get heard faster is for councillors not to talk so much. <laughs> Thank you for that, Councillor Swanson. Uh, okay, so I think that we're at this point, um, I think you've got some idea of how each other feels and we're going to move forward with the hearing the remainder of the speakers to this item. And again, thank you speakers for your patience, uh, not only in coming back, but uh, allowing us to, to be thoughtful about how we're gonna proceed uh, this evening. So we are um, at number five on item seven, Punjabi Market, um, uh, who is Amy Robinson, and that's followed by number eight, um, Pali Bisla, and seven, uh, sorry, that was six, and then seven, Suprana Gupta. So, um, Amy Robinson. Okay, thank you. Uh, number six, um, Pali Bisla. Oh, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. You'll have three minutes, and the clock is to your right. Uh, where's the clock? It's just to the right on the podium there. Right in front of me. Right. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, no uh, I just want to start off first by saying uh, thank you to all the elected officials. Is, it, is that better? Yes, Sorry. that's good. I just want to say thank you to all the elected officials uh, for making the time to hear us out um, and to staff as well. Uh, I know a lot of work gets dumped on you guys and you guys do a great job, so thank you. Um, just because you were talking about the process, um, I've sent my feedback and I don't think this part of the project is working for the record. So I think uh, there could be more discussion on how better to run this kind of uh, forum. Getting to the motion, I support Councillor Fry's motion uh, wholeheartedly. Um, I'm not going to say too much on too many different topics because there are great speakers lined up ready to talk on those subjects or, um, and how they relate to this motion and how it relates to the community. I'll just speak from one aspect. I volunteer my time at uh, a local Sikh temple in South Vancouver, Khalsa Dewan Society. I've been serving on the board for the last eight years, and I've been fortunate enough to help organize and coordinate the annual Vancouver Fasaki Bridge, which is a civic event, and many of you have taken the time to come and visit and understand the community and understand the philosophy of the event. Uh, so I thank you for that. Um, I just want to say that that institution on its own is not by itself a reflection of our entire uh, South Asian and Punjabi community in Vancouver. Um, Punjabi market is also another safe place, another cultural hub that uh, many of our members of our congregation, but many members of our community visit and um, frequent, and that is um, important to preserve. 
We've been talking a lot about the past, but there are people here who will talk to what the future can look like. And I'll just simply sum, sum up by saying that um, it's, in my opinion, if the Vancouver Saki Parade goes through the Punjabi market currently, if that space is not protected, if it doesn't continue to survive, I don't foresee any reason why the parade would have to go through there any longer. Um, again, in my humble opinion, one institution can't survive without the other. And uh, that's why it's important for the future uh, to preserve both of those entities, institutions, community spaces. And my hope for the future, excuse me, my hope for the future is um, that my kids will one day frequent the shops that I did, that my parents did, uh, that my kids will one day buy jewelry from Gulzar's kids. So that's my hope for the future. Thank you. Great. You have got questions. So um, first, Councillor DiGenova. Thank you very much, Mr. Pizla, for coming and for staying and uh, over a couple of nights here. Uh, question that I have for you is regarding um, the amendment. I know we went back and forth, but I watched the tape just to make sure I was fresh coming back to the meeting. And uh, the Kulsa Dewan Society specifically, it's not just to pick one specific society or group in your community, but it's a group that has already rolled up their sleeves and put a great deal of time, effort, and resources into this process. Is that correct? I mean, we could talk about how it's on the city website, but as you said, you know, that we're working on the Punjabi market, but it's obviously needs to move forward in the right way. And I said I'd be happy to support this motion, but I do think that there needs to be some recognition and uh, a clear direction that there's work done with specific organizations. And I understand Councillor Fry was going to add some of those organizations, but I specifically um, have, and we will go back to the amendment on the Kulsa Dewan Society. Uh, could you give me your opinion on that? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, thank you so much. So Kalsa the One Society was the, is the oldest Sikh society um, in North America. And when it was created, it wasn't created with the intention of being a place for just one faith. Um, it was a place of community first for all people um, of different um, religious backgrounds. And so it's not religious specific even till today. That's a safe community space from where we can advocate for things um, that affect the community. And so I think Khalsa Dewan Society has played a key role and will continue to play a key role. Um, one example is it was instrumental in fighting for the right to vote. Um, so as you can see, it's not specific to one religious group. It's been a safe place for Hindus, Sikhs, Muslims, Christians alike uh, from the Punjabi community and South Asian community at large. And so, yes, there's a history there. We've uh, the society has contributed a lot and um, we'll continue to work and we continue to use it as a platform to ensure that um, our concerns, our, sorry, excuse me, our community issues are heard and our concerns are heard and we'll continue to do that. So it would be great if we got that recognition because we are here supporting this motion. We are here supporting Punjabi market. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I believe that I am I'm almost out of time, but I'm going to ask you about, do you think the funding should be like the same there should be the same and what by that by that I mean that each community like Little Italy, Little Saigon, Chinatown, Punjabi Market if you're asked to contribute for certain projects each community is the same um, and Actually, the same with grants. Of, you're out of time. Yes or no. De Genova. Oh. I'm so sorry. Simple yes. Thank you. Yes. I appreciate Thanks. your brevity. Thank you. Thank you very much. You do have other questions so. Thank you. Councillor Kirby Young. Hi, Mr. Beasley. Thanks, hey. thanks for being here, and thanks for all that you do in the community. Um, and it is a fantastic parade. Um, I have a question, and that is that if if the Punjabi um, market area is is lost and dies away, can you comment on what we would be losing in the city, in your opinion? Um, I'd like not to think about that, simply because of the fact that there's been so much um, discussion where people, sometimes even from our own community, make those um, conclusions, but only because they're discouraged from the lack of commitment that we get from our elected representatives 
and the broken promises. So I, I don't want to think in, in negative terms, um, but you can imagine if uh, whatever your ancestry may be, I'm not, you know, reflect on that and ask yourself what would happen if that were to be simply erased? Um, if you could no longer have discussions around your ancestry or your family's history or your roots, um, there would be an identity lost there, and there would be an identity crisis essentially, in my opinion, for people who can't uh, bring, uh, sorry, move forward with, um, you know, stories and uh, a sense of identity of their ancestry. So that's, I think, that's what would be lost. I don't want to delve too much into that because it hurts me just to think about it because that's why we're here today, to kind of preserve it and not to have to think about that. Okay, so it's really, um, I'm going to paraphrase and tell me if you think this reflects sure. kind of what you're, what you're saying is that it's really an opportunity to preserve culture and where we all come from. Mm -hmm. And I think funding, as Councillor DiGenova was saying, is important um, for any community to receive funding support and any kind of support that can be provided so, uh, so that it's, it's fair to everyone across the board. And uh, it's those little community hubs, and I've gone on record about this before, it's those community hubs that really make up the fabric of the city. Otherwise, you're just, uh, it, we would essentially create this kind of homogenous identity and there wouldn't be anything unique about Vancouver anymore. I, I hear you. Thank you. Um, and then one other question, just following up on Councillor DeGenova's questions about um, sort of the importance of recognizing Kelsa Dewan, but I just wanted to be clear. Um, you, you don't think that that one organization should be um, necessarily only the only one um, recognized, but there are many um, kind of contributing organizations in, um, in the community. Is that fair? And do you want to share with us what you think some of those are? Absolutely. I mean, there's lots of nonprofits. Um, I mean, Punjabi Market Association itself has been doing a lot of the work that uh, I know there's been discussion around BIAs and um, our elders can speak to that. But um, essentially, the Punjabi Market Association has been working in lieu of um, a BIA. They've been advocating for more than just the preservation of the market. Uh, they've been uh, collaborating with places like Sunset Community Center, which is another institution that's been uh, really supportive of the marketplace. Um, they've worked collaboratively with Calsa, the One Society. Thank you. I might have to stop you there just because Chair Carr will probably let me know I'm at okay. time, but I, I do appreciate that. I did hear from the community that that was perhaps an oversight of not mentioning the Market Association. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. You still do have uh, more questions, and thank you, Councillor Kirby Young, uh, for respecting the time. Councillor Hardwick. Good evening, Mr. Beasla. Good evening. I have a question for you. Uh, while I was listening, it, it, I, I wondered about something, and that was why this doesn't exist already. You know, we have Chinatown's been around for well over 100 years. Uh, Little Italy on Commercial Drive, Japantown, Greek Days on Broadway coming right up. Um, in mo all of these different cases, they do have BIAs or, or existing organizations that have pulled together to to keep these celebrations and these um, cultural presences going for decades. Why do you, and, and they're all tied to place. Why do you think that this, it, here we are in 2019 and we're having this discussion? Um, specifically for the BIAs, um, I will let the, our elders speak to that, but. No, I mean oh, about sorry. the Punjabi market. Why are we talking about, about it now? Motion. Why are we pushing for it now? Thank you. Um, I'm just, I was trying to pick a diplomatic answer, but uh, <laughs> I'll just cut straight to the point. I think we've been, unfortunately, uh, tokenized as a community. Uh, we're sought out for, uh, <clears throat> sorry, my voice is cracking because I don't want to say it like this. Um, but we're mostly sought out for political purposes, political gains, political leverage. And we're not seen as a, a people that have a history, a very rich history. And we're working to change that, and this is one of the conversations we're having. So that very, to be very brief and direct, the, that's why we've never had any assistance. So we're trying to change that because a lot of us here have different political views, but we're here together. And yeah, I mean, I would, I would debate that since I know the Italians are very um, political, uh, represented over here, and and many other groups. So. Um, 
I, I, it's, it's a valid question. I was born and raised here. I've always gone over to 49th Avenue and Fraser Street and out that way. It's part of our town. Thank you. I'm just curious, just curious why it hasn't, it's taken this long. I'm not saying that I'm against it, please. Yeah. I'm just wondering why it's taken this long. I think we've asked for help um, and we've been essentially dragged along um, and that carrot dangled in front of us from one election to another. And I'm sorry to put politics at the forefront, but um, I'm trying to give you the most direct answer that I can. Um, and we've been asked what we wanted. We've been, we've been speaking and telling and saying, but our, we've been promised things in the past. Um, some of you may remember the India Gate. And then the question is what happened? Why were we forgotten? Because there, there was a change in command and we weren't important enough to be remembered, recognized, listened to. So that's just what it, unfortunately that's what it is. That's what I feel anyways. Um, I hope that answer is good enough. If not, uh, maybe somebody else can speak to that later. Well, um, I, I appreciate your candor. And uh, maybe if there's someone else that has an answer to that, that has, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know the answer to that question Thank when you. it comes up. Thank yeah, you. Councillor Hardwick, you are out of time. But, uh, Mr. Biza, um, our clerk would like to lower the podium just a little in order to get you an, a different advantage to the mic, because you're a bit close to the mic. She just didn't want you to lean on the podium as oh, you were. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> you can lean now, but she didn't want to surprise you. Great. I think that'll be good. Thank you. You do have more questions. Councillor Bly? Thank you. And hi, Mr. Beasley. Thank you for being here. Um, I have a quick question. I think you might be the best person on this list to answer it. Um, how well served is the area in terms of transit services and any other opportunities around getting people in and out of the Punjabi market area that you see we could reflect on? Thank you. So uh, it's a very direct question. For those of you who don't know, I drive a city bus. Okay, I'm a bus driver, so <laughs> very fitting question. Um, I actually drive Main Street because I like picking up people that I know. I like taking the seniors to their uh, events <coughs> and their group gatherings that they have at Sunset Community Center. Um, I like picking them up when they're going home or further up the block to frequent another shop on Punjabi Market. Um, so it's serviced well, um, I would say, um, just as the temple is. So quite often I'll pick up seniors that have just come from the temple and they're going to Sunset and the Punjabi market area and vice versa. Um, and that's why I like driving around, that's why I like driving a bus, that's why I like driving along that corridor because it just makes me feel like I'm driving around my home and my neighborhood and I'm just driving familiar faces around and it's a great feeling. Yeah, so uh, to answer your question, it's serviced well. I think 41st could, we need to get moving on that B line, right? And push back to January. I'll leave that in your capable hands. <laughs> That's helpful. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bly and Councillor Fry. Hi, Mr. Beasley. Thanks for coming out and thanks for continuing to come out for this. I know it's been a bit of a grind to get here and everybody. Um, but I'm wondering if you could reflect a bit. I, you know, I'm, I'm aware that you come from a different political perspective than Mr. Puri does. Uh, we have elders here, we have passionate young people like Ms. Rye who spoke earlier. I'm wondering if you could reflect on um, what this movement has been doing for coalition building and where this might, where we might see if, if we can push this forward, where, where the community might coalesce and, and what we're bringing together here. Um, that's a great question, thank you. I have my own um, understanding of politics and my own uh, philosophy. At the end of the day, um, I, I can easily put the, those political differences aside because there's a greater cause here, there's a greater good. Um, and those I, difference of opinions and differences of ideas can be discussed at a later time, but whatever the cause is, is always, the, is, is always tr excuse me for using this word, but always trumps uh, whatever the political ideology and political differences are of the time. And at this point in time, for us, our community, um, this cause is the most important. So it's very easy for me to put, a, uh, put aside political differences. It's very easy to uh, put aside other conversations because this is the most immediate conversation right now. And I, I worry 
um, Councillor Sarah Kirby Young asked me what are the implications of, 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 of you know, uh, not having a marketplace anymore. And it's, I look at, I look to my kids. I have two young kids, and I look and I think to myself, what is, what are they going to identify with growing up, um, beyond just a place of religious worship, because that's that in itself is very fo focused and narrow. So uh, I know I got a little sidetracked, but it's it's um, visions of the future like that. It's understanding of the future like that that helps us bind together and say, no, there's a greater good here. There's a greater cause because it's bigger than just us. It's bigger than a political I ideology. And I see us moving forward and taking on other causes. Right? This is not the only one. Okay, good. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I those are your questions. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Um, so next on the list, we have Suparna Gupta, followed by Abhishek Gupta and Dalajit Sidhu. So, Suparna, yes. The public ask a point of information. Oh. I just wanted to see if you could submit something, like our, our, our public, like related to what uh, one of the questions. Oh, you want to submit something to the clerk to pass it around to us? Yeah. Sure. Uh, you were a speaker, so thank you. Uh, you could have done it at the time, but it's fine. I wasn't sure. sure. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. This is on the India Gate. So okay. So you can sort of see what happened in the sure. Somebody, Colleen, I think, mentioned yeah. that. Great. Thank you. Ms. Gupta, go ahead. Thanks. You have three minutes. Uh, good evening, everyone. First of all, thank you to the members of the council and everybody who have come here to discuss such important issues of our city. I'm Suparna, I'm a Langara student. I moved here last year. When I first came to Vancouver, I started looking for South Asian market around the Vancouver, around the Langara College. I came across Punjabi market on my first day of college with my friends, which I just met. I went to the Punjabi market. I went to one Indian uh, eating place Himalaya, and I was very happy that I found something which is so similar from where I have come from. But to be honest, I was a little disheartened and disappointed. The Punjabi market was not what I've heard of and what I've, everybody has told me. It's not what I had expected and heard about the glory and legacy of the Punjabi market. For us and me and over 4,000 international students which are just in Langara, we need a place which keep us connected to our roots, culture, and traditions. To me, this motion, it's not, it's not just about preserving Punjabi market for future. It is more about celebrating the diverse personality of Canada. I hope to see Punjabi market live up to its legacy and pave way, not just for future generation, but also for the new immigrants that coming to this wonderful city. Here I have signature of above more than 70 students from Langara which support this motion and I believe the current students are the future makers of this country. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you. You don't have any questions but thank you very much and the clerk will take your petition. Oh, sorry. You do now. You're right. You do actually have some questions. Councillor Weeb, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. And you said you got 70 signatures. I'm wondering how you got people involved and discussed uh, um, this motion and how that kind of came to be. Okay, so I typed a petition to save the Punjabi market. I took it and go around the college to the cafeteria, to the library. I explained to every student what this petition is and I got the signature within two days. And what was the demographic of most of the people that uh, In Langara, there are uh, almost like 7,000 international students, apart from the domestic students. And in that 7,000 students, 4,000 are South Asian. Oh, wow. So these signatures are not only from the international students. These are from all the Langara students that are domestic, as well as it's there's uh, some, some signatures are from the faculty also. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That's great. Those are your questions. Thank you very much for coming. Um, Great. Uh, we now have um, um, Abhishek Gupta. Can I just say it? He's my brother. He just left. Pardon me? Uh, he's my brother. He had some medical uh, emergency, so he left. Oh, okay. Thank you for keep, uh, letting us uh, know about that. Thank you. Great. 
That's good. Thank you. Okay, next we have Daliji Sidhu, followed by Harinder Tour and Mark Bussey. Good evening, everybody, and uh, it's a good, good opportunity for uh, Punjabi Market Association uh, that uh, we had to uh, speak on the motion in front of the council, and uh, Punjabi Market Association uh, fully support that motion, and why we support that motion, because, especially me, uh, because I grew up in that area, 47th uh, west side of uh, Maine, and uh, I am actually a past and present of Punjabi market and is looking forward with all these youngsters to be a future of Punjabi market. And uh, I have seen all the uh, ups and downs in Punjabi market when uh, we organize the association, Punjabi market association, and then we have to come here in this chamber to get it uh, announced as the Punjabi market area. And is officially uh, uh, official Punjabi market outside India. Uh, this is the first one around the world. And this Punjabi market had uh, contributed a lot. It have served as an ambassador to all Canadians, even North Americans, what the Indian culture is, how we uh, do the uh, sweets and all the samosas. It's, it's called, you know, one time it was a place uh, which was considered as the capital of fabric. We were selling the most of the fabric as all of BC was selling, Punjabi market was selling that much. And even the milk, dairy land was looking at Punjabi market all the time that they were picking up the milk so much so uh, because all the Indian people have a habit of uh, uh, consuming the uh, dairy products and uh, which is uh, pretty good and make us healthy and uh, keep the economy going. <laughs> and Punjabi market had contributed not only the cultural way, it's also economical side of uh, the factor because uh, we have collected a lot of taxes and we uh, PST and GST uh, nowadays, uh, they call it. And uh, in return, I think uh, that we have still have a uh, regret that uh, the uh, although the three level of government accepted this as a Punjabi market, uh, but have not done uh, their part uh, to uh, to make it more visible, more accommodating, more culturally developed as a uh, feature of India. Uh, it, it needs a lot of uh, those things which uh, this uh, uh, motion will give us that opportunity to talk uh, and Punjabi Market Association and the staff of the city will work together to make the, those things happen. And uh, there are a lot of things I can uh, go on, but the time is limited. Um, I have the opportunity to work with almost six mayors of uh, this beautiful city uh, called Vancouver. It's a cosmopolitan city in Canada, and I love to uh, live in this city. And uh, uh, moreover, uh, you know, Punjabi market and Chinatown, Italian town, uh, Greek town, uh, Japanese town, and so many other areas which we can call according to their cultural contribution. If we have a hub, make uh, culturally uh, you know, available the map and the bus tours to connect all those uh, markers, it can contribute and uh, create a harmonious, uh, peaceful atmosphere in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And Vancouver can be a showcase for the whole world. That's because we have a lot to uh, contribute. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of things you, you, to say because you have, uh, you I have, have speakers. a history of Punjabi market. But right. anyway, thank you very much for giving me up. It's a, you, <laughs> you, do, you do have questions, so perhaps you can work some of your points into the answers. Councillor Di Genova. Thank you very much. I was, I was actually just uh, looking up when this first started and that article. I do remember the, the, the I, I don't want to call it the promises, but the commitments uh, because I think that there are, there was more than just promises. There was time that was spent by the community to come together with the city to look at ways to 
um, revitalize, I think is, is one of the best terms to use, the uh, Punjabi market. And in looking at that, and also Sunset Community Center, when it was rebuilt, I know that there was thought uh, there that was put into the fact that this would be um, a community and recreation hub directly in that area. I, I know I, I went to the center as a kid and was there at the opening. And I'm just wondering what what other ways can can like do you is there a specific example of support in the city of Vancouver you think would be important because we're getting these same questions um, from Chinatown business owners. So my questions to you are more about the businesses themselves and what can we do to attract them back because we can build but they might not come. So can you can you share a little bit on that? Well, I, I have a full faith in, in that because we have seen the past and the, because when uh, we uh, actually opened the stores, because I have my business there, uh, SNS Insurance Services, I do get there for a long time uh, since the Punjabi market has originated. And, uh, you know, it's a beautiful area. First of all, let me tell you, uh, Madam Melissa uh, de Genova, uh, that uh, Punjabi market history is not only within that boundary. We grew the Khalsa Divan Society, which is a mm -hmm. very great helper for the Punjabi market. Mm -hmm. They used to be on Second Avenue. They moved in 1969. Punjabi market started in 1970. YMCA started in 1970, Langara College started in 1970, and Oak Ridge started in 1970. So all those areas have ups and downs. At the same time, Punjabi market contributed and made all those uh, areas connected to each other. Uh, Akali Singh Sikh Temple used to be on 11th Avenue, and uh, in 1978, Khalsa Dwan Society took the initiative to have a Nagar Kirtan, the procession through the uh, city. So they took that route of uh, Punjabi market. Then at that time, we only have 15 stores. When Punjabi market got the blossom, it gone to almost 150 stores, as uh, uh, Councillor uh, Fry's uh, motions uh, mentioned in that one. And, uh, it, the, Madam Dijanova, you know the Punjabi market very well because you visited it so many times along with your dad. So I don't have to go in details. Uh, so all, most of the councillors have seen the vibration in Punjabi market, and we want that vibration to come back so it can be a good role model and ambassadorial hub for the rest of the Canadian society so we can have a wonderful cultural uh, sharing with the other communities. Because Punjabi market is not only for Punjabis, we have open arm welcome to all the cultures, all the societies. Anybody can come and open their store and, the, and even you can try to have a store there mm -hmm. who will welcome you. So thank you, thank that you. is a, a, your time, Councillor DiGenova. Um, so Councillor Kirbyank. Um, thank you, Mr. Sidhu, and thank you for being here. Um, I actually have done some pretty significant shopping in the Punjabi market. I actually got the silk for my bridesmaids' dresses for my wedding there. Mm -hmm. um, so I have fond memories. Um, first question I have for you is the same one I asked for Mr. Puri earlier, um, because part of the motion um, calls for engaging with the community to identify quick wins and it, that could some things that could happen to sort of show um, some tangible signs that there's a plan to renew the area um, for the 50th anniversary next year. I'm wondering if you had any ideas in your conversations with the community about what some of those quick wins might be. Well, that will take a little bit more time because that's why we see that in motion that we will work with the uh, uh, the city staff and uh, to create more uh, uh, viable uh, uh, plan. And uh, uh, if the city can uh, also... Uh, uh, make the incorporation for the new development uh, to say that they have to have some area to uh, portrait or morals on the on their walls so to to, to repeat the history of uh, Punjabi market and the Punjabi community who uh, migrated in 1905 
four, something like that, or even 1896 uh, in the first batch, uh, we have a very rich history to tell to the community uh, at large and uh, to learn. Uh, because, uh, you know, in schools, uh, if we want to create more harmony and uh, these type of markets uh, are a very crucial, vital part of the society. And, uh, and uh, we, if we start from the city of Vancouver, uh, to get the uh, the start, then we may uh, get the BC government and federal government, and uh, you know, like uh, we have a uh, privilege to have uh, three Pun three Punjabis from uh, uh, who got elected from the Punjabi market. Uh, Herb Hollywell, he was a minister of uh, a federal minister, and uh, then Ujjal Desand, who was a premier and also was a health minister in federal government. Now we have a Honorable Harjit Sajjan, the Minister of Defense. He also grew up in that area. So all those components, if we put them together, uh, there's, I, I think we have a, a full faith uh, that uh, you, you, you'd like to see this be a, to the I'm, I'm going to jump in just in the interest of time. I don't mean to interrupt you, but you'd like to see multi levels of government coming together on this. I said you would like to see multiple levels of partners and government coming together on this. Is that what I'm hearing? That's possible, but yes. the, 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 but the city uh, take the initiative. I think that will be a good start because, uh, uh, as they say, charity begins at home. And uh, if we have a, uh, you know. Okay, on that segue, because I have a minute left, so I'm going to ask another question, and that is, um, in terms of the so the the youth and the younger generation, do you see interest in opening up businesses in the area? Uh, do you see interest from the youth and the young? I don't hear it properly. Do you see interest from the youth and the younger generation in opening up business in the area? Is that something that there's an interest in, or do you think that's a challenge? Mm. That I have to talk to my group and see. Like, there's okay. a lot of things uh, can be done uh, to start, but I mean, the face lifting is uh, can be done, and the the lighting posts uh, can be uh, different, and uh, sidewalks can be changed. Uh, you know, and uh, it can be incorporated with the Sunset Corridor plan, and the, as it can be corridor plan. There, there are two plans are going in that area, which is uh, going to affect uh, our uh, market, and uh, well, I think that can work out very good. And if the city can un acknowledge uh, the, uh, the the importance of the Punjabi market and the uh, South Asian community, uh, that will go a long way. It's Great. a good start, and, uh, and uh, I hope, uh, because uh, you have attended so many uh, uh, Basaki prayers, and uh, you know the community very well. Uh, I, I do. Sarah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Sidhu. Appreciate it. Thank you. And, and those are your questions. So thank you very much for, you. Uh, for your patience in coming back and for uh, speaking to us. Uh, so we are on number 10, and now Harinder Tour, followed by Mark Bussey and Shishma Dat. Harinder Tour. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sarinda Singh Kur. I'm doing a business in the Punjabi market over 30 years. And uh, we, are, um, I'll, we are serving the you know, Indian community, community you know, last uh, 30 years. And I am, I see the, everybody doing the shopping in, in, the, in that area, Punjabi market is uh, people come from like, you know, they do some shopping in those days, 1980s, they, there were small towns like William Lake, Prince George, there was no grocery store was there. And there was, everybody come to Main Street, do the, all the shopping, and uh, you know, then they do all the shopping like a restaurant, they do the fabric, jewelries, everything they do there. And uh, I, by myself, I have three boys and uh, three granddaughters, they all grew up in South Vancouver. I myself live in the South Vancouver, and we are doing businesses. Everybody is serving, and uh, I I think I'm serving almost five generations myself. Even do the business like grocery store, and uh, we are like to, to celebrate uh, 50th anniversary in 2020 February. We'd like to see that happen. Thank you. thank you so much. I don't see any questions, but thank you so much for thank coming and speaking. <laughs> Mark Bussey. Mr. Mayor, Madam Chair, 
uh, respected counselors. Some of you know me, and I can't say anything in less than three minutes. I'm reading. Hello, my name is Mark Bussey. I am a design professional, a community activist, strategist, communications guy, and others. And I've lived in Vancouver for most of my life. I am here to speak in strong support of this motion as a longtime fan of the Punjabi market, an ally to those who live, work, and do business in that historic neighborhood. I am obviously not Indo-Canadian. I, I am not South Asian. I am not Sikh. But I have great and deep respect and admiration for those people. And I'm grateful for the 50 years we've had a, a neighborhood in our city filled with these warm people and their wonderful culture. The Punjabi market is important to my wife and I. Andrea bought the fabric for her wedding dress there. She often gets her eyebrows threaded there. She would kill me if I said this out loud, out loud or on camera, but she gets her neck done. <laughs> <clears throat> we frequently buy spices, marinated meat, and chicken from the shops. We often eat at the restaurants. We attend Diwali and Vaisakhi every year, and I am utterly addicted to chai and gulab jamun. But so what? I am certainly not the only white guy who likes Indian food or South Asian people or culture. I am convinced that ethnic neighborhoods matter. Having vibrant, colorful, even sometimes messy clusters of immigrants and their descendants and culture is important for a city, especially one as diverse as ours. I heard a phrase recently, diversity is inviting someone who looks different than you to the dance. Inclusivity is asking them to dance. We need to ask these people to dance. Um, I live in the digital world. I live in the marketing realm often, branding and strategy. So as many of you, I suppose, might, I hopped onto TripAdvisor and thought, okay, if I was a tourist and I came to the city, what would it say about the Indian market? Here are a sample of the top few, just titles of reviews. Small, not many shops. This is not a market. Used to be Punjabi, not anymore. What a letdown. This is not what I expected. What a waste of time. That's on TripAdvisor. We cannot stand by and let what was once a thriving, dynamic cultural district wither and die. So many immigrants built businesses and raised their families with pride in this important neighborhood. And my hope is that we can stabilize and reverse some of the decline we've seen in recent years. True, some of the buildings and shops in the area need to be upgraded or replaced, but it hurts to see a generic behemoth condo complex sitting on top of a Tim Hortons on the former site of All India Suites, where I have so many fond memories. I pray this is, not, this is an anomaly and not the new normal for the development in this area. Let's not let this neighborhood flounder any longer or become a target for the next wave of gentrification. Too many Indian businesses and families have already left the area. Let's give them and others a good reason to return to Vancouver in droves. I take pride in the cultural diversity of our city and feel confident that through your leadership, the city can create the conditions for Punjabi market to be reinvigorated in sustainable ways while retaining their heritage. To, to conclude, I am confident that by celebrating this milestone anniversary and cultural significance, by bringing energy, culture, and life back to this unique neighborhood, we can enhance this important venue for public gatherings and festivals, attract visitors both locally and abroad, and enjoy Punjabi market for decades to come. And with a little luck and some hard work, we can replace those reviews on TripAdvisor with glowing endorsements for a world-class Punjabi market. Thank you for your time and for your leadership. You do have some questions. Councillor Fry. Oops, Councillor Fry. I'm so sorry. You just, I think you were advanced several times. Go ahead. Mr. Bussey, yes, nice to see you again. And uh, I know your background as a creative and a, and a designer and working in architecture. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow Councillor Kirby Young's line of questioning when mm -hmm. I ask you, uh, speaking our vernacular, when we talk about quick wins and, 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 and the kind of language we talk about, uh, in design, like placemaking, mm -hmm. where do you what, what kind of quick wins and placemaking do you imagine as as somebody who visits and mm -hmm. would like to see better reviews on TripAdvisor? Well, with respect to some of my colleagues in the group, um, murals are not the answer. Um, murals are great, paint is wonderful, color is great, but um, with intentionality and 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 effort to 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 create meaning in a place means to put purpose in that place and to protect and, and celebrate the heritage that the South Asian community has. 
through those festivals and through, I mean, murals can play a part of it, right? But really, it to me, feels a lot like the housing affordability crisis. Like we talk about housing affordability all day long. Uh, there's very little point in having affordable housing if we don't have affordable business places. And so I really think getting the message out, and by the way, to answer somebody's earlier question, I have spoken with folks, friends of mine, South Asian friends in Surrey, who tell me I'd move back to Vancouver in a second. Just prove to me that I can actually do that for more than five years before my rent doubles, pr property taxes are through the roof, or somebody tears my building down. Uh, so that sort of commitment to, to say there's a sustainable place with meaning where heritage lives and breathes and this is where diversity actually is celebrated in our city, I think is so very, very important. And that is, uh, that is <laughs> that's a deep tenet of design, placemaking design. Give it meaning and purpose. Don't just put a lick of paint on it. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. I sort was of? hoping for some quick wins, but... <laughs> quick wins. Yeah. Murals. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Thanks, Bussey. Everybody. <laughs> you do have some more questions, Mr. Bussey. Oh, 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 oh. That's okay. Councillor Kirby Young, go ahead. Hi, Mr. Bussey. Nice Hello. to see you. Um, I love the Globe Jammin' as well, um, which I'm thinking about right now. Yep. Um, this might be a cheeky question. Would you be willing to help out? I know you yep. do a lot of great work with projects. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Great. Thank you. Um, one more question. Sorry. Oh Councillor DiGenova. Thank you. Bring it on. Thank you very much. What about the Vancouver Mural Festival Punjabi Market Edition. Yeah. yeah, that would be a quick win. Okay. Yeah, as long as it, but, but Melissa, uh, sorry, counselor, as long as it was respectful, inclusive, co-created, and authentic. Exactly, and I'm, then I'm then not, yes. I'm, I'm talking about ideas to move forward. Or a white so. person asking a white person about doing. Exactly, but I was just wondering your opinion because yes. I see here, and the reason that I'll be supporting this, mm the couple of amendments that I've already mentioned uh, that'll be coming forward later, but they've already come forward, is that I want to make sure that we are working with the community and people who couldn't even be out here tonight, right? So uh, it was just an idea that could be a community event and a free, fun, public way to kind of uh, maybe, well, nothing's free. I'm the chair of finance, yeah. so I remember that often here. But uh, thank you, thank you for sharing that. And I was just wondering if, if you thought that also bringing other events into the Punjabi market, because there's there's one thing to recognize the Punjabi market. There's another thing to close it off when we want to make sure that just as a community and just as Mr. Sidhu had said, um, I know about the community there because I've been welcomed in. So I, I think we want to make sure it's a welcoming place and space too. To to respond to that and to deflect back to um, Councillor Fry, you know, we are talking about a quick win, actually, because we're already talking about the fact that the 50th anniversary of this, the existence of this, uh, this place, this very special place, is, is theirs for us to own. It's not Diwali, it's not Visaki, it's not a car-free day, it's whatever we want it to be. And that could be a very important moment for a lot of kids too. Like I, I've done a lot of engagement work and when we do cultural work, we often get Indo-Canadians who show up to our events and they, they desperately want to know the story of Canada, the story of cultural origins, the indigenous stories. Well, what about our kids telling them about the indigenous, the immigrants that made this country so great? There's the neighborhood, mm -hmm. 50 years. Let's, that the quick win is make that a big fricking party. Mm. You know, like that's, that's a wonderful. no brainer. To me. Oh, I agree. I wanted to hear your opinion, though. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I spend too many hours here, not enough up there. Oh, so. I, I agree. Thanks. I do. <laughs> Let's okay. go. And that is it for your questions. You. Great. Okay, and next we have Shishma Dat, followed by Kamal Sharma and uh, Tina Parbakar. So, Shishma Dat. Shishma couldn't make it. Not here? Okay. Kamal Sharma. Kamal couldn't make it either. It was okay. hard for a lot of people to come back. I, I know. It's, I, I understand. Uh, re jigging the time is difficult. Tina Parbakar. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mayor and Councillors, for staying late to hear us. Um, I really appreciate it. 
My name is Tina Prabhakar, as you've heard, and I am the Vice Chair of the South Asian Legal Clinic of BC. We are a recent society um, in BC, and we're hoping to do big things in terms of providing low-income South Asians in our province uh, with legal aid and support as well as legal information. So uh, you also have my written submission, which I had submitted uh, last week, um, as well as the submission of Guida here, who is one of the co-chairs of our organization. Um, I'm also a, was born and brought up in Metro Vancouver, and so that also brings me uh, here tonight. Um, uh, as somebody who had moved to Victoria and has come back here again, um, as a professional, um, I wholeheartedly support this effort to revitalize and refocus attention on these blocks of Main Street uh, with the support of the so South Asian diaspora. And as you've heard, this includes new uh, students who are coming into Vancouver, as well as uh, people like me who are professionals who are looking for a city to live in, um, might be willing to relocate elsewhere and are looking for what does this city have to offer to me and you know my identity and what I want to do with my life um, including you know entertainment uh, culture and all those other aspects of, of living um, so I just want to kind of preface what we've been talking about with some of the stats in terms of our population. And so since 2006, South Asian Canadians have been the largest visible minority in Canada. And then in BC, South Asians make up 26.5% of the visible minority population. That's one in four, um, as well as 8% of the total population. So that's Fairly significant, I would say. And then further, uh, approximately 18 to 20 percent of uh, South Asian people um, in BC, Punjabi, Hindi, or Urdu is their mother tongue. And so it's still very important to be able to access services and be able to transact with others in, in a mother tongue. And that's something that I think has always been appreciated in the Punjabi market. Personally, for me, both my parents and much of my extended family, um, the Punjabi market was the source of a sense of community and belonging and was visited frequently, particularly a lot of the suburbs outside of Surrey. Vancouver is really central to us, and that's where we, we did used to go. Um, I have many fond memories of the neighborhood. Both my sister and my sister-in-law brought their wedding outfits there, the first ones they tried on. Um, and, you know, it is something that is a tradition that, will be lost um, over time due to multiple factors, including gentrification. Um, it's lost, this area has lost some of its vibrancy, and I think at some point we've all recognized that, but perhaps not done enough. And I think this momentum that Ajay and the rest of the group has created um, is really, it is picking up speed. Everybody I talk to, they're kind of like, making a shift kind of mentally and thinking, oh yeah, like what could we do? And I think if we all come together to do that, um, we might be able to, to make a dent in terms of uh, heritage preservation, social inclusion, cultural innovation, and tourism and in this you could just wrap neighborhood. It. Sure. <laughs> at, at um, I think losing this kind of vital neighborhood is a particular disservice to the next generation. So I think it's a critical time to support uh, the continuity of South Asian heritage and participation in the city's growth. And I wholeheartedly uh, thank the people who have come together to put this motion um, before you. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. And you do have questions, so you can stay at the mic there. Councillor Fry, go ahead. Thanks, Ms. Dodd. I really appreciate what you brought with the sort of intersectionality lens. I, I know that you know we've had studies through the, the Vancouver Foundation, notably, uh, who have identified social isolation as as one of the, the, the biggest issues for our city that we need to grapple with. And I'm wondering if you could just expand a little bit, because I know that there's a lot of elders there, there's a lot of folks who, who you know, this is a lot more meaningful to them than uh, we might realize. Yes, exactly, and I think also there's a piece of, I don't know, between kind of the elderly generation for whom this was a real hub in terms of being able to communicate, being able to access each other and, and kind of have a sense of community in, uh, in a situation where for a lot of them they experience racism and they can't really explain it, right? Um, so, so that was what it was for maybe people like my grandmother, both of my grandmothers. Um, 
and my grandfather, but for my parents' generation, they were really just busy in terms of making, getting food on the table. And so for them, it was just kind of more of a, a transactional, like they can get things here that they, they identify. And then for our generation, we really now have a luxury in terms of now turning our minds to how can we actually be strategic about this neighborhood, which is something that I think we actually need to engage each other on because a lot of us, uh, I think it was mentioned earlier, it's just been assumed, well, now you go to Surrey without kind of a second thought about, wait, what was this space for us? So I think in terms of um, reducing isolation, it's still something that is uh, a part of our community and other communities. I think we're not really identifying it. This could be a way to deal with that. I know for myself, I've wanted to do Bollywood dancing, for example. I looked, up, looked it up on Google. There's nothing really available here by a local kind of South Asian woman. So then I kind of passed it up, right? And so it's like, where are there these amazing opportunities to leverage our culture and, and all our talents to make something vibrant and to not have those TripAdvisor reviews? <laughs> and you know, on the other end of the spectrum, I, 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 uh, I recently visited, did an event at Langara and I was struck by how many young South Asian people I was seeing there and, and something Ms. Gupta had said earlier talking about the amount of foreign students I really didn't think about it. and that must be I think there's a form of social isolation as well coming from from abroad far from home mm -hmm. looking for those kind of familiarities and and kinship and do we do you know if there's a I know for, uh, in terms of the legal clinic that we're trying to set up, I, I know there's a group, uh, an informal group in Surrey that has actually been started around dealing with some of the social issues arising from the large influx of South Asian students who are often coming here without any sort of adult kind of, uh, you know, coming with them and, and, you know, somewhat on their own in terms of figuring things out. And so I know for us, we're going to be looking at some of the challenges they're facing, whether it's in terms of residential tenancy, um, other issues that they're coming up in terms of working conditions. So I think Although that, again, has been kind of cast as a Surrey issue, it definitely is a Vancouver issue, and we need to kind of, uh, you know, have a space. I mean, ideally, if, if we could actually be on Main Street rather than downtown Vancouver or Surrey, like, that would be optimal, because then we can reach out with our services kind of in both, you know, directions, um, and that would be great. Even, I guess, one of the other areas I thought... Um, Organizations like the South Asian Bar Association of BC, all of their events, again, are either in Surrey, Abbotsford, or downtown Vancouver. And so where could we use Main Street as, as a hub to revitalize kind of, you know, what it is that brings us together and, and remind ourselves that there, there's this community we have there? All right, that's it for your time on questions. Thank you, Councillor Fry. Councillor Hardwick. Hi there. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Um, you may have heard a question I asked earlier. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to wrap my head around it um, because, you know, I, I grew up on 49th Avenue just further west, and I know the area well. Um, uh, Broadway, Greek, Commercial Drive, Italian, we've got all of these hubs. Why do you think it, this hasn't galvanized sooner as someone that's grown up in that community? Yeah, I think... I think a part of it is that, um, you know, when I think about the people who raised me, like in my extended family, they were so focused on, again, like getting food on the plate, like literally, like that was their focus. And even in telling my parents that, you know, this is happening right now, they're kind of like, good, but they couldn't really make the connection between why this is vital, right? This, it's, it's kind of a different way of thinking about things and seeing that the value in it, kind of that long-term thinking of it. But I also think amongst people like me, it's only, it's only been a matter of like five to, I'd say about five years where we've really felt comfortable identifying as South Asian in BC and owning that and, and you know, saying what we want <laughs> as a result of that. Um, I've seen more and more of it, even the coming together of the South Asian Legal Clinic. It's a group of seven uh, very strong South Asian women who have, you know, come together to make it happen. But I also am like, why couldn't that have happened before? We've had a lot of issues in our communities that needed to be addressed. Yeah, I would just argue that you, we would hear the same thing from every, every community because every 
group that has moved in in waves over time has struggled to build a better life. Um, there was an incident that we just celebrated a few years ago, uh, the hundredth, I don't know if celebrate is the right uh, word to use, but the Kamagata Maru incident. And I, at the time I was sitting on the Mar Maritime Museum board and we had a big display there. Ma many of you may have, have gone to the Maritime Museum to see it. Um, and I'm just wondering, that was an event that I would have thought really would have brought the community together in a way that could help move things forward. And um, so I'm just interested, again, I'm just, again, I would want, don't get me wrong, I'm supportive. I'm just trying to get to why it's taken us this long. So I guess it's, a, it's an interesting question because I think every community has its own kind of process around organizing and coming together around certain initiatives. So it's also, my understanding is, is things like Hogan's Alley and Chinatown, that that also took a process or a particular pivot point at which kind of, you know, uh, groups and younger people kind of came together to finally kind of say, hey, we, 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 we're demanding something or we want something. So I don't know exactly. There, there must be many factors that go into kind of the timing of, of things, but um, at least for... Okay. Well, I just, I would just, I, maybe I'm, you can, maybe I can at, speak to you afterwards. A, 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 thank you for that. Um, and thank you. Uh, I really appreciate your insight. Great. Thank you very much. And that is it for your questions. Okay, thank thank you. you so much. Okay. Um, just uh, the next three are Jasper Carr, Harinda Gruel, and Anisha uh, Gruel. Jasper uh, Jasper Carr. Couldn't make it. All right. How about Harinda Gruel? Welcome. Mr. Welcome. Good evening, members of the council. I've not done this, something like this before ever in my life. So if I'm stammering or not understanding or being a little out of whack, please uh, forgive me. Uh, my, my speech today is divided into two parts. Uh, the first one is uh, why am I here standing today? Why am I here is uh, because Punjabi market uh, was the place which gave me the opportunity to grow as an accountant. I had been struggling for nine years trying to get a real job in, in Canada, and it was in Punjabi market through my own fellow Punjabis that I got my first paycheck with my source deduction done. And I was so proud and I was so thankful that even after, although I suffered for nine years, at least it's coming. Uh, that's probably the reason why I'm here. Um, I have very good fond memories of Punjabi market. I've worked there for about three years, and I was on third floor of the Pabla Center. And, um, I just moved this way. Oh. Did anyone hear me till now? You're all good. Yeah, you're good. Okay. So I was, I was working on the third floor of the Pabla Center, and it was a thriving business community. And we were all very, obviously, hardworking people there. And it is, um, and that what started me in my life uh, was the Punjabi market. Um, Miss, uh, Miss Councillor Blight was talking about the transportation issue in, um, in and around Punjabi market. I want to share a nice story. Uh, I used to commute from Surrey to Vancouver and the train ride was 25 minutes, and the uh, bus from Metro Town to uh, Main and 49 was 35 minutes. So I, I love taking a nap. Huh. Uh, I would try to not take a nap in the train because the bus ride was 35 minutes. And as soon as I sat in the bus, I was gone. And as soon as Main and 49 came, I was up. I never missed a stop. It was so amazing. Um, once again, um, uh, Punjabi market, uh, I was invited by Ajay and his group to say something about why I feel strongly that Punjabi market should exist. Um, I accepted the invitation, and that's the second part of my presentation. 
I accepted the invitation and I said, what am I going to talk about? Uh, why don't I go look what's happening in the Punjabi market? Mm -hmm. And I was so disappointed when I went there. Uh, looks like a ghost town uh, compared to, I had never been there for almost 10 years. It looks like a ghost town to me now. And one of the biggest um, saddening, saddening thing that I see is uh, the Tim Horton come up. Although I'm a Tim Horton fan, I go to Tim Horton every day in the morning. Uh, one of the saddening thing was to see the Tim Horton over there, uh, especially when the the city board says this is a Punjabi market. Mm -hmm. I was I was then I started inquiring about the merchants over there. What what happened to the third floor, where my accounting office was, and I was told it's been converted into a residence. And that was very disheartening. Uh, the reason being, right on the resident is a board saying this is a market. So, uh, Mr. Gruel, you are out of time. Okay. So, that's, so, that's all my yeah. disheartening reflection on what I see happening now. Yeah. Thank you. I very much appreciate your coming. Thank you very much. Um, so, next um, is An Anisha Gruel, followed by Bill Ewan and Navreet Kinda. Welcome, Ms. Gruel. Before I start, I'd just like to correct, um, last name is not Gruel, it's Garewa. Thank you. Hello, councillors, chair, mayor of the city colonially known as Vancouver. Thank you for allowing me to speak today on the unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. My name is Anisha Garewal, and like most of us in this room, I am an uninvited visitor on these lands. I am for this motion. Last week, I spoke to a store owner who has worked in the Punjabi market for over 30 years, and they said they had no hope for the revitalization because they feel the city does not care for them. This should be shocking to you, considering the city, quote, recognizes the tremendous value in Vancouver's historically and culturally significant buildings, monuments, and other sites, end quote, where the, quote, Council oversees a comprehensive heritage management program to protect, restore, and rehabilitate as many sites as possible, end quote. I would assume that a city where South Asians make up the third largest racial and ethnic group, a city where South Asian history is over 100 years old, and a city that contains an almost 50-year-old South Asian market, which was once a global epicenter for shopping outside of South Asia, would fall under what the city recognizing recognizes as having tremendous historical value. When my parents first came to BC, they settled in Vancouver, as most South Asian immigrants do. My father, who just spoke, finding employment in the Punjabi market. Finding employment here was especially important for a feeling of belonging in a land where people would mock South Asians for their accent, appearances, and culture. I am forever connected to the market because my oldest memories associated with my culture in Canada are from my experiences in the district. These memories are especially important to me as a young adult because rooting myself in my culture has given me a better perspective of the world and how to navigate it. For people like me, second, third, fourth, fifth generation South Asian Canadians means we embody what is called a hybrid cultural identity being of and participating in both Canadian and South Asian culture simultaneously. We have a lot of opportunities in Vancouver to connect with our Canadian culture, but not really any to connect with our South Asian culture. This is detrimental to our psychological health and well-being because as numerous studies show, being able to identify with both cultures, not just the Western culture as a hybrid, positively affects psychological health and well-being and increases one's social and identity capital. By using the city's colonial power to dismiss the Punjabi market's historical and present day significance, show South Asians that we have no place in the identity of Vancouver and that we do not belong. It also resembles colonial histories of pushing racialized peoples into ethnic enclaves where they can be more easily stereotyped and controlled. By revitalizing this area, South Asians would be able to connect to their history and culture, which would not only positively affect us right now, but also positively affect next generations to come. You can just move to wrapping it up. This is one of the reasons why passing this motion is so important to me. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> well timed. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I'd like to submit this to council. This is some swag we have for Punjabi market. Oh. 
Wonderful. The clerk will come and get it from you. Thank you so much. And thank you for being bang on time. Um, but no speakers there. Um, my next, uh, the next speakers on this list are Bill Ewan, followed by Navreet Kinda and Guida Hare. So Bill Ewan. Hi. Um, I'm Bill Ewan. I'm the executive director of Heritage Vancouver Society. Um, so we are here to speak in support of the motion. Um, and because Punjab market contributes to a diverse range of human experiences for the people of Vancouver. Um, I want to talk about this thing about history and heritage, uh, which usually gets criticized when, when uh, to be something about protecting nostalgia and, and making a museum piece. I think we've been working for a while now trying to talk about different forms of heritage and um, that heritage is dependent on context. And I think the context here is that Punjabi market is very much a living place. And that, um, you know, we're not really working to preserve something from the past here. It's more we're trying to create something new. And, and um, like this type of heritage, um, you really, it's not the type where you can take a picture of it. You have to experience it. And this is, I think, what people are trying to create and uh, to create experiences for people to come and enjoy time there. And so something that's related to this with emotion is the um, part about the um, statement of significance. And we're quite excited to see that in the motion. And we want to say that normally statement of significance, they're prepared by architects and uh, historians. Uh, but because of the nature of the area, I think that you really need to have large participation by people from the community to actually get to um, what is significant. And that once you identify what is significant, that there be really um, actions that transcend what is typical in order to revitalize the, the, the area and actually to uh, those items that are significant, action should be directed towards those and, and um, on, on an ongoing na nature. And I just the last thing I want to say is that I kind of agree with the uh, previous speaker about the murals. Um, the murals are actually just kind of like a garnish. Um, you really have to focus on the people, and there are a lot of people here, and and I think there's a lot of energy amongst them, and 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 they can do a lot, much more beyond murals and plaques. Thank you. Great. Oh, Mr. Ewan, you have spe you have questions. Go ahead, Councillor Hardwick. Hello, Mr. Ewan. Hello. Just want to pick up on on your line of thought a little bit, um, because. Are there architectural elements that are significant? I take your point that this is uh, about focused on people and about a cr creating a new, uh, uh, something new going forward, but are there architectural elements that, uh, you know, that are touchstones? People do identify with place as well. Oh, definitely. I, I think that, that there are architectural elements. I, I've not seen any work done on the architecture for the area, and I would like to see that. Um, I think that should definitely be a part of it. I'm, I'm not saying that architecture shouldn't be a part of it. Um, but I'm also, I'm also saying that architecture, it doesn't need to be grand picturesque architecture. There, there, there's places, places there that, you know, they're, they're, they're older and, and they allow for um, uh, businesses to be there because they're just more affordable. I think that has a place. Uh, within Punjabi Market or any other of our neighborhoods. Um, but our heritage program focuses on, uh, you know, architectural merit, right? I don't think, I don't think it necessarily has to be meritor meritorious in the sense of how we lay it out in, in, through our uh, heritage program. Well, here's an idea then. What about a quick win that starts with cataloging um, identifiable places within the Punjab Market? Yeah, that would be a quick win, I, and I hope that they would get to do it and or be a, be a large part of it. That would be an even bigger, quicker win, and 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 to communicate that out. That I, I think that's a really great idea. 
Well, your, your comment was lar it requires large participation by the community to determine what is significant. So maybe get the community to determine what is significant in terms of landmarks or, or architectural form and, and uh, articulate that as a deliverable. Yes, I would agree with that. Really. Thanks, Councillor Hardwick. Uh, Councillor Swanson. Yeah, Hello. thanks for coming. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between the human kind of heritage, not necessarily the building type, and gentrification. So our current program with the city, but the, the, the program with the city currently, a lot of heritage programs are similar, and, and they focus on a art historical way of thinking about heritage, that, that it's art and, and, and time depth is important. Um, there are additional ways because that way has been criticized. There are additional ways of thinking about heritage. And one way that we think about that is uh, cultural landscapes. So it doesn't focus on a single site. It focuses on, on an area as a whole. And it focuses on, focuses on the relationships that people have with an area. So Chinatown has been expressed as a cultural landscape. Punjabi market is a cultural landscape. Residential neighborhoods could be, co residential, uh, could be cultural landscapes. Like, we think that that's a more holistic way of thinking about heritage because we're thinking about the people at the center and how they relate to architecture, to public space, to interactions they have with each other, to the streetscape, to local businesses. So if we think about that way, then we start thinking about what are the needs that people have and displacement and gentrification. Certainly, um, if you can't have people afford to stay in a place, then that kind of takes out some of the character uh, from a neighborhood, right? If you have neighborhoods where it's being emptied out, children aren't there anymore, families aren't there anymore, children aren't going to schools, then that takes away from um, neighborhood character. And, and so I think that is a more sort of holistic way to think about uh, heritage that you know, that is one way we look at heritage. That's not the only way that we look at heritage. We still think that the art historic approach has value, but it's not because heritage is context dependent. We need to uh, apply different models to different contexts. Thank you. Great. Um, those are your questions. Thanks so much, Mr. Yuan. Okay, we're um, the last three speakers on the speakers list are Navreet Kinda, followed by Guida. Here, followed by Kieran Pabla. You got nine more minutes. They're not here. You can deliberate and discuss. <laughs> Thank you for keeping um, keeping tabs on our speakers list. I very much appreciate that. Okay, Council. Then that um, ends the speakers list, and uh, we can move to debate and decision on this issue. Um, and I see a lot of councillors on the queue. Uh, so we will start with Councillor Di Genova. Thank you very much. I would like to put forward the amendment that I was, it was mentioned that I could do that at this point. Yes. Um, but I have one addition, and I circulated this around before, and it was um, after hearing from the community and, to, and some of the key organizations, I know we could go on and on, and. I did that, I tried to choose some key organizations um, also that would be a part of the process um, when I move forward with Little Italy. So I think it's appropriate that there are some organizations. That being said, it also says the community. And I appreciate uh, what Councillor Fry has put forward and I wanna acknowledge that. Um, I wholeheartedly support uh, the motion. I would like to see this addition to be able to support it because I think it also acknowledges the work that has been done uh, to date and, and really continues that work with the Punjabi Market Association um, as well as with the Kalsa Dewan Society that we've heard from many speakers was the uh, largest, or sorry, the oldest society in the city of Vancouver uh, that has been working um, tirelessly on the Punjabi market issues. So for those reasons, uh, that is the amendment I'd like to put Great. forward. Thanks. Um, Councilor, I'm going to move us to the amendment Q1. So if you wish to speak to this amendment. Uh, Councilor Fry, I have you on the amendment. Is that it? Yes? Okay. Great. 
Just want just. Oh, wait, They're just, they're just, um, sorry, we're just, re the clerk is just repopulating the amendment queue, sorry. Um, I'm sorry, uh, actually you don't have the floor, Councillor Di Genova. Councillor Fry, what is your amendment to the amendment? Oh. I'll advance you, there you go. So it's just to... Including the amendment, which I support, is just comma including. Okay. So as not to conflate the community as exclusively Kalsadiwan and Punjabi Market Association. I think, grammatically speaking. Oh, well, um, this is a grammatical change. Yeah, okay, fine. since that it, it seems that it was a, an omission, um, probably an unintended omission, um, we'll accept that as a, a, I don't, I hesitate to use the word friendly amendment, but just a correction. Um, so uh, we're now dealing with the amendment um, as put forward by Councillor Di Genova that has the word including in it up there. Councillor Fry, do you have any other points on this? And Councillor Deachin, if I do have you on this list. I wanted to say I would thank you very much. I was trying to incorporate that last part and go back and find my amendment and ask the clerk for the most recent amendment. So I appreciate that very much. I just wasn't sure. Uh, I, I understand that we that was, that was a, a small correction in the process, but I would hope that when other council members have that in future, that they would be indulged without having to send in writing as well. Thank you. Um, so uh, that is it for speakers on the amendment to uh, on the amendment queue. No one else. I, I'm, uh, Council, I'm just making sure you're all aware we're going to move to a vote then on this amendment. Okay, Madam Clerk, we will proceed with the vote. This is on the amendment. Okay, that is unanimous. Great. I'll take us back to the main queue. So this would be the main queue. Uh, Councillor Dijanova, do you have any other comments on um, the main queue? I wanted to thank each and every one of the speakers who came out to speak to us today. Uh, all of the members of the community who sent in correspondence who couldn't be here to speak to us today. Um, and the organizations and associations including the community, or the community including um, the Kalsa Dewan Society, as well as the members of the Punjabi Market Association. I know that this has been a commitment that has been made to you. I know that this is a promise, and it's a, and it is on our website. I have found information that talks about the revitalization of the Punjabi market area, and I know that uh, this council has talked about not just uh, being a policy uh, making council, that, but at the end of four years, that's great, we've moved some motions and passed them, that we're actually able to, to make some measurable changes that people will see in the communities and that we can see when we actually get to spend time in the communities when we're not here. Um, but also, I did want to say that I did, I, as, as was mentioned before, I've spent a lot of time in the Punjabi market area. Um, I feel uh, extremely honored and privileged to be welcomed into to the community, not just on Visaki, but on other days when I choose to, to go down there and uh, be at Sunset Community Center. Um, when I do that, I usually park on Main Street and I walk through the area. Um, I have also, as I as we talk about how wonderful the market was, I've seen people close their shops. I've seen more empty and open storefronts than ever before to the point where a few years ago it was said to me, oh, you don't need to worry about trying to figure out 
who you're going to liaise with to maybe uh, have your booth in front of a store in the Punjabi market because there's so many empty market spaces that so many stores won't be open. And that was a sad day for me to hear that. And it really reminded me um, of the work that needs to be done to get there. So I, I know that this is something that the community has wanted. I appreciate Councillor Fry uh, taking leadership on this and, and um, helping to move this forward. Uh, I certainly, I think that around this council table, it's not that I've heard that any other councillor wouldn't have done that. It's that Councillor Fry uh, heard that need and, and saw that that work could perhaps uh, have measurable pieces that are brought forward sooner. So I appreciate that, and I, I hope that we'll see more vibrancy among those different cultural communities. I also want to see a benchmark that's set for all communities so they're not fighting against each other, um, that we give equal funding to Chinatown, to the Punjabi market area, to Little Italy. And by equal, I don't necessarily mean in dollar amounts, but looking at the benefit and the amount of work we have to put in or the ways that we can work with the community to leverage money or match grants. Because I think that uh, this shouldn't come down to a budget conversation. If we can move forward faster because we can secure those funds, um, I'm very proud to say that maybe this is something where even our citywide sponsorship fund uh, could come into play and help out with as well. So I look forward to hopefully seeing this motion pass tonight. I think that this motion has to primarily just be about the Punjabi market. Let's not let it get lost in other things. And I very much appreciate Councillor Fry bringing this forward to each and every one of you for coming out and for waiting for so many years and for your work. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor DiGenova. Councillor Fry. Yeah, well, I just, you know, I really want to thank everybody who came out. I, I don't think I really appreciated how significant this was until I heard everybody speaking, and I'm really humbled and proud to be part of this. And uh, I was really struck by something that uh, Ms. Graywall said as well. You know, really, uh, you know, I'm a little older than you, but I'm off white enough to know how things were different uh, in different years and how we are only now coming to a time where people of color are feeling uh, strong enough to come forward and say, hey, you know what, this does matter and this is why. And, you know, and we've done a great job as a nation and as Canada to embrace sort of diversity and, 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 and erase color lines, but I think in the process of doing that, we can't erase history and what makes us who we are and, and our identity and our, our cultural touchstones, so this is great. Um, I do want to say that uh, I am going to be amending the whereas, but we have to pass this first. And in talking to the community, uh, just reflecting a little bit more, uh, less Sikh-focused and more South Asian-focused. And I just wanted to let everybody know that, that the way this, this has to happen is we have to pass the motion, and then we have to go back and amend the whereas. But really proud of everybody. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Councillor Fry. Councillor Bly. Thank you very much. I have an amendment that uh, was sent into the clerk. I'll just wait a moment. Yeah, no, I'll go into it. Okay, everyone, I'm moving us to an amendment queue as the clerk brings that forward. Great. Okay. So um, this amendment is, I think what we've heard from speakers um, certainly tonight is this process has been going on for some time and because of that many different stakeholders have been involved um, thus far in weighing in on the future of the Punjabi market and the ways in which we can all work together to make that happen. So this uh, amendment is simply asking for uh, an acknowledgement of the different levels of government and other governance bodies that can support the advancement and opportunities of the Punjabi market, um, and certainly including the Musqueam uh, peoples, as this is the land that the Punjabi market is situated on, and as this motion picks up traction and more uh, effort is made in this way, we want to make sure that everybody is considered and has a voice at the table. Um. 
Great. I see no one else on the list. Um, it, though I would like to ask a question of clarification of you. Um, it does state right now um, that includes working with a number of people along with the nations on which we reside and work on. I'm wondering if you might have meant to include the nation's lands. Yes, that is a... Perhaps we can consider that a... An amendment. <laughs> an edit. Yes. Uh, not an amendment, really a correction. Thank you. Okay, so the nation's apostrophe lands. Lands. Thank you. Okay. Has everybody got that? Great. Um, so, Council, I see no one else on the queue to speak to this amendment. So, Madam Clerk, if you could take us to a vote on this. Oh, yep, that's unanimous. Great. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to move us back to the main queue now. Um, Councillor Bly, do you have anything else to say on the main queue to the motion as amended? Um, well, I can make my final comments, yes. Um, and I really just want to thank the speakers for um, coming and sharing your stories and also to um, Councillor Fry for bringing this motion forward. This will take a considerable amount of effort and work, and I know that the staff have been committed to working on this ongoing, and I think with the 50th anniversary coming up next year, it's a perfect time in this new council to really bubble this up to the to the surface, so to speak. Uh, I do remember just last year, um, my daughter graduating from high school, she had her makeup done in uh, at the Punjabi market, and um, you know everything that she wanted to go do was in that area. We went and looked for fabric, and so I just, I'm also reminded of all the anecdotal stories around council chambers of how people are connected to, um, and maybe even take for granted that it exists, is what I'm also hearing. So um, for those reasons, I will be supporting uh, this motion and um, appreciate the chance to do so. Great, thank you, Councillor Bly. Councillor Boyle. Um, thanks, I also uh, circulated an amendment, an addition, an amendment that is an addition a little while ago, um, and We'll speak to that. Uh, I'm also very supportive of this motion. I think it's um, both so important and so exciting. And it's been, uh, as others have said, really moving to hear speakers speak to the need for this and the vision for um, uh, where this type of work takes us as a city uh, that recognizes and acknowledges its past and uh, and celebrates um, and lives into racial equity and diversity in a new way going forward. Um, uh, it's It's been my experience in witnessing the work the city has done about uh, acknowledging historic discrimination, that there's a lot of value um, in uh, in naming and acknowledging that past and, and working toward um, cultural equity and reconciliation moving forward. So um, this uh, motion seeks to connect um, that work to the work that we do in celebrating and strengthening the Punjab market. Um, uh, and I will just name uh, that I wanted to make it, the uh, it intended to make the language not too prescriptive, that we not um, say ahead of time what that uh, work might be, um, that we have the model of the work the city did as, uh, on historic discrimination against Chinese people in Vancouver as one model, but um, that really that uh, work can and should come from the community in terms um, of what it would look like to acknowledge that history as we move forward together. Okay, Council, I'm going to move us to an amendment queue for this amendment. Uh, Councilor DiGenova, you're on that amendment queue? No? Your name? Okay. I am advancing you. Go First ahead. First of all, I have a point of information. Yes, go ahead uh, with your question. I, I see in here that it specifically asked for an apology. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that should be a separate motion. Um, and I am wondering, Councillor Carr, as has been asked in, or sorry, Chair Carr, as has been asked in the past, if this really pertains to the Punjabi market, especially that part of it, it's a concern of mine. I mean, 
be very upfront, I'm in support of a separate motion, but I feel that it's it would be almost unfair uh, to have all of this brought forward together and lumped together. I didn't see that happen with Chinatown. The formal apology was separate. And I'm asking you if this is in order. Okay. Um, great. I will. Confer. And then I'd like to speak to it if, with, after your ruling. I will confer with staff on this. Um, just one second. Okay, conferring with staff, um, we are all in, in agreement. Um, Councillor Boyle, that uh, this is not germane specifically to this particular subject matter, and it would probably be um, better if you would were to withdraw this, but bring it forward as a separate motion to council. Great, okay, thank you very much. Good, uh, Councillor DiGenova, um, not speaking to well, there's no I, amendment I'm going to, to there's to. no amendment queue. We're back to the main queue. And uh, Councillor Boy, you are in the main queue. Uh, I'll just say I'm excited uh, about this celebration. Thank you, Councillor Boyle. Councillor Weep, show the motion as amended. Yeah, I will be supportive. And I'm also really looking forward to all the hard work and the big ideas and what's going to happen from the community. Um, <laughs> I have no idea, and I look forward to seeing what you come up with and what happens if this moves forward, because it can be as big as you make it and challenge us as much as you possibly can. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Weeb. Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair, and I, I submitted a, a small amendment to the motion. So it's... Yeah. While we're just bringing it up, I'm going to move us to an amendment queue. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to put your mic on, Councillor Dominato. I, I've got uh, our Councillor Dijanoa and Fry. Are you speaking to this amendment? I did. No. Nope. No. Nope. Okay. Oh, no, I'm just clear this amendment. Okay. I'm just going to clear you. And Councillor Dominato, I'm just going to um, put you on to speak to your amendment as soon as it's. Yeah, no, thank it's you, Madam Chair. So Go ahead, Councillor Dominato. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, just in the interest of time, um, just as brief as to just that in um, in undertaking this work related to the um, market that staff apply a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens, and so reflected sort of general uh, around safety, but also our ethnocultural communities, indigenous people, women, LGBTQ community, and accessibility as well. So that's how I think it's self-explanatory, but putting that forward as a, an additional amendment to the motion. Great. Thanks, Councillor Dominato. Uh, Councillors, I don't see any of you on the queue to speak to this. So, um, Madam Clerk, if you could take us to a vote, please. Okay, that is unanimous. Thank you. And uh, back to the main queue now as amended. Councillor Dominator, do you have anything else you wish to say on this? Um, I, I can give my closing comments if that would sure. be helpful. <laughs> um, I, I do want to just uh, first off is uh, thank uh, Councillor Fry for bringing forward the motion. Um, also, thank you to all of the, the speakers who attended this evening and spoke, and I know they've been uh, waiting several weeks to come and speak in support of the motion, and so thank you for that. 
And thank you for sharing your stories, uh, sharing the rich history of the area and your experiences firsthand, uh, but also sharing uh, not only the, the history, because I think that's incredibly important, but also your vision for the future. And I think that's really what this motion is about. And uh, reflecting on um, you know, my own experience of just recently attending um, uh, Italian Days on the Drive as an Italian Canadian and the pride that was there. I recently had a meeting uh, in Japantown and reflecting on the history of uh, the Japanese community attending many events in, in Chinatown and how important um, it is to have. It's not, as, as someone noted earlier, is it's, there, there's, it's the, the, the space, but it's also, it's actually about the people and the living culture and, and um, and preserving that and also continuing to enrich the city um, because it, it adds to the vibrancy, but I also know how important that connection is back with uh, community and culture and our roots um, because I think as individuals, we're constantly um, seeking to understand our own identity and a sense of, and part of that sense of identity comes from our past, it comes from our families, it comes through language, um, and then we also try to, so I think that's a sense of our understanding our sense of self, um, but it also we try to pass that on to our, our children and our youth, and I heard that as well reflected in, in some of the dialogue this evening. And so um, uh, incredibly uh, pleased to support the motion, and uh, again, uh, thank you to everyone who came out and, and waited several weeks to come and speak in support of this work, and um, uh, thank you to Council for the comments so far. Great. Thanks, Councillor Dominato. Councillor Kirby Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I am pleased to speak in support of the motion, and uh, I'll try not to be redundant because um, I know it's been a long day for everybody. Um, but I did really appreciate the comments from the speakers, and particularly um, some of the younger speakers. And I'm thinking of Ms. Um, some of the comments from Ms. Rye. I think it was um, when she said, "Don't let us be erased on our land." Um, and when I think about the cultural um, diversity and the richness that we have in the city of Vancouver, we're so fortunate, um, but we need to ensure that that is visible um, and it is celebrated. And the way we do that is through retention and acknowledgement of our heritage, but it's also a celebration of place. Um, and that's part of placemaking and, and really honoring and respecting that. Um, it is wonderful to hear all the different stories and the reasons that people go there. Um, and I think that the cultures are most preserved when they are widely appreciated by people that are both from that culture and that people that the that particular culture has invited in. Um, and this, for me, has been an incredibly welcoming community. I have felt invited in. I've had the opportunity to attend, you know, to, to go to the Himalaya restaurant many times, to attend Vasaki, um, to go to the different celebrations, um, and I really appreciate that. And the fact that everybody that came tonight, whether they were from the South Asian community or not, had stories and a linkage to this place, I think really speaks to that. And so if we can maintain and foster that in the city of Vancouver. I think we are a better city for it. Um, and so I'm delighted that um, I'm anticipating a resounding support when we take this vote from council. Um, and I think that's really appropriate because I think the community is looking for that strong signal and that show of support. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what comes of it. Um, I think that this is a very important step. Um, I think it's a visible step in terms of showing some of those signs of the culture. Um, within the area, but I also note that we have a lot of other work to do and we've talked a bit about small business and some of the challenges that are being faced which are not unique to this particular neighborhood and not unique necessarily to this culture. Those are things that our folks are struggling with across the city. So I think hopefully some of the comments that we've heard today will help inform council as we strive to support small business and retain our neighborhoods and the neighborhood character across the city. But I do really appreciate everybody that has come and spoken tonight. And um, I think that when we actually get out of this council chamber, there might be some gulab jamun and some chai in our future, hopefully. So um, thank you everybody for being here. Thanks, Councilor Kirby Young and um, Mayor Stewart. Great. Well, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming out and being patient. Uh, the other day, I had uh, the pleasure of entertaining uh, 15 UN ambassadors here. Uh, they were interviewing me about whether Canada should be allowed to join the Security Council. Um, and the one thing they wanted to talk to me about is diversity in this city. How do we make it work? And uh, because, as you might have noticed, all around the world, uh, cities are having trouble. There's, there's clashes, there's violence, there's intolerance, there's all the things that we don't have here. And so this is an important thing. You wouldn't, I didn't know it was before they interviewed me, but this is something they're very interested in. And so I told them, you know, what we do is we celebrate here. 
And that is, uh, that's the key. And, and I think this motion really hits at the heart of celebration, to celebrate 50 years, but to do it in a way that, that moves us forward for the next 50 years. So I'd really appreciate uh, the motion coming forward from Councillor Fry and all the good input from Council here and your, your input today. So I'll be supporting this. Although I, uh, and I do um, agree with the Chair's ruling on, on Councillor Boyle's motion, I actually think that might be the next step. Is celebration is one side of it, but recognizing the past is, is also very important. And in my own academic work, I found, for example, that voting rights were very different for uh, called Hindus in our, our old charter, but of course that would be the whole South Asian community where uh, votes were not allowed here on city council until the mid-30s, uh, candidacies were not allowed, uh, they were banned by law. So I think the more we discover those stories, uh, the better, and then we can apologize and move on and find out how we can diversify places like this uh, to better reflect the community. So I just really wanted to thank everybody for coming together today and, and uh, look forward to attending and reading the proclamation and, uh, and working with you to make this a uh, huge success. So thanks very much. Thanks, Mayor Stewart. Uh, Councillor Swanson. Yeah, I just really wanted to thank all the speakers who came out. You were really eloquent. I was particularly moved by those of you who said that the Punjabi market made you feel safe and, and was a place where you felt like you belonged. I think it's really important for us white settlers to hear that. Um, I'm really glad to have a chance to support this motion um, and to get some changes there in the Punjabi market. I think we have to really realize that gentrification can flatten neighborhoods bringing in wealthy and often white people and um, different businesses and often then the racialized people who are sometimes lower income get displaced. And that's something that we really have to watch out for and plan for so that we don't bring in the changes Sorry. that that, that, that um, causes. Councillor Swanson, just a moment. Um, we have a point of order from Point, point of order or point of privilege is the TRC's fit. I wonder if we could restrain from bringing race into it, because I think suggesting that white, all white people are wealthy or otherwise, or to suggest that some members of other cultural communities are not, is doing a disservice to the conversation, and I find that unfortunate. Okay, I would agree we sh uh, that we, we should refrain Councillor Swanson from, from that, um, from the reference to race. Um, Councillor Dijanova, you have a point of order. Go ahead. No, it was just... Yeah, but Chair Carr, I was hoping that when we when we have these meetings, maybe we can discuss it at the meeting that the mayor had suggested, but I understand that it isn't a point of privilege. I think it was asked. It's 5.2 under the procedural bylaw. Yeah, yeah. Um, Councilor Gijanova, I've, I've already ruled on this. Is you, do you have another okay. point of order? I didn't know if you were really on the point of no. privilege or the point of order. No, it was a point of okay. order. Thank you. Councillor Swanson, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to continue and say that uh, heritage isn't just buildings, it's people and culture. And so I'm really glad that we're taking steps to support this community. And I think that um, staff should commandeer all the speakers <laughs> and form you into a working group to help implement this strategy because you all seem to have such great ideas. Thanks, Councillor Swanson. Councillor Fry. And that's a perfect, echoing what Councillor Swanson said. I think this is a real opportunity. Uh, you've shown some really exemplary working together and collaboration getting this far. Those of you who have been pushing for this for a long time, generations even, um, this is an opportunity to now coalesce and put those ideas and that passion to work and working with our staff. And let's, let's really knock this out of the park for the 50th. This is a great opportunity to kickstart a whole new thing. I'm very appreciative of the intent of Councillor Boyle's motion, and I look forward to seeing a more fulsome exploration of reconciliation and, and looking at what has happened in the past. And, and this is all part of moving above and beyond. I'm incredibly proud of this council today. I'm proud of the city. Great job. Now I do have, I'm not sure how this works, but I have this amendment to the whereas clause. Do we vote first? Oh, amendment? So uh, yes, Councillor Fry, um, uh, how that would work is that we need to take a vote on this motion. And if it passes, then there you could get yourself back on the queue uh, to actually um, 
uh, offer to council wording for amending the whereases, and then we would take a vote on that. Perfect. Okay. So I see no one else on the speaking queue. So Madam Clerk, could we, could you move us to a vote on the amended motion? Well, that was very quick. It's unanimous. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Great thing. Thank you all for and for your patience in coming more than once. Um, so, Councillor Fry, I uh, see you on the list. Yep, and I'm uh, uh, the clerk kindly recirculated this. This was an amendment after talking to members of the community, uh, just focusing on the larger South Asian community and less specific to the sick people, um, and just really touching on the diversity of the South Asian community and 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 looking larger at what Punjabi market uh, means to folks. And I, and I thank the members of the community who brought this to my attention. Unfortunately, it was after I'd submitted the motion, and this is the only opportunity we have to edit it thus. Okay, so um, we have we have an amendment to the whereases, uh, councillors. You are fine with it. I do not see anybody else on the queue. So, Madam Clerk, uh, could you take us to a vote, please? Councillors Weeb and Kirby Young. Dominato. That is unanimous. Great. Okay, we have completed this item, and uh, thank you all again, again for your for your patience. And um, we can move on now to the next item which is the third motion, exploring new forms of hospitality and housing tenure to support purpose-built rental, which was a referred at the regular council meeting on June 11th, and is to be moved, moved and introduced by Councillor Fry because that not, has not yet happened. Okay, just while you're pulling your thoughts together, Councillor Fry, um, Council, it's uh, 8.30. Uh, we have got three, six, six speakers uh, to this motion. Um, and uh, if, if we proceed with uh, debate and decision, uh, the chances of getting to uh, our ninth, sorry, um, it would be now our, sorry, the list is different here. The fourth motion on the list. The referred item number nine, that's right. Um, which is uh, the item, sorry, uh, comprehensive strategy for realizing the full night potential of a nighttime economy. Um, the, the chances of getting to that if we proceed with debate and decision is on this item uh, is slim. We may hear from a few speakers, but and we also do have to make a decision about whether, whether we're extending beyond 10. Um, so uh, at this point, um, I think to be fair to anybody who may be here waiting to speak to items nine, um, sorry, original nine, speakers nine and 10, um, that uh, we may choose to make a decision now. It is in your hands if anyone wants to put forward a motion about whether we extend to tonight or whether we, um, move, we would consider moving debate and decision uh, to a future meeting. I'm open to motions like that. Again, I'm, I'm looking particularly around the idea of um, giving some certainty to those who might be waiting to speak. Um, Councillor Fry, are you on the queue for that? Okay, Councillor DiGenova, are you on the queue for that? Okay, Councillor Hardwick, are you on the queue for that? 
to, not to, to not to discuss the motion, but to discuss whether or not we will proceed with um, speakers' debate and decision on this motion, um, or refer debate and decision, and whether or not we want to continue the meeting past ten. There, no, your mic is on now. Just Thanks. exploring this a little bit further. Um, I think it's reasonable to think that we could get through eight in its entirety. Um, I stretch to think of any scenario under which we would be able to hear all of these speakers tonight if we were just to go through um, and not have debate or decision on any of them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure the clerk has evaluated that and she's nodding her head that it's unlikely. Um, one suggestion might be to let the people um, on number 10 go now, just because it's just unlikely that we would get there. Uh, we could get through eight and, and make some headway through nine, um, and completing eight determine if, if we want to stay late to finish nine, but I think it's not likely that we would get to 10 in right. any circumstance. Okay. Um, do we have other people on the list to speak to that? Um, because I do have a, that suggestion on the floor. So, okay, you're on. I, I see you all on the list. So I'll move forward. Okay. Um, so, Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. And um, I know there hasn't been a decision reached about extending past ten yet at this time, or a motion put forward. But I, um, I do want to note so that we do have a number of speakers here for both you know, eight, uh, nine, and 10. And my preference is that I, th I think they've come out several times now. This I can't remember, I haven't been keeping track, but um, I know a number have withdrawn as well because of family commitments, so they couldn't be here this evening. But I, I feel that we should try to get through the speakers um, this evening as best as much as possible, because I, I can see a number of them here in the gallery, and they're sure there's probably others outside. Um, so that's my preference, is to try to, at minimum, hear all the speakers or most right. of the speakers this evening. As you're listening to each other, it would be helpful if someone were to, someone were to frame um, a motion regarding this. I'm happy to move a mo Well, maybe there's others who want to comment, so I'll, I'll let others comment first. Okay, thank you. Councillor Swanson? Yeah, I move that we hear, uh, hear and make the decision for the next item, number eight, mm -hmm. and um, that we... Try set aside a council reserve date to hear the other two items. Okay. Uh, so that's the motion. That is a motion. Uh, just, yes. Go ahead. There, that still didn't state in the motion as I heard it. If we would go beyond ten or not? No, that would be that would need a separate motion, Councillor Di Genova. You're right. I just wanted. To, I'm just asking the oh, question. Very clear that it was not in the motion, so there would have to be another motion on that. Um, so, Council, I'm going to um, I'm going to ask that those are on the who are on the list now. There's not really a we're in a question queue. I can move it to a main. I'll leave that queue as is and move us to a main queue to discuss this motion, okay? The motion is uh, that we hear speakers uh, to the next item and do debate and decision, and that we move number uh, items number nine and 10 to a future council meeting, which, or future, future committee meeting. Okay, which day? Okay, and it would be um, the 26th of June, at th starting at 3 p.m. That's when the next, and that would be a, this, the, a continuation of this standing committee. I feel like I'm going to be chairing the standing committee forever. <laughs> oh. oh, actually, okay, that's fine. So it actually will not be a continuation of this. We would uh, end this standing committee. It would be the next standing committee. Okay, um, Councillor uh, Swanson, you've given those points. Um, Councillor... Oh, okay, just one second. Um, Councillor Dominato? Um, sorry, what I heard is that, the, that these items, uh, the proposed with the motion that's on the floor, that uh, the last two motions would be moved to the standing committee on June 26th. Is that correct? That's, that is what the clerk just is, told is me. Is there a reason they wouldn't be moved to the 25th and be unfinished business as the first item of order of business on the council agenda? Because there are speakers. Oh, there are speakers. Okay. Okay. Um, that's great, Councillor Bly. 
No, we have a speaker's list and you are on it. I mean, we have a list and you are on it, Councillor Di Genova, but first we have Councillor Bly and then Hardwick and then you. Go ahead, Councillor Bly. Uh, this is a little, this is a bit tricky. I think that we, um, I'm speaking to Councillor Swanson's motion. I yes. think it's difficult. Uh, it's reasonable that we would get through number eight. Um, hear from speakers, debate and decision, and still get a chance to hear from speakers at number nine. So I'm hesitant to uh, vote in favor of that at only 8.39, when th that gives us at least an hour and 20 minutes, and there are people here. If there are people here for number nine, if there are people that are not here, we'll simply go down the list until we have, and catch those that are already here. And then we'll probably need to finish speakers at the next council meeting, whichever we decide that is, in which case we'll catch the other ones that aren't here but I think that that means that people have the, who have been here for a few hours will just will end early and they won't get to speak and that seems entirely out of sync with our process. That being said, I think people watching along have deduced from the process so far that number 10 is certainly not being held mm -hmm. or um, being heard tonight and they're not here. Okay. And so, so I wouldn't suggest that we listen to just speakers and d defer debate and decision no matter what comes of this vote. Okay, if I, if I was to capture that, Councillor Bly, um, it would be to, your, your preference would be to, to defeat the motion that's on the floor um, uh, and, and entertain a motion that would hear item. May I just eight. say to defeat the motion on the floor and continue on business as normal, how we yes. normally go and through speakers and debate and decision, because we only have one with a few speakers, and I think we'd catch the ones who are here for number nine. One. But I did also hear that um, the desire to let people, speakers know that we are not going to get to item 10. Well, I think, yes, I think that would be yes. fair. Right. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Councillor Bright. Go ahead. I have a point. A point. Councillor Dominato, go ahead. Um, Madam Chair, it's been flagged for me that there may not be a seconder for this motion, but it hasn't been seconded, and we're debating a motion that hasn't been seconded. We don't need it. Or, no, no, we in don't. committee okay. we don't need it. So I do have a point of information though. Yes, go ahead. Um, I'm just, uh, there seems to have been an uh, informal canvas of whether members, councillors can stay past beyond 10. And I feel like that needs to be clarified before determining how many items we're gonna deal with is, is if we do not have consensus to stay past 10, then that does step certainly limits our time. Yeah, um, I, can't, I totally appreciate that, Councillor Don Manato, because I did survey you. Um, but the reason that I uh, felt we should proceed with first determining whether we're going to hear debate and decision is because at least one councillor said their decision on whether they would extend beyond 10 was whether or not we would be hearing debate and, de and decision. So um, I felt that we needed to go in this order. So Councillor Hardwick. Again, I, I, you know, I figured let's get through eight in its entirety and get started on nine. It's not reasonable to think we'll get to ten, uh, and if there's enough people to make quorum to stay past ten, it's possible to uh, complete number nine in its entirety. Okay, Councillor Hardwick, that's you're the second person that has said that. Okay, Councillor Di Genova. Thank you. I would like to amend this motion to that we will hear from speakers. And we will finish debate if for we this end item by for this 10 item p.m. Because right now we're saying we'll do something that if one member of council says no at 10 p.m., the whole thing changes. And I don't think that it's it's clear to the public because it doesn't matter if we pass this motion. It, at 10 p.m., we have to have another vote. I'll wait until I have the chair's attention. Also, I wouldn't want to miss some, some new information that's so fascinating on procedure that I might miss when I'm not here to vote on it. Okay, that, so, I, I didn't understand sure. that, that amendment, mm -hmm. Councillor Di Genova. If you were amending it, I, it was, it, it, yes, I didn't so understand. I just wanted to make sure that everyone understood and it's, I suppose, I'm, I have time to talk about this. Please correct me if I'm wrong, though, Chair Carr, and I, that would be your job to, to do. Um, if we vote on this motion, people may think that we're actually going to finish this item. But actually, we're going to have a vote at 10 p.m. 
And that vote, really, in our procedural bylaw, will make the decision anyway. So it's unfair to have this happen right now, and then people think they're, they're going to stay and wait. But at 10 p.m. or at 9.58 or 9.59, or I know you like to stop like 12, 15 minutes before, I don't know what time we're going to stop, to do that vote, to have that vote again, I feel that this motion may be misleading to the public that we're going to finish this business when really that vote at the end is going to take, I, I mean, the vote at the end ends the meeting or we continue. So, so I personally think that unless, unless we have uh, the full commitment of council now, that we should just go ahead as we usually would because ironically we've spent so much time talking about what we're going to do that we could be listening to speakers. Yes, thank, thank you, Councillor DiGenova. So I will not be voting in favor okay, of that's fine. this. Okay, that's that great. Reason. Thank you. Councillor Swanson. Yeah, I'm really worried that we're spending so much time talking about this that we're not going to get to hear any of the speakers. So I'm willing to do whatever is necessary. If that means withdrawing my motion or whatever, I just think we should start hearing the speakers and make a decision at least on the first one coming up. Okay. So um, just... So I just need a show of hands if council agrees to the uh, withdrawal of that motion. Okay, so yes, anybody opposed? No. Um, so I, what I'm hearing is that we proceed with this item to uh, hear from speakers and debate and decision. Um, at the end of that, uh, we can uh, proceed with hearing from as many speakers as possible on the next item. Uh, uh, and at this, at whatever that time is, we can make the decision about whether we're going to extend beyond 10. And uh, other than that, we can inform speakers for item 10, um, yes, item 10, that we will not get to them at all tonight, um, and that we will be proceeding to hear with that on June 26, which is a standing committee, not this one, but another one, at 3 p.m. Oh, we'll determine the time later on that. It's not determined. Sorry. On that date, though, um, June 26. Um, so... Uh, so I'm going to propose that, that we proceed with that. Does that sound reasonable to anybody? We don't need a vote on screen, but can I see a show of hands whether that's, the people are favorable to that? Okay, any opposed? Great, let's, let's proceed then. Um, so, Councillor Fry, you are to introduce this uh, motion. You had not yet introduced this. And you get two minutes to do that. And councillors do get... Uh, you get two minutes, but each councillor gets a minute to ask questions of you if they wish. All right. Uh, it's been a while since uh, first tabling this motion, so I'm returning it through my brain. The intent of this motion is uh, to address a number of challenges that we've faced thus far, uh, the creation of purpose-built rental housing and uh, how we have been uh, using developer cost levy waivers to incentivize that for the developer pro formas. Uh, to address the issue of, of short-term rental housing in the form of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, short-term rentals like Airbnb and how that impacts our current housing tenure. Uh, and to address our shortage of hotel rooms, uh, which Tourism Vancouver tells us is quite dire and then moving into the next few years could significantly impact uh, our tourism revenue. So at the the core of this motion is requesting that staff look at the possibility of using uh, a method of uh, sequestering out through a master lease portions of new purpose-built rentals and they're in development and pre-development stage and allowing developers to use that as a, as a lever to secure funding for their projects in order to deliver the purpose-built rental that we're trying to achieve without necessitating a DCL waiver. Uh, and in preliminary conversations, the apparent uh, interest is that the return on investment is actually significant for developers. So this might actually be an opportunity for us to achieve if we can make it work and if our staff can look deeper into this, we may be able to achieve higher levels of affordability on the purpose-built rental housing that we would be building using this potential um, new method of, uh, of incentive. 
Okay, thank you, Councillor Fry. Um, Councillors, you do have a minute each to ask questions, no statements, but just asking questions of Councillor Fry. Councillor DiGenova. I'll try and be quick. Oh, I need my time restarted. Uh, Councillor Fry, I'm wondering if you have considered the fact that in, Van in the city of Vancouver, a single family residential homeowner is not allowed to rent their secondary suite unless they rent it to an adult child for a dollar a year and sign a residential tenancy agreement and they come to apply for a license here. So if they can't do that themselves and rent their one suite, is it fair to let a developer rent 20 suites that they own for extra income? Also, is this DCL waiver going to work for everyone, for every development? Have you talked to staff about that? Other councillors could donate their time to this. I know, you, um, I'm, I'm, Fry, I'm just going to put your mic on. Go ahead. Yeah, so I think just to be clear, this, this isn't a peer-to-peer -peer model where we're talking about individual homes. This is actually using it as a tool to build brand new purpose-built rental buildings, larger format. So Point of order. Okay. Um, go ahead, Councillor DeGenev. What's your question or your point of order? My point of order. Oh, sorry. There we go. Um, my point of order is is that did not pertain to my question. My question was, is it fair? So that that was the question. I. It, it was not the sure question. If I understand is it fair? The point of order. Um, but and and have you talked to staff? Yeah. Well, you yes, have... this was submitted to staff as per our protocol, and I believe you would have received, along with everybody else, a report from staff on their feedback. So, unless you're not reading those, so, unless unless you're not reading the mails that we you, get sent, you from actually staff. have done done the minute, but uh, but I actually need to rule on your point of order because it was raised, and I did not consider that to be a point of order. Um, so, Mayor Stewart, you're next. One minute. Right. Uh... So I'm all for exploring new things, um, and this is definitely new. Um, so I'm a little concerned about the uh, deadlines you've got in here of uh, July 2019 for two of these. And uh, since that's like two weeks away, I don't know what the current staff load, if that's possible. So would you be open to amending these uh, to, to give a little bit more time for staff? I would, yes. And of course, this was originally introduced several weeks ago, okay. but absolutely. I, I, I included those dates because staff were looking to provide reports uh, relevant to this particular thing, so. Okay, thank you. Great, done in 39 seconds, love it. Councillor Kirby Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, Councillor Fry, um, I'm fairly familiar, which I know is no surprise to you with uh, the tourism and accommodation sector. Um, and I'm just wondering, just for clarification purposes, um, is it fair to say that you view short-term rental as fundamentally different from the provision of long-term dedicated hotel units or hotel rooms? Is that the intent of what this motion is trying to delineate? Yeah, I, thank you for seeking that clarification. Yes, I'm not looking at these as short-term rental units at all. Short-term rental units, as we define it under the short-term rental bylaw, are these sort of peer-to-peer -peer kind of models, and they're they're moving it out of the rental housing stock. This is essentially master leasing out a portion of new hotel stock operating exclusively as hotels until the end of the master lease, which would revert it back to, or would then convert it to rental housing. Okay, and also a follow-up, because I'm conscious of time, so I'm just moving quickly. Um, in addition to sort of, I know that you're specifically interested and you stated in um, how this might help um, gender new purpose-built rental, but did you also consider um, in this sort of the economic impact of the challenges of the lack of hotel rooms um, in that, the city that is of your Vancouver? time, Councillor Kirby. Yeah. Did, yes. Thank you. In Great. the whereas. Thank you. Councillor Hardwick, one minute. Councillor Fry. Um, you say it's not short term rental, but normally we would be looking at anything that is 30 days and under as being short term. Um, how long do you see these leases, the term of the leases? Uh, in the model that you've been looking at? Well, based on what I've seen, 10 to 15 years, but again, that's the kind of conversation I would expect to come out of a fulsome investigation by staff. And with the shortage of, of uh, affordable rental housing and, and rental housing period, um, are you not concerned that 10 to 15 years of removing the stock from longer term rental would be a concern? Well, I view this as a tool to create new rental where it doesn't exist. 
So with a delay of 10 or 15 years? Well, for a portion of them. But if we, say, have a 10-story building and two floors are for this hotel model and the other eight are for purpose-built rental, and then we've achieved new purpose-built rental for that right away as soon as the building's built, and then the, the, the other two floors revert to long-term rental after 10 years. I know there's a, a really big concern about here. that. So, Councillor uh, Hardwick, that is your under Just time. Sorry. Hope that we can get these answers. Yeah. Um, questions afterwards, potentially to staff. Um, Councillor Swanson. One yeah, minute. There was this quote. We, uh, I'm reading a quote from the letter we got from Sonder, who's one of the companies that does this. It says, quote, we have no requirement for a lobby or back of house. The front desk and concierge concierge is simply on your phone, end of quote. So I'm worried about the hotel workers. We've got hotels that are closing. We've got hotel workers who are having their hours cut back. And now we come up with another form of hotel, which is on your phone. So I think we should be, you know, pushing to have secure, adequately paid union jobs for hotel workers. That's certainly a larger conversation about the future of hotels. I can speak from my recent experience traveling to Quebec City. Uh, I didn't really use the hotel bar or the hotel pool or, or the bell hop. I did take advantage of the, the room cleaning service um, and the front of the, the check-in, but that was about it. Um, so I think that there's an increasing trend towards new hotel experiences that are less requirement. People go to a new town, they don't want to eat in a hotel restaurant, they want to go explore the town. So I think that there's an opportunity to look at where the, the trends in travel are taking us. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Councillor Swanson. Councillor Bly. So, uh, Councillor Fry, I have a quick question. We've heard a couple comments around short-term rental and purpose-built rental. Um, in this original model, and it's we've seen it. Uh, Council Swanson brings up Sonder. It's in San Francisco. It's in New York. Have you seen um, this context of in in residential zoning? Because Sonder or any of these uh, technology-based hotel or hospitality accommodations are in commercial areas. I don't know that that's exclusively the case. Uh, that may be with Sonder, but I'd certainly. Uh, we've seen other models and through the course of my research where they're in, say, non-traditional areas, like more, I don't know, the equivalent of, say, the drive rather than all downtown. The, the difference, the key difference is they pay commercial tax. So unlike, say, an Airbnb where it's in somebody's home and they pay residential tax, this is a hotel, and, and possibly in a residential building, but for their portion of hotel, they're paying commercial tax and regulatorily compliant. Okay, that's, that's it. Thank you. Um, and those are the questions. And so we are now prepared to move on to speakers. Um, and our first speaker is uh, Emma Callahan, and that's going to be followed by Charles Goche and David Buttle. And uh, there's three minutes to speak, uh, and the timer is to your right. Okay. Good evening, Welcome. Welcome. Good evening, councillors, and thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Emma Cahalan, and I'm the general manager for Sander Vancouver. On behalf of Sander, I want to show our support for this motion this evening. So, as councillor Fry described, Sander is a tech driven hotel brand offering affordable apartment style hotel spaces. We use technology to deliver a mobile first experience, translating to incredible hosp hospitality experience more efficiently and more cost-effective than a traditional hotel, then allowing customers to get more affordable accommodation in our cities. Rather having the lobby, the, the lobby is on your phone, so everything is technology-driven. Rather having a team in every single building around the, around the city, our, our team is constantly roaming to deliver your towel or your hairdryer. Our hotels are in hotel-zoned areas. We pay commercial property taxes, hotel taxes, and we buy it with all regulatory regulations. I'm working for Sonder over a year now. That's the first thing I did when I, when I started my job with Sonder. Right now, very few purpose-built rentals are being created. So if a, if a developer looks at a plot of land, they look at what is the highest and best use for that land. Right now in Vancouver, that is office and condo. We want to encourage developers to create rental buildings as well as create hotels, which are badly needed both in Vancouver right now. Using this motion, we can do both. Number one, just in creating rental supply alone, 
As a renter in Vancouver myself, I fully understand the crunch on both the rental rates and supply. This motion will create rental in three ways. Number one, financing. A lot of purposeful rental buildings are getting cancelled because developers can't get financing from the buildings, from, from the banks. They can take our lease to the bank and get funding and create more rental. Secondly, our presence in these buildings will increase the net operating income dramatically, which will allow more affordable rental buildings to actually be created. Sonder has created projects that include affordable housing in cities like San Diego and New Orleans. And thirdly, once our lease expires after a certain period of time, that portion can be directly reverted back to residential. No changes are needed for Sonder. The second is around creating effective, efficient hotel supply. So uh, Tourism Vancouver have confirmed that three to 4,000 hotel rooms need to be created in the next 10 years just to keep up with the demand. If not, $2 billion will be lost in, um, in revenues for the city. Little purpose-built hotels are being developed right now, and, and that's because economics are not working. It takes anywhere from three to five years for, the, for them to be built and go through the city motion. So that tells us that current pipeline won't keep up with the demand. Sonder and similar companies can fulfill this hotel supply immediately by utilizing space in new development projects where we just take a number of floors. In closing, I encourage you to support this motion, which at the end of the day is right just down a study. And I truly believe it's going to create, um, it's going to create a, a big step to solving the housing crisis as well as the hotel crisis, which we all have. Great. Thank you so much. And you can stay there. There are questions for you. Councillor Di Genova. Oh, she's not in the room. Councillor Bly. Thank you very much. I just have a quick question. Um, what is the shortest lease that you know of under the Sonder model? It could be anywhere just from two to three years. And that would cover the cost of setup and... Yeah, predominantly um, in the base it would be about three years and we will have a number of renewals, but um, it's really up to the developer and what that negotiation would look like, but um, we're quite open. We're very, quite a flexible model who can integrate um, in very well with, with cities and developers. Okay, and you currently have this model um, in many cities. Correct. We're, in, um, we're actually a Montreal-founded business. Um, so we've been around for about seven years and we're in 30 cities, growing to 50 cities by the end of the year across Canada, North America and Europe. So in terms of zoning, how, what portion of your business is in residential areas? So it really depends on the, on the city. Um, in Vancouver, we, are, we look at only hotel zoned areas. Uh, commercial areas, we pay hotel taxes, commercial taxes, everything. Okay, and so do you see that going forward if this motion was to pass? So that would need to be determined by staff. So Sonder would be that, open to that. I think the core of Sonder is always to comply with regulations. We will never deviate from that. That's okay. super important to us. Got it. And then one more question. So for average person looks at this, it's pretty easy, I would say, to conflate sort of the Airbnb model and the Sonder model. Sure, totally. What do you say to people who ask about yeah, that? It's a really good question. So Airbnb, VBROs, they're, that's a marketplace. So they connect the host to the guest. If anything goes wrong in within the process, um, they can't get into their unit or there's no towels or something goes wrong, they don't go back to Airbnb, they go back to the host. So it's a marketplace. Sonder is a hotel, where a hotel operator, if anything goes wrong. Yeah. Um, let, me, let me just clarify my question, because I appreciate that's the business model. Sure. But for those people that live in the city where our vacancy rate is mm -hmm. below 1%, um, what, I, what I mean is more the position that something is going to be, um, that, that this could impact available rental. Okay, good question. Yeah. yeah. So, like Airbnb has. Of course, done. we would never take existing rental. This is gonna be used as a tool to create new rental. So it, wouldn't, it would never impact existing supply. So we'd only look at taking, taking a portion of future supply. And the way we see it, a lot of this future supply would never be able to be created in the first place without leases like this being in place. So, um, so that sounds to me backwards that it could be added density. It could be, exactly. There's, there's different options. And, and one way we want to help with affordability is that we would only take the high-end rents. So we would never want to take away affordable rents for the, for the locals. So, and, you know, again, after the lease ends, that can be converted back to rental, but we want to help with the situation. 
Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor Bly. Councillor Kirby Young. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, I just wanted to sort of go back a little bit um, because typically when we see new um, business offerings or new forms, it's usually in response to a market opportunity or a market challenge. So, and you mentioned that um, purpose-built hotels are not happening, kind of similar, struck me to purpose-built rental in the city. Um, is that because in your experience that um, it's simply financially not viable to build purpose-built hotels anymore? Yes, it's a, it's a really good question. So in Vancouver over the last 15 years, there's been a loss of 1,600 hotel rooms. Uh, so this is before this motion, before Saunders even existed. Um, so they're being converted into to rental and for many reasons because of the economics not working. Um, so um, HVS, uh, Hospitality Evaluation, Evaluation Services. Services. Yes, they actually did a report um, about three weeks ago uh, where, they, where they, they basically said that the future of hotels in Vancouver is not purpose-built hotels. They just, they can't make the economics work. The future is to create mixed use where we can create retail, residential and hotel in one. So it's not, which is something we're seeing, I think, not just for the hotel industry, but um, for development in general. Okay. The other question, and I'll move on just in the interest of time, is is it correct that typically Sonder has a different value proposition? For example, I mean that you're able to offer lower rates than sometimes those typical full service hotels. And the flip yes. side of that question is that doesn't that mean that just like people are saying Vancouver is becoming a city where only the rich can live, that only those with significant means can travel? Yeah, correct. I'm not sure if you looked up... Um, so does that open up travel to more people that are able to come here and enjoy the city? Correct. So Tourism Vancouver has said the average length of stay in Vancouver is about 1.8 nights. Um, Sonder average length of stay is four nights. So that dramatically already increases um, the amount of money that is spent in the economy that is being passed into local businesses. So the average uh, cost of to stay in Sonder is about $150 a night. And you're not just getting a 250 square foot uh, room. You're getting a kitchen where you can bring your family. You can get one, two bedroom. It's more livable. And people, you know, they can spend their money in, in local businesses, which is going to help the economy. Okay. Um, what... Um, do you typically know in some of the partners you've had if they put rental covenants on those floors um, in, in terms of, and I didn't realize that you're leasing, so you have, that's probably the part that you're specifically closest to, but mm. are you aware in terms of some of those buildings or developments you're going into if there are typically rental covenants where it, yeah, it's it, really there is a question. requirement that those units are being returned to rental? Yes, so when the interim hotel policy was introduced in July 2018, it um, it actually said that new hotels can actually enter into residential areas that have hotel zoning as well. But when we did more investigation, about 99% of new developments that are zoned for hotel and residential all have covenants. So unfortunately, that motion, that new policy... It, it limited it to the downtown core and therefore the economic impact on neighborhoods and small businesses in the city. Is that right? It was just impo it's impossible to find um, an area that actually we can create hotel. Right. So Thank you. I have to leave it there because that's my time. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Kirby Young. Councillor Hardwick. Hello there. Um, so the argument is that unlike Airbnb, you're not taking away from existing rental capacity, but rather going forward into new uh, rental buildings that for a term will be held in this uh, form, but you're still renting them out for an average of four nights. So, which would be similar to what you would expect on an Airbnb. Yeah, correct. Um, so in Vancouver, um, we're looking at, at num numerous different strategies. So the first uh, building that we will be going live in is 576 Seymour. So that was an office conversion. Um, the next building we'll be going live in is actually in the West End. It's an existing hotel that we're going to be taking over. Um, it's actually under construction. Um, but then we also uh, will go into future uh, mixed-use developments uh, that can have a section residential as well as hotel and as I said earlier that will have a, a great impact because it's going to create more rental. So is that what you're doing? Sorry to speed it up a bit. Is that what you're doing in all these other cities, Austin, Boston, uh, Austin, Boston Chicago, Denver, Houston, etc.? So rather than doing the Airbnb with longer term out of apartment buildings or, or hotels, you're getting involved in the actual transaction. Yeah, it, it's a very different per, v, per any city, right? So in Vancouver, there's you know there's a housing crisis, so uh, it's very different to other cities where in Philadelphia, you know they have 
they have a lot more availability. So it's not having, we're, we're not always doing the same model, but uh, okay. in terms of. So that's important to understand is that it's not the same model. We'll, we'll create something specific for the city. So anything that is a challenge here, we can create um, and, and work with the city um, to, you know, be more viable and encourage whatever needs to be created like rental. So um, I've been looking at these kinds of things for a while. Did this used to be flat book or is it yes. something? Ah. Correct. So, oh, okay. yeah. Um, so the we were had a different model a few years ago where we were actually managing STR, um, STR uh, and on behalf of owners. So obviously the regulations changed a number of years ago and it's obviously very important for Sondra to be regulatory compliant. So we exited the market briefly and then I started about a year ago to, un uh, to really uh, understand what the new regulations are, how we comply, and now we're re-entering into the market 100% compliant as always. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, and you still have one more questioner, Councillor Di Genova. Thank you. Um, just in looking at the math of this, I'm, I'm, my background is in private development and sure. managing pro forma is and then nonprofit so you have to find that money and that density if you can so specifically to the model you said you're not taking away rental mm -hmm. but it's all new and higher end you had talked about affordability what do you consider affordability to be in Vancouver I don't think I'm educated enough to answer that um, that question. Okay, it's a question I usually hear from <laughs> Chair Carr, so I thought I would ask it. Um, I, I, all I can say is that um, in in San Diego and New Orleans, because of or lease within the building, um, whatever was relevant and, and nicknamed affordable in that city, we were able to create affordable okay. units in, that, in those cities. Thank you. And I've been a big here. big critic of the actual the short term rental program we have now because I you know figured out just a lot of my family works in real estate sure. you could you could write a residential tenancy agreement a lease agreement mm -hmm. with a renter currently uh, or with an adult child if you owned a house and then you could come and apply that renter could apply for a license and that renter could actually 99% of the time, 100% rent out that unit. So it might not be their primary residence if it's rented all the time. Um, but new homes, mm -hmm. new single family residential homes, they're technically new homes. If you subdivided land and built new homes, did you think that this policy should then apply to those new homes as well? I think that's a good question. So again, to reiterate that this is just a new form of hotel. So similar to a Marriott, a Hilton, this is a hotel. The only difference is it's driven by technology. So we go into hotel zoned areas. We pay commercial taxes. We pay hotel taxes. We get our business license for our hotel. So it's just it's just changing and an in more innovative model. That's the only difference. It's not anything to do with an STR or single family homes. Okay. So our STRs pay a business license fee in the city of Vancouver. Commercial taxes, though. Um, so actually, in the next couple of weeks, I have a motion coming forward that asks for a fee per night to be paid. So that would be similar to that. I mean, if that was the same, do you think, because I'm concerned I'm going to get homeowners coming to me saying, how is it fair? And I, hey, I've worked in the development industry. I understand. But how is it fair that a developer who owns a building, a purpose-built rental, can own 20 of these units and have you operate them but they can't do this to their own home. So, I mean, if you're telling me they should be able to do this to their own home, you don't have to answer my question either. I, I'm just trying to understand how I'm going to respond to that. Again, it comes back to we're a hotel. Um, we, we're, we're not the developer, we're the hotel operator. So from the day you make the booking on Sandra.com, booking.com, Expedia, the day you check out, you're, we own the experience. You're, you're staying in a hotel. It's just a different form. That's the, it's just a changing model. Great, thank you. That's great, thank you. And you just have quite one more questioner from Councillor Fry. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. So just to unpack a little bit of Councillor Di Genova's questioning. So to be clear, then this would a home Airbnb would be paying residential tax right. at two dollars and change, and on the thousand, and then a, a, a tech hotel would be paying commercial tax, which would be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right, so so big difference right there, and then, uh, so, and and I and I think the key is is as you you alluded to regulatory compliance as part of your model, and, Correct. 
And uh, I'm guessing that, that, that by operating more units as opposed to more people operating less units, there's... Yeah, like to be quite frank, I've spent the year in Vancouver trying to understand what the regulations are. And we have said no to a lot of developments because they were not hotel zoned. It was not going to be regulatory compliant. So we're super, super vigilant and we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. I think we need to take a step back. This is going to create rental supply and it's going to create hotel. These are two massive areas that the city of Vancouver needs right now. So I do not see any negatives to this motion. And we also need to remember this is just a motion. This is just asking staff to do a study of how we can create um, really great things for the city. So and now I appreciate that there, there was an Airbnb kind of component to to this business earlier. Right. And, and, and I don't want to focus exclusively on your sure. business. I know that there's a ton of other players out there and Marriott has in, entered this market and there's yes. different. Um, but, but you did, do, now do you, or you and other operators like this use Airbnb as a booking tool? Correct. So, so just, just, actually a lot of hotels do. So we use all of the booking platforms. Uh, we use obviously Sondra.com, Expedia, Booking.com, Airbnb. A lot of hotels actually use Airbnb as a platform as well. So it's so no different. A lot of these online operators just aggregate yep. data just from whoever is offering lodges, lodgings and you just pay them a fee or however it works. Okay. My last question is about, about uh, concerns about about hotel employees, and this has come up, and mm -hmm. I've had conversations with folks who have expressed some pretty critical com concerns about the nature of gig economy, the nature of, of, of this kind of employment, and if it's a race to the bottom, and, and, and you know, fundamentally, as we evolve from the traditional hotel model with a, a bell hop and a, mm -hmm. and a front door person and a concierge and, and a bar and a restaurant and all these, that, that for sure we will be losing those jobs. I mean, I think there's always going to be a role for big convention hotels. There will be. And, and that kind of thing. I was at a hotel convention-y type thing this morning. Um, so I'm just wondering, to that point, what, what, what kind of labor practices in the industry? How, how do you? Mm -hmm. Sure. So let's uh, kind of take a step back and remember that 1,600 hotel rooms have been lost in the last 10 years. There's 2 million people coming every year more. So hotel rooms are, being, are shutting down in Vancouver, with or without Sonder. Um, Sonder, as a business, um, where it, in, in, in cities where we've actually scaled up as a business, we employ anywhere from 10 to 60 employees. But where we make the real impact is where we work with small businesses. Um, so small businesses grow as we grow. So we employ hosp hospitality companies, maintenance companies, gardeners, um, and, you know, and a lot of these uh, people that we work with are primary caregivers, they're students, they're single moms that need the actual flexibility, not nine to five. So for them, this is a really, really a godsend. In terms of Sonder employees themselves, we provide really competitive salaries. They get full benefits, stock options, daily lunches. So we, we treat our employees really, really well, and that's really important to us. So I, I came from Google before I joined, joined Sonder, and I'd really put them on the same power as that as a company. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. That is it for your speakers, uh, for your questions. Thank you thank so you. much for coming. Thanks Great. For listening. Um, so next, I'm just gonna, it will be Charles Gauthier, followed by David Buttle, followed by Octavian um, Katabeshi. Welcome, Mr. Gauthier, and I think you're very familiar with the, with the uh, drill Not here. that familiar, but <laughs> you I, are. I got the light right at least. Huh. Uh, we did send an email on June 5th uh, supporting the motion that Councillor Fry put forward in regards to this matter. I'm not going to read what I have here. Uh, as you're aware, we released our uh, State of Downtown report yesterday, and uh, we did document uh, you know, how we're seeing growth in, in tourism, uh, you know, YVR uh, is the second busiest airport uh, in, in Canada. Um, we've 50% uh, increase in flights from China coming to Vancouver. Uh, the cruise ship industry is, is also experiencing uh, significant growth. And then on the flip side, uh, we're hearing the story about the loss of, uh, of hotel rooms. And uh, of note, uh, the Empire Landmark uh, closed in 2017. And uh, at the end of this year or beginning of next year, we'll see the closure of the Four Seasons Hotel and combined, those two hotels had uh, close to 750 rooms. Uh, so we're really concerned uh, about um, what's been happening and also concerned about um, you know, what will happen in the future if uh, we don't look at innovative solutions. So we think that uh, the motion in front of you today and, and possible solutions 
uh, is the path to potentially uh, get two things accomplished, get uh, purpose-built rental uh, constructed, which we've talked to uh, uh, council before about the the need for uh, for housing supply, and uh, we'll continue. I continue to be in front of council, supporting a number of uh, rezonings and redevelopments coming forward in 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 the future on that issue. Uh, but uh, the same applies here. That uh, to me, it looks very much like the parallel. It's a parallel to what we saw regarding the the job space uh, situation. Uh, 11 years ago, where we uh, we didn't see any new office space being built in our city until we saw a particular regulatory change that, uh, in essence, restricted the amount of uh, of housing within the CBD, uh, which sent a signal to the development community that uh, we want you to do something different with the land within the CBD. And then we saw um, an investment in uh, in job space, and then we start we started to see pro new product come on stream in 2014 uh, within the DVBIA district. And as we uh, shared yesterday, uh, over 4 million uh, new square feet of office space that's gonna come on stream over the course of the next four years. Uh, so I'll wrap up, wrap up by saying is that uh, you have your hand on a, a very important lever here uh, with this motion uh, moving forward and instructing staff to explore this. And I would encourage you to do that. Thank you, and you do have questions, Mr. Gauthier. So uh, first, Councillor Kirby Young. Hi, Mr. Gauthier, thanks for being here. Um, I feel like I saw you just yesterday. You did. <laughs> um, I'm gonna focus just like purely on economy um, on these questions, and, and I really wanna zero in. So, um, and, and that sort of relates to the impact here, and, and we've got a number of stats, a very comprehensive um, overview that I think Council received from Tours in Vancouver with potentially $2 billion in direct visitor spending. Um, and you mentioned some of the hotels that we're losing now. Um, and I'm deeply concerned about that one. I think you mentioned Empire Landmark, Four Seasons. Um, what you did not mention was the Coast Plaza Hotel and Suites, and losing Century. a couple hundred rooms in the Century Plaza, which is, right. uh, I think everybody knows, is going to be going. So are we losing business now in terms of the types of conventions we can attract, um, sports groups not being able to come because the room rates are too expensive, the fact that we're at occupancy so we can't get those groups in, and does that have an impact on jobs, the current jobs and economy because it, groups either can't get the space or it's too expensive and they're, they're, they're choosing to go somewhere else? I'm not aware that we're losing the business, but I think there's a risk of losing the business. Uh, but I'm also concerned that uh, we're making it uh, less affordable for people to stay downtown in hotels. I mean, we noted, uh, you know, the average cost of, of a room night in our state of downtown report. And I think we're shutting out a lot of people that would want to enjoy the downtown experience and uh, be able to stay in affordable accommodation. Um, so I went beyond your answer there, but... Can, uh, can you, uh, I'll, I'll move on to another question. Can you think of a point to an example where in Vancouver in the last number of years we've actually built a brand new purpose-built hotel in downtown, because the only ones that I can think of are things like the Rosewood Hotel Georgia, Shangri-La, all ones that as a model had to be mixed use and had to have expensive strata condos associated with them in order to make the economics work yes, on I that site. Yes, I that, and I would add to that the exchange. Right. Which went from uh, being uh, initially uh, just job space, and then they basically did a conversion, and I think in, in response to the loss of hotel rooms. Right, and so you're not aware of any other ones? That's, no, so I think you got the list there. So do you, would you say it's fair to say we have a choice potentially if council decides whether or not sort of economy and jobs and tourism um, is important, and if this could be a lever, which is what the motion is asking staff to look at, if that could work for purpose-built rental, that our only other alternative to get hotel stock is to end up with a lot of a mixed use with expensive condos and therefore also very expensive hotel rooms? Is that, yes. that's pretty much that's our a, choice, that's, right? That's a potential path, and I think what you have here is is a more viable option uh, to accomplish, um, you know, what we're all looking for is an increase in housing supply and then uh, an interim solution uh, to providing, uh, um, you know, a different form of accommodation that's uh, more affordable. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor Kirby-Young. Mayor Stewart. Thanks for coming in. Nice to see you. Likewise. Um, just uh, wondering if, just your thought about the winners and losers in this. I know it's just a study or a proposed study, but just if this goes through, who do you think the winners and losers are? Just, I mean, it's hard to kind of sort through this whole thing. Uh, it's quite technical, so just be interested in your thoughts there. 
I'm kind of inclined not to answer the question. <laughs> oh, come on, you, you waited this long. You have the right to not answer the question. <laughs> yeah, I, I, could I give that a little bit more thought? Sure, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's what I'm wrestling with, too. So. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you, I'm not going to answer the question directly, but I guess if you looked at, you know, what, uh, who are the winners and losers with Airbnb, I guess you can do the same kind of analysis. Um, I guess a parallel would be with uh, ride hailing. Uh, you know, I think right now the pain is that, uh, you know, we don't have a system that's working well for tourists and for locals. And, uh, you know, how many taxis is going to be enough? And, uh, and I think we have to be looking at innovative solutions to try to address, uh, you know, something that's actually, I think, having a dramatic impact on, on our local economy and on the brand of Vancouver uh, because people are not having a great experience with moving around. So I haven't spent a lot of time studying this in particular, other than I think that it achieves uh, getting purpose-built rental, and it achieves addressing uh, kind of the short-term, uh, maybe mid-term need with that, uh, that's, in, that's facing us right now with a shortage of hotel rooms. Okay, thank you. Uh, you do have more questions. Councillor Swanson. Yeah, I'm confused. I don't know if you're the right person to ask this, but I'll give it a try. Um, so why would it, I understand that um, Councillor Fry is saying one of the reasons for this would be that it's easier in terms of building affordable housing, that it's easier for a developer to get funding if he's got a few floors of hotels in there. So if that's true, then why are hotels, which people seem to be saying, uh, closing or else only opening if they have apartments in them. Mm -hmm. It seems like they're opposites. Uh, you're right, I'm not the right person to answer this, uh, okay. but I think some of the speakers that are following me might be able to answer that question based on their experience in the development community. Okay, thank you. Okay. And that is it for, for your questions. Thanks so much again, Mr. Goche, okay, thank uh, for you. your patience in staying here and, and also um, speaking to us. Next on the list is David Buttle, followed by Octavian Katabashi, followed by Stephen Regan. Mr. Buttle. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Carr and Mayor and Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Uh, I'm going to be respectful of your time and everyone's time here, and selfishly my own time, because I have two teenage sons that should be studying for exams tonight and are hopefully not playing Fortnite. So my name is David Buttle. I'm the general manager of Prima Properties. We're a Vancouver-based development company with development sites in the downtown core in the West End. I'm also the vice chair of the West End BIA, and I've served on the board of directors for 10 years. We fully support Councillor Fry's in an innovative motion to study the new forms of hospitality to support purpose-built rental. Over the past decade, Prima Properties has given serious consideration to developing purpose-built rental projects on our existing development sites or as part of a site acquisition. For a variety of reasons, including a lack of incentives, high risk, or over financial viability, we have not proceeded with purpose-built rental. We have a current development project at the corner of Burrard and Davie that's going through rezoning. It's proposed to be a mixed-use, tall building site. Here, on this development, we're incorporating retail, office, daycare, strata residential, and potentially a 50-unit tech-enabled hospitality hotel model. Here at Burden Davy, the economics work out and we can provide some much-needed replacement of lost hotel rooms in the West End. We strongly believe that if hospitality models are permitted as part of the mix on a limited term lease, then the economics of a purpose-built rental project might pencil out in many cases where they might otherwise not proceed. We see this, to answer your question, as a win-win-win scenario for the City of Vancouver looking to provide more purpose-built rental for renters and for the tourism and hospitality industry. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of the motion, and thank you for your consideration on this creative motion, which can potentially give more tools to developers and to planners to see successful outcomes. 
Thank you. Thank you. And you do have uh, questions, so if you want to just stay there, thank you. Um, Mayor Stewart, go ahead. Thanks very much for coming in. And, thank you. Uh, Letting us know your opinion on this. Um, so I'm just wondering uh, if you know uh, how these leases get monitored. Uh, do you have any idea? So once the, these master leases are done, how do we know that they they get flipped back to, to rental? Do you have any idea? Uh, and this is new territory for us. So right. the the element that we would do, obviously there's going to be a an annual review as far as property taxes. So that's a, you, you can have an owner declare the use of this building on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, and that's it for your questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, you have a late person on the question list. Certainly. Councillor Fry, I'll... Yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just, you know, and without getting too deep into the, the nature of pro formas and, and, and how you make your model work, you would find this, like, compared to the DCL waiver kind of scheme that we have right now, or not scheme, but you know what I mean, the DCL waiver formula that we use to, to incentivize purpose-built rental through Rental 100 programs and the like, uh, you could, this would work, this would pencil out on an ROI that would exceed that incentive in, a say, a 10-year, 5-year lease even? It's, a, it's definitely going to help make it more palatable for the lenders to look at. You're almost, it's almost like a pre-sale. You're pre-leasing. Whereas as a traditional rental scenario, you're going to the bank and suggesting that I can, I can gain this much rent for these units. Here you, you, you would have the opportunity to go in with a block of units that would effectively be pre-leased. And, and, and do the banks and CMHC appreciate and understand this model? Do they see how this could work? Is it? Ab absolutely. And in the, in the case of our, our development project in the West End at Burden and Davy, it was actually encouraged by planning to, to go with a boutique hotel scenario uh, as part of the rezoning. The, the challenge for us was sort of finding operators that that can make a smaller podium type hotel work within a mixed use with minimal sort of it's not shangri-la where there's not going to be access to you know glamorous pools and 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 restaurants it's it's more integral in the neighborhood which is why we really like this model yeah okay thank you i appreciate that thank you great and that generated more questions so councillor swanson go ahead so the 50 units in the building that you're renting, are they going to become the 50 hotel units? Will they become rental at some point? Uh, at this point, uh, we're proposing it. It's a, it's a rezoning, so mm -hmm. it's, it's still subject to, to final approvals. But we're proposing it to be on a long-term lease to a group such as Sonder or another. Um, at, at the termination of that lease, it would either renew and, can ter and carry on or it could revert back to, and we haven't made the corporate decision whether it's going to be strata hotel, or, or sorry, strata uh, residential or not. Okay, so we, we, it might not even be rental. This That particular site is, uh, is a mixed-use building. We can make the economics of it work under that scenario. We have other sites that if we were to look at purpose-built with this model in, they'd potentially pencil out. So can you answer the question that I asked Mr. Gauthier? Um, why is it that, if I can say this, it's confusing to me. I understand from Councillor Fry that it's easier for a developer to get financing if he has a hotel, part, at least partial hotel. And um, at the same time, other people were saying that hotels are closing and that in order for a hotel to work, it has to put in residential. So the two seem kind of mutually exclusive to me. I think every every site in Vancouver is going to be a different scenario and a different pro forma. It's, it's going to depend on the land cost, what the entitlements of that site is, what the density might be. So that's a really difficult question to answer. I, I think that the good people of... Uh, your planning department and your real estate department can provide probably some greater scenarios. I can only speak to what I've personally looked at and on both an acquisition and our existing portfolio and can say that I can't make it work on a traditional downtown core site, a purpose-built rental. 
Okay, last question. If you get the 50 hotel units, would you be contracting out the cleaning and the servicing of it like the um, young we, woman from Saunders? We would look uh, to an operator such as Saunder or, or Marriott that, that has a, a line similar that, that would provide those services. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, you still do have questions? Councillor Di Genova. Thank you very much. Um, in looking at, at the resolution of this motion, I understand staff are going to come back to us. Sometimes they'll say it's great. Sometimes they'll say it's not. Uh, but it it specifically talks not just about hospitality, but about DCL waivers. So in the case of your project, I, I do you apply to the city of Vancouver for DCL waivers? On any uh, of your projects or have you? On, on the particular one I'm speaking about where we're looking at this yeah. model, no, we wouldn't be looking at it because we're not seeking. Have I, can, may I ask, and you don't have to answer this, have you applied for DCL waiver before? Uh, in the, any the project? City? No. Okay. Um, but understanding the way that that works for purpose-built rental that wasn't implementing this model and didn't have that high, high-end contingent, if the DCL waiver program and policy went away completely, um, some people could benefit from this model, such as yourself, but if it was an all or nothing, either you apply for this or you don't get, it, I mean, basically there's no DCL waiver any longer, would you think that that could hurt some developments that might not be working off the same pro forma? Yeah, I can't speak to, to other developments. Uh, what I can say is that the, the greater amount of flexibility that you give your planning staff in assisting developers to move project forward, both on a timeline and flexibility in, in, in entitlements, uh, trying new things, that's what's going to bring developers to the table to bring these types of projects forward. Okay, and then further to that, I mean, it, it was said before, the, no high-end pools or this or that. That's one project I've been to, the Fairmont Pacific Rim. It has a very high-end pool and spa on site, but it also has a separate entrance, but it has uh, condos uh, that have a hospitality aspect to them. So is it fair to say that all of these projects wouldn't have the same amenities as a hotel? And then also short-term rental, how, how would we see that as as different in the sense that, I mean, really they're short-term rental units, so why aren't we building a standalone hotel then? The, when I referenced the, the, um, the amenities in this particular case at Burrard and Davy, it's specific to that use. So in there, we envision that a self-service model hotel uh, with minimal amenities. The, the, the tower itself, uh, which includes daycare, um, strata, office, retail, um, the, the strata residential would have access to amenities, but the hotel doesn't require it, which simplifies it in, in the podium. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Buttle. That is your question. Thank, Thank you, you so you. much for, for uh, staying. So next is Octavian Karabeshi, followed by Stephen Regan and Ty Spear. Yes. Welcome, Mr. Katabeshi. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Mayor and Council, thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to speak to this issue. My name is Octavian Katabeshi, and I'm a research analyst with Unite Here Local 40, the Union for Hospitality Workers in British Columbia. We represent thousands of hospitality workers in Vancouver, and I'm speaking to you today because we have several, several serious concerns about the motion before you to incorporate tech-enabled hotels into the city's hospitality and housing tenure. Basically, we believe this motion undercuts the city's existing short-term rental ordinance. Uh, the motion will not address the city's hospitality room shortage, and the motion will hurt workers by making hospitality jobs more precarious and part of the, big econ the gig economy. By working with companies like Sonder and their competitors, developers will incentivize the short-term rental market because, put simply, tech-enabled hospitality companies can best be described as Airbnb mega-hosts. Um, their business model is not fundamentally different from any commercial Airbnb host. Sonder leases entire floors or sometimes several floors of a building from a residential developer and then generates its own revenue by offering short-term rentals. They aren't bound to tourist areas um, and in uh, building design are not tied to the same stringent requirements that hotels 
are held to. According to one article, as of 2018, uh, so this was last year, only 16% of Saunders bookings came to them directly or through repeat business. Unlike a conventional hotel, Saunders is dependent on short-term rental platforms, primarily Airbnb, in order to generate business. That's what's, uh, what was in the, uh, the article. As Vancouver residents and hotel workers, our members would be doubly impacted by the spread of tech-enabled hospitality in residential buildings across Vancouver. Uh, it has taken years for our members working together through contract after contract to transform their hospitality jobs into the kind of work that, would, that actually provides for their families. The hospitality industry is constantly trying to claw back those gains, uh, and Saunders' business model, explicitly based on precarious work, would only further undercut those good hospitality jobs. The spread of ghost hotels across Vancouver, lacking lobbies and front desk, uh, utilizing phone apps and Airbnb for check-ins, and foregoing daily ho housekeeping services could turn Vancouver's hospitality jobs into another sector of the gig economy. Uh, Mayor and Council, hospitality is a key industry in Vancouver, employing thousands of people. Allowing good hospitality jobs to disappear or to be undercut by precarious work could have a lasting negative impact on Vancouver's tourism workers and their families. As far as housing is concerned, simply building more market rentals, out of reach mostly for many uh, working people, will do little to improve the housing crisis. There's also a real risk that, depending on how this actually comes to be implemented, this proposal could be a green light for developers to convert potential residential units into short-term rentals. Philadelphia is one city that's attempted to incentivize developers to build more residential units by allowing tech-enabled hotels, but Philadelphia has an apartment surplus, unlike Vancouver, and is therefore a very different market. Our members in Vancouver struggle with renter prices that are uh, far out of reach and with low housing availability, with working conditions barely good enough to remain in the city. Uh, what working families need now are below market housing and access to decent work that can sustain them in the city in a city as expensive as Vancouver. And Mr. Kedabeski, you you are out of time, but you do have questions coming to you. Yeah. I thought that has a three minutes. Oh, is it down to three minutes now? Yes. Oh, <laughs> <Yeah>. well, <clears throat> I apologize. That, that, that's not a problem. Um, but you, as you have a number of person, uh, people questioning you, so you mm -hmm. may be able to work your points in and answers to those questions. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Swanson first. Yeah, thank you for coming. Um, what percentage of Vancouver hotel workers are in your union? Uh, we represent probably about 30%, yeah. something like that. Okay. Um, I heard the representative from Sondor basically say that they contract out the maintenance of the hotels, and I'm wondering how easy it is to organize workers that are kind of contract at a contracted out level, like once removed from the major employer. Well, I mean, it, it's significantly less likely that those those workers are going to be part of a union. It's true, but uh, you know, beyond that, as contracted workers, they just they don't have the same employment rights um, that direct employees do, and that that has proven to be problematic. Um, you know, for for contracted workers in Vancouver in a variety of different ways, including around their their job security. And I understand that your workers are losing hours. Um, I, can you clarify that? Um, like with the green card. Yeah. So one of the one of the things that uh, that even um, traditional hotels attempt to do um, is constantly figure out ways to make it so that uh, our members are are more precarious. So uh, some hotels, in some cases, are. Um, are working to to make it so that the hotel the housekeepers don't have to come in every day um, and therefore are essentially on call waiting for people to check out of their rooms at which point they get work um, and this is incredibly difficult for uh, for hospitality workers because as you can imagine without stable work uh, with the prices the cost of living in Vancouver being what it is it's almost uh, it's very difficult to survive. So what do you think the impact on uh, your members' work would be if we had th this type of uh, uberization of the hotel business? 
Well, we uh, first of all, uh, the people who end up working in these uh, in these precarious jobs are going to have again a really hard time surviving in Vancouver. Um, a lot of in a lot of cases, the the people that uh, that work are going to be the people who have the skills. It's going to be uh, hotel workers like our members or other hotel workers, and so they're going to be impacted by being put in a situation where they. Um, they can't rely on their work to be able to pay their bills and to be able to uh, pay their rent. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, Councillor Swanson. Mayor Stewart. Thanks very much for coming in. Um, so just through your research, are there any examples of, of Sonder uh, establishments employing unionized staff at all? Uh, we haven't heard of it. I mean, they're a fairly new company, so I'd be surprised in the time that they've been around if uh, their workers would have unionized, but I, I don't know. Okay. I'd say for sure. Okay, but you're saying it'd be extremely difficult to organize. Mm. And why would that be? Just because they're, it's two to three years and or this lease at a certain length of time? And Well, workers are, would not be in the same place, so it would be hard to you know even find them. Um, again, precarious work, contract work, means that people really kind of come and go. Um, you know, again, I can't speak directly to Saunders' model because it's unclear exactly, you know, how they how they do business. But um, with precarious uh, or with uh, with contracted workers in general, that would be one of the one of the main things. If you have regular staff, they're in on a regular basis, then they can speak to one another. They can, uh, you know, gain unions so that uh, build a build a union um, outside of that. It's, it's much more difficult. Give us a sense of the wage differential between a unionized and non-unionized uh, hotel worker. Uh, in Vancouver, the wage differential is not as severe as it could be. In other cities, it is more so. Um, usually, what you see is that, uh, is that the unionized hotel workers end up really bringing the standard up in terms of what uh, what what other employers will pay their employees. And so in terms of pay and in terms of working conditions. Um, and so that is definitely the case uh, in Vancouver as well. Okay, so this is a motion for a study of this uh, and, and that's it. I mean, do you think we should take a look at it as long as the people who are participating in the study were, uh, you know, was a well-rounded panel of folks that were looking at this. So say, for example, uh, Unite Here. Well, we don't think that there's really a whole lot of reason to look at this uh, this motion. Uh, staff's time is valuable, and we think that there's other things that, uh, that staff should be focusing on um, rather than enshrining short-term rentals and precarious work into residential development. We think that uh, staff could be spending time uh, looking at expanding short-term rental regulations to make them actually work uh, by including fines and penalties for short-term rental companies like Airbnb. We think that uh, staff should be looking at ways to protect traditional hotels from conversion. Uh, you've already done a little bit of that with your interim uh, hotel policy, and that part of the policy is is a good thing, but um, you know, there's still there's still risk to hotels closing down. We think that staff could be exploring ways to make that uh, to make conversions of hotels, um, you know, less likely to happen. Uh, and we think that staff could be uh, looking at other ways to create below market housing that don't uh, also come with the uh, the impact to workers that this model uh, brings. Thanks, I'm out of time, but uh, yes. thank you very much for your input. You are. Thank you. And you do have more questions, Council. Um, we have. To 15 minutes left. We have three more, count, four more councillors, which would be 12 minutes, um, taking us to very close to 10. We have two speakers left on our list. Um, you know, I really would really entertain a motion to go beyond 10 to finish the speakers list um, tonight, and we could refer the decision, uh, debate, and decision um, to a, a standing committee meeting. Um, Sorry, uh, to, to the debate decision could be f referred to the regular council meeting as unfinished business on June 25th. Yeah, sorry, Councillor Dominato, go ahead. Um, do we have a sense, I, I was just out in the hall a bit earlier, but do we have a sense of how many speakers are actually here still to speak to the motion? So the, the one that we're currently on as well as 9 and 10, or could we get an informal show of hands? If, um, 
Well, for nine, we have Mr. Regan's right, right there. I see Mr. Regan, yeah. Yeah. I don't and, know if Mr. Uh, Spears. Ty Spear. Yeah. So there's one left on this item. And uh, for number nine, how many people show of hands? That's Curtis. Okay. Right. Curtis Charles. Uh, one, two, three. Three for number nine. Four? Four for number nine. Um, again, we, we uh, are not going to get through the speakers unless we extend the meeting past 10 o'clock for at least there's one speaker left for this item. Um, so again, I think, uh, uh, you know, I would very much entertain a motion to extend. I mean, this would be the minimum in my mind to extend this meeting past 10 o'clock to make sure we hear the last remaining speaker and refer the debate and decision to the regular council meeting of as unfinished business on June 25th. So move. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Um, we don't need a seconder. Um, is there any debate on that motion? Sorry, could you repeat the motion again? Can you the motion would be to extend past 10 o'clock to hear the remaining speaker on this item and to refer um, the debate and decision as unfinished business to the regular council meeting on June 25th. And, uh, Madam Chair, just a follow-up question. And, and then are, would we also be referring 9 and 10? Is that, would that be the intent behind You that? could include in the motion to refer numbers 9 and 10 um, to the standing committee. Okay. Separate, separate motion would be required because it would be a different meeting to which uh, that would, those referrals would go to. So let's, we have a motion on the floor uh, that is to deal with this um, specific motion. So um, any debate on that? Sorry, and you said there was one more speaker left? Correct. And then we just get through these questions, hear the one speaker, have those questions, and that's it. So well, no, I'm going to deal with a motion to deal with anything else on the agenda, but at least we, because it would be yeah, referral yeah, to a different meeting. Motion. But if we okay. can get through this, we at least can deal with what's happening with this particular motion. Any other questions about that? Okay, I just need a show of hands uh, for those in uh, a favor of that motion by Councillor Hardwick. Any opposed? Um, with one in opposition, we cannot extend the meeting past 10. Yes, it was moved to extend the meeting past 10 o'clock to hear the remaining speaker on this list. Correct. Are you still in opposition to that? Councillor Weeb. He can put it. He could just a second. Count, yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to let Councillor. He's. I'm actually voting on this. We're voting on this right now. Yeah, and I voted against it. That's right. And so now I'd like to put a motion to listen to the final speaker, and then do, and extend the meeting to do debate, <clears throat> and decision tonight on this item. Okay, so I just want to make sure everybody's clear. The motion, the previous motion failed um, because uh, the motion to extend beyond 10 has to be unanimous by council, so it wasn't unanimous. Um, so the motion on the floor um, that you are proposing, Councillor Weeb, is to um, ex extend this um, a meeting past 10 to hear the remaining speaker and conclude debate and decision. Is that correct? Yes. And then refer items 9 and 10 to. No, we're going to deal with that separately. Because, okay. Oh, sure. right. Okay. And yes, Councillor Dijanova, you know I did hear you the first time. Go well, ahead. You. I was dealing with the completion I'm really of an looking item. looking forward to this meeting of the chairs. Mm -hmm. uh, my point of information is if this motion fails, the entire meeting ends. So I would. I was wondering, there, there will, unless I make an amendment, my question is, must I make an amendment that we hear from the rest of the speakers? Because I will not be supporting that we move on to debate and decision and go past 10. Or I'll, I'll be fine to hear the speakers, the rest of the speakers, but I will not be moving on to debate and decision. 
It's um, fine. We, we did have that motion and it failed. That being said, I also had a point of information before that, uh, which pertained to the question. I, I understood that, uh, Chair Carr, you were looking for whether or not counselor, council members would stay beyond 10. And then when that motion fails, as we've dealt with before here, it's my understanding the meeting just ends. Sadly, yeah, unless, unless Councillor okay. Councillor Dijanova, I'm asking uh, you that question: Did the meeting just end by the procedural bylaw, considering it not, was voted down? Councillor Dijanova, we are not yet at ten, but at the rate we're going, we'll soon be there. Um, so we okay. have not got there yet. But you are right. If the motion, as I explained to Council, if the motion to extend beyond ten is not unanimous, our meeting ends at ten o'clock. Um, so we have a motion on the floor to extend this meeting beyond 10 to hear the speaker and complete the um, debate and decision. Any other debate on that? Let's have a vote then. All those in favor of that motion, raise your hands. Those opposed? Okay, that, that motion fails. Um, so at this point, Council, we are going to continue with... We have speakers list. I'm very sorry, speakers. Um, we're not going to get to the final speaker because we have five people. I'm in the middle of explaining them, and I will get to you, Councillor Di Genova. Um, we have five councillors wanting to uh, ask questions of our current speaker. Councillor Di Genova, what is your point of order? I would like to move a motion that we extend past 10 to hear from the rest of the speakers, and then we refer debate and decision on to the next meeting. We just did that motion and it failed. But I understood it was decision, that we would also be making a decision. That's what Councillor Weeb's motion said. Yes, and I'm sorry, what was the difference between that and what you just said? I'm, I'm asking that we refer debate and decision. His motion did not refer debate and decision. No, the, mo the motion prior to that was exactly what you just said and, we fail and that motion failed. To reconsider that motion. Uh, I would like a re to... Oh, you Somebody can. who voted in the majority on the decision could reconsider it. I would like to reconsider. I voted in the majority. Yes, right, you did. Okay, so it takes a unanimous vote of council to reconsider. Here Is there a, anybody in opposition to uh, reconsidering that motion? All right. Okay, and those, all those in favor then, hands up. All right, we, we are reconsidering the motion to extend this meeting to hear from the remaining speaker on this item and refer debate and decision uh, to the regular council meeting as unfinished business and that is the meeting of june 26th sorry june 25th all right council all those in support of that motion is there anybody opposed all right, we have a motion that has passed. We are going to continue with uh, that, and um, I would entertain a motion to deal with the remaining items on this agenda. The remaining items on this agenda, numbers 9 and 10, uh, can be referred uh, to the Standing Committee of uh, June 26 as unfinished business starting at 3 p.m. Mayor Stewart has moved that motion. Is there any debate on that motion? All those in favor of that motion? Any opposed? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, go ahead, Councillor Dominato. Um, just, I just want to, um, I think you've noted 3 p.m., but I see it our calendar is at 9.30. So if I could just get clarification. Maybe we'll yes, validate. you can get clarification. Oh, the reason is because there are speakers, and we hear speakers for at a regular council starting at 3. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. And then uh, I think my, just a, it's a, a question, I think consideration is that um, because um, motions are being repeatedly referred back to future meetings. Um, we have people who've made time to sign up to speak. As you can see, many have withdrawn. And I think that the movers of the motions should be entitled to speak to some of the correspondence. Um, I know we're given two minutes to introduce motions, but I actually think that they should have an ability to speak to some of the correspondence that's come in in support of those motions in uh, a more fulsome way, because a number of these speakers will not be able to come back next week or haven't been able to because of the change in <coughs> schedule, because this is probably so anyways, I just want to flag that as a consideration for um, that we should have some ability to maybe read into the record the correspondence and other things like that. It doesn't have to be decided today, but I just want to put that out there is that um, uh, because it is as we keep on moving these things back, 
Yes. Um, okay. Unlike public hearings, we don't get a record of how many support or not support a motion when it is a member's motion. But thank you for that information. I think we'll take it under advisement or the staff will. Okay. So um, we are, uh, that was a question to the motion on the floor, which has been moved by Mayor Stewart to uh, refer to the, the last two items of tonight, numbers nine and 10, nighttime economy and the cannabis motion um, to the standing committee as unfinished of June 26 as unfinished business starting at 3 p.m. All those in favor? Again, any opposed? All right, that's carried. Council, you should know that anything that has speakers to it at the um, uh, the standing or sorry the the council meeting will have to take place and referred to here to speakers will take place after these two items at after three o'clock on the 26th. We can continue with questions. Thank you for your patience. Um, Mayor Stewart, had you finished with asking questions or no? Great. Okay. Councillor Fry. Oh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Mr. Katabeski. I know this has been... Oh, that's all right. Draining. I'm drained, so <laughs> I don't know, but I'm glad you're okay. Um, so I, I, an earlier question was asked about... Uh, the Saunders model and union and stuff. And I, I do know that, I don't know about Saunders specifically, but I do know that some of the larger hotel chains are moving to this sort of model. And I think Marriott is one of them. And they're, I think they're I, possibly a controversial Unite Here employer, but but they are. So mm -hmm. so with, with that being said, would, and if this passes as a referral motion for staff to look at, would, would Local 40 be and I think the mayor sort of asked this generally, would Local 40 be willing to work with staff to look at employment practices and how to ensure that there's that voice at the table? Well, as I've said before, um, the, the hospitality industry has definitely looked at uh, a number of ways to, to try to make, um, make hotel work more precarious when, when it makes sense for them, when it makes uh, economic sense. It's not surprising that, the, that there are going to be some traditional hotel companies that are exploring this model. Um, when it comes to the, the labor perspective, and, and to be clear, we are also concerned about this model because hotel workers live in Vancouver and we're concerned about affordability and we don't think that this model is going to do anything for them in that regard either. But when it comes to labor, um, we just don't don't see the precarious model working. We'd oppose it. We, we would oppose it when uh, the employers that we represent workers at it propose it and we would oppose it if uh, some other employer uh, chooses it. It just it's not a model that is going to work for um, you know, creating middle class jobs that people can afford to live in in Vancouver. Well, and therein lies our challenge because we're not really creating the housing that we need either. So we're hence the looking at what we might be able to achieve with other options. So I guess then the other question is, what what do we do independent of this? Some more, but what do we do to build more of those traditional hotels if that model? If, if they're not building hotels like that, and when they do, that they're at an upper price point, and we have a $5 billion a year tourism industry that relies on, on places for people to stay, and we've seen a growth in short-term rentals of the Airbnb peer-to-peer -peer model that seem to be filling that void for accommodations. What do we do as a city to, to achieve accommodations for visitors that support our economy? Well, on one hand, I mean, I'm, I am, uh, I'm not fully qualified to, to speak to this, and I, I want to make that clear because, uh, I'm, you know... And you don't have to answer, by the way. Right. Sorry, I but, uh, but I do have some, some suggestions. First off, there have been some new build hotels that, uh, that are in the works or happened. So there's the 200-unit exchange. There's 400 units that are probably going to come online uh, in, on Broadway, West Broadway. So, you know, slowly but steadily, new hotels get built. Our concern, and this is something that uh, that I've I've tried to press right now, is that it's really important that uh, we protect um, we protect the existing traditional hotel stock from conversion, and we think that that's what uh, what staff in the city should really be looking at here, um, as opposed to exploring new models that uh, that end up being harmful to workers. Um, and then at the same time, when it comes to the the challenge of Airbnb. And short-term rentals, um, 
we don't think that undercutting the existing uh, position that uh, whole unit rental, whole unit short-term rentals um, are is going to be a particularly effective way to create new housing. We think it'll be counterproductive as far as housing is concerned. But, but back to the the hotel received hotel room shortage, tourism Vancouver says in the next five years a four thousand unit shortage, what, and and so the numbers that you just quoted won't build it. And if we if we further squeeze on Airbnb peer to peer kind of rentals, which I I don't disagree with, I think that that needs a more regulatory oversight, and we're not seeming to get there with our current approach. Uh, what do we do to make up that difference? Well, I think one question to ask is how did we get to a situation like this in the first place where we allowed uh, that many hotel rooms to close uh, and to to be converted? Again, I'm, I'm going to stress that the most important thing that the city can do with the powers that it has on, you know, in its control are to ensure that there's no further uh, conversion of existing hotel rooms. You are well behind time, <laughs> Councillor Fry. Councillor, you have more questions, though. Councillor Kirby Young. Um, thank you. Um, I think some of my questions were asked, but I, I, you did make a comment earlier around um, Sonder, I think, as it related, you suggested maybe explain a bit more that um, a lot of their bookings or a high number of their bookings are going direct. But that's also true with a lot of hotel, or that we're not going direct, they're going through the third party bookers. But that's also true with a lot of hotel brands, is it not? That they are, there's relying on OTAs, online travel agencies, Expedia, Booking.com, Hotels Tonight, all those third parties. That's quite standard to get a fair look a large percentage of bookings coming from third-party sources. And I'm just wondering what your concern was around that in terms of where the reservation comes from, because theoretically bringing people into the hotels is a good thing because the rooms are occupied and then the hotels are viable and the jobs are there, right? Uh, this is true. I think the the main difference between the two is that... Um, is that Airbnb results in, uh, you know, in, in bookings that don't require a front desk and, as they say, are basically just driven by apps and I, I was I was actually asking my question just to clarify specifically on hotels, not, mm. not, not, not about Airbnb, but... Right, so hotels, hotels do use uh, external booking ser uh, services for sure. Um, however, they do have a front desk and they process them in that way. In my time as a hotel worker, I did the same. Right, but you're but you are getting them from all different sources. Like, it's true. common that everybody's using different distribution and reservation platforms, correct? Yes. It is. Okay. Um, and um, are you concerned um, about sort of the fact that? And, and I realize this is a tricky one because you want to protect sort of good, um, viable employment, um, but those jobs, to your point, are actually going to diminish because those hotels are having a hard time in actually staying open. So everybody has a vested interest in trying to keep them viable, right? I wouldn't say in my experience as a researcher here in Vancouver, um, you know, with the hotels that we're looking at, that they're having a hard time remaining profitable. The industry is making record profits. Um, the occupancy levels are at record highs. And in fact, this is the last few years have been an opportunity for our members to push for even uh, even better jobs than, than they've had before. Um, so... The statement that hotels are having a hard time staying open is problematic. I would say there's definitely an issue where hotels are closing, why they're doing that, what their economic incentives are. I can only speculate, but, um, you know, we could, the city could definitely work to ensure that that doesn't happen by having uh, really stringent rules around uh, conversions. Okay, I believe it's the economics of the hotels we have lost have gone to, to a more stable form of revenue, so they've, they've actually converted to rental. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Kirby Young. Councillor DiGenova. Thanks very much. Uh, but I was going to ask you some of the questions uh, that I've asked other speakers. You don't have to answer them, but I'm looking at the short term rental policy. So, right now, currently, it really says that renters can have short-term rental um, if they come and apply for a license to the city. It doesn't actually say, though, how, how long, how many nights per year. So I would assume that it's not your primary residence if it's available on VRBO or Airbnb or wherever it is for 365 days of the year. Do you see some issues with that policy? Like, I'm, I'm looking at the ways that the policies could possibly 
and then we will discuss this next week and you may, or maybe next month, although it will come to us next week in a motion that I put forward. But do you think that we need to look at this overall, including um, the work that our staff are already doing with the context of, of what's being asked for and see how it will hurt how, or it may hurt housing affordability in the city of Vancouver? Well, um, our union definitely sees uh, the the city's existing short-term rental policy as tied to what we're what we're talking about right now, the the um, tech-enabled ho hotels. So I can speak to this, and our union has spoken before when uh, when the the policy was being considered. We're supportive of a lot of the aspects of the policy. The the specific question you ask about uh, you know how how many days, I couldn't say one way or the other. We think that. The policy really does need to be reconsidered to make it more effective around one particular piece, which is platform accountability. Mm -hmm. We think that uh, one of the most effective ways to make sure that we free up more housing for work for uh, workers for for middle class people in uh, in Vancouver is to find the um, the short term rental platforms like Airbnb directly every time that they list a property that is not uh, licensed by the city. And we think that's going to be the most effective thing that uh, that the city can do and what staff should really be looking at right now. Thank you very much. Really appreciate you staying. That does complete your speakers. Uh, or sorry, your questions. Thank you so much for staying and your patience as we've worked through Indeed. Um, the agenda. Thank you. Um, so our final uh, speaker on this is <laughs> Stephen Regan. Um, and welcome. <laughs> Uh, thank you very thank you. much, Mayor Council. Uh, appreciate. I, I feel like I'm that speaker who's uh, between the thirsty crowd and the bar, so <laughs> I'm going to keep this as short as possible. Uh, I'm from the West End BIA. We we are supporting this motion uh, for a few reasons. Um, quickly, context. You know, the West End does play a, a key role in the tourism and the hospitality industry. Our proximity to to downtown and hotels and the cruise ship terminal, but Stanley Park and English Bay, and it's just a terrific place to visit and. Uh, and, and live and work. Uh, loss of hotel rooms, we were actually caught a little bit by surprise after the West End community plan that you know we weren't uh, uh, seeing a few of the, the hotel products that we had in the neighborhood you know, stay and, and evolve and, and thrive. So with your planning department and others, we've been um, you know, going through some consternation about how do we fill that gap. Part of that consternation is we're hearing it from small businesses on our commercial streets. They notice the impact. The Empire Landmark, the coast, this is, this is not a small deal to some of these operators who are you know, working in a tourism hospitality ecosystem. Um, I would say that ecosystem, flexibility equals resiliency. There's lots of you know, questions and details that your staff are going to be looking at if you pass this motion, and I strongly ask that you do pass the motion. We would love to work with you on that small business component and how that ecosystem works on the, on the ground in, a, in an area like um, at the West End with Davy Denman and Robson, so integral into the uh, the tourism experience. So, thank you very much for your patience tonight, and uh, and thank you for allowing the uh, the speakers to uh, to complete. Appreciate it. That is great. And council, the bar is waiting. I, <laughs> I really appreciate your pre your patience, and thank you very much for staying to speak to us. Okay, Council, um, I, am, I am, we are at the end of our agenda tonight. We've made all our decisions about where things are going. So the Standing Committee, por sorry, the, um, this meeting of the, um, I didn't have the right thing here. We're not, we're not reconvening. We're just, oh, okay. So the Standing Committee portion of this meeting is now complete, and we will now reconvene in regular Council. Thanks very much. We now reconvene in regular council to deal with the recommendations and actions from today's Standing Committee on Policy and Strategic Priorities meeting and other items on the agenda. We need a motion to adopt the committee's recommendations. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Weeb, and seconded by Councillor Dejanova. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? Well, that's good. Thanks very much. Um, let's see. Sorry, I, I messed up the script here. Uh, Start at six.
Okay. Great. So due to t start here. Okay. We so we have one item of unfinished business that was referred from the regular council meeting on June eleventh. Uh, quote, designation of Vancouver Affordable Housing Agency as an agent of the city to develop land assets uh, 2031 and 2037, Stansbury Avenue, Stainsbury Avenue, which was held by Councillor Swanson. Uh, due to com time constraints, I suggest we move this item to the regular council uh, as unfinished business on June 25th. Thank you. Uh, seconder? Thanks, Councillor Hardwick. All in favor? Any opposed? Nope, thanks very much. Um, great, so can we have a motion to adjourn? Thank you. That's so enthusiastic. Councillor Fry's second from Councillor Bly. Good, okay, all in favor? Great, thanks, we're adjourned.